Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of Save Ancient Studies Alliance's 2022 virtual conference. We're so happy to have you here today. Uh, I'm David Danzig, the, the director of SASA. And today we have here with us An, who is our conference coordinator, and Megan Lewis. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to have everyone here for the second day of the virtual conference. Um, again, the topic of this year's conference is who has the power, leaders and leadership in the ancient world. And we'll have another day full of presentations about different types of leadership um, around the ancient world. Um, I'd also like to present our moderator for today, Megan Lewis. Megan has a BA from Birmingham University in the UK in ancient history, an MPhil from the same in astrology and an MA in Near Eastern Studies from the John Hopkins University. She attained ABD status in a PhD program at the John Hopkins University before deciding that her energies would be better spent elsewhere. Um, however, she does hope to return and obtain her doctorate at a later date. Megan serves on the board of directors for AHAPS and takes care of the day-to-day -day running of the Digital Hammurabi YouTube channel and podcast. And you can also find her on Twitter. Good morning, everyone. I'm very much looking forward to today's events. All right, to get started today, um, I'll be presenting um, about SASA's research team. Um, thank you, Ann and Megan. Megan, I think you can turn your camera off for a little bit and I'll share my screen. Um, today I'm standing in for Dr. Valeria Zubia Talujo, who is our SASA's research team leader because um, she's un unable to attend today. Um, let me get started. I think that we're all aware that in the past 20 years, there's been a slow but steady decline in the humanities. And as scholars of the ancient world, we know that this phenomenon has been unfortunately more acute in our fields. This discussion about the declining health of ancient studies has been particularly fueled by our experiences of the diminishing number of students, funding, and lack of institutional support, as well as by the struggles to maintain course offerings sometimes even departments. However, this sense of the decline in ancient studies that we share is only supported by anecdotal evidence that we come across in our work lives. It's very different to believe something is true than to prove that it is. So what is actually happening? Why is this happening? What has been done to forestall these developments and what could be done in the future to improve these efforts? These are questions that SASA's research team works to answer. Over the last two years, we have been working on the initial stages of our Sociology of Ancient Studies research program. This program is divided into the following major projects. An educational sociology research project documenting the health and engagement with ancient studies by the educational system in the United States, including K-12 schools and institutions of higher education. Number two is a marketing research project investigating public knowledge, interest, and conceptions of ancient studies as, and how ancient studies is marketed by departments and institutions, how they talk about it and how they try to attract the public to ancient studies, as well as developing tools for effective engagement with prospective students and families. The third one is a suite of research projects that examine and propose solutions to the internal and external cha challenges of ancient studies, such as the lack of diversity, outdated education, programming, and the disconnect with non-academic realities. Before continuing to give you a taste of our preliminary research, it's important to first define what we mean by ancient studies. The concept of ancient studies as encompassing a variety of academic disciplines is not yet widespread and accepted. SASA includes the disciplines you can see in this slide within ancient studies. 
As is apparent in this list, ancient studies include some disciplines that study all time periods. Nonetheless, the concept of a deeper past exists in all disciplines of historical study. This deeper past is what we mean to encompass by the term ancient, taking a global perspective on deeper human history and culture. Similar study of the deeper past is applicable within indigenous studies as well, we believe, which is why we include those fields, even though their deeper histories may not be separated within educational departmental structures, and even though indigenous communities instantiate living cultures that stem from that deeper past. The potential gains in accepting this moniker and associating these fields with one another is appreciable. The collaboration of our fields will allow for the creation of a larger place for those fields within the humanities, helping to prevent their downsizing and rather creating a unified advocacy platform within the humanities. In essence, forming an alliance of ancient studies fields puts us ahead of this downward trend and enables us to reposition ourselves as newly vital flourishing fields. In the rest of this presentation, I will present our initial partial findings of research on documenting how engaged institutions and students are with ancient studies. We modeled this research on the Humanities Indicators Project of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We identified five categories of indicators to study, which are quantitative metrics related to academic participation in ancient studies. These are degree completion, language course enrollment, demographics, funding, and accessibility. To date, we have completed the analysis of the first two and have been working on the others. The first two, particularly in the context of higher education, within the United States. By examining the indicators degree, completion, and language course and moment, we sought to find answers to various questions regarding the health of ancient studies, including how many degrees and programs of ancient studies are actually offered? What type of ancient studies degrees are offered? What type of institutions offer ancient studies degrees or programs? How has the demand for ancient studies degrees changed over time? and how broad-based is the interest in ancient studies course offerings. In studying the degree completion indicator, we measured the number of students who have completed a degree in any ancient studies field at the levels of associates, bachelors, masters, or PhD degrees. This is one of the most fundamental indicators of the state of the field. For this category, we collected data from the National Science Foundation's online data system which gathers information from the U.S. Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences, the National Center for Education Statistics, and Integrated Post-Secondary Data System, as well as data from the Humanities Indicators Project of the American Academy of Arts and Science. These data cover the years between 1997 to 2018, and they are updated every two to three years. 27,009 bachelor's degrees in disciplines of ancient studies were conferred in 2018 in the United States. The numbers might seem high, but it marks the sixth consecutive year of decline and a significant reduction from the 2012 apex by 33%, a difference of almost 13,000 fewer awarded degrees. It is also the lowest number since the beginning of the records, which dates back to 1997. This is in contrast with the trend observed before 2013. In fact, from 2002 to 2012, there's been a steady growth, which according to the findings of the Humanities Indicators Project is in line with almost every discipline in the humanities. We chose to show two potential trend lines for the future of the bachelor degrees in ancient studies. The green line shows a very optimistic increase by 2030, while the prediction of the red line confirms the reality that we've been experiencing in the past three years. Nevertheless, the truth is that the next few years we will probably see a further de decrease in the number of students. And this without taking into consideration the catastrophic potential impact that the pandemic may have brought to our fields. 
However, through segmenting types of schools, we expect that this trend will level off well above zero. The indicator of language course enrollment provides information about the number and demographics of students who enroll in language courses. This data is segmented into underclassmen, upperclassmen, and graduate students. We chose to investigate this indicator because it provides a portrait of interest in ancient studies through the progress of students' educational careers along the way while they study. Since introductory language courses are commonly taught to freshmen and sophomores, we have a view of interest at the beginning of students' studies in ancient studies. We can then trace the continued interest in ancient studies by students taking minors and majors as they take on higher level language courses, which we expect to better parallel the degree completion data. For this indicator, we gathered information from the language enrollment database of the Modern Language Association, MLA, which covers the years 1958 through 2016. The MLA 2019 report on language course enrollment in higher education revealed a continued drop in overall language enrollment in all languages since 2006, apart from the major world languages such as Korean, Chinese, and Japanese, which enjoyed modest gains. The vast majority of languages that are taught in American universities have lost students as universities drop language requirements or allow students to place out of them with AP credits. The general decline in enrollment is evidenced in ancient languages as well. The most recent sur MLA survey going back to 2006 shows that in the 10 year period between 2006 and 2016, language enrollment among the major ancient languages, including Latin, ancient Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew dropped significantly, especially at the introductory level, whereas less study languages lack enough data to actually show accurate trends. As you can see, this data um, parallels what's been going on in, the, in recent years, in the last eight years in degree um, completions. In sum, our research has evidentiated the downward trend in ancient studies by the two indicators that we have studied thus far. The downward trend already began in the early 2000s, but was actually interrupted by the economic recession in 2008, which led to higher collegiate enrollment across all fields of study. As more people went to school rather than trying to search for jobs, which were not as available. Consequently, the years 2008 through 2013 show a rise. However, from 2013 and on, the downward trend in ancient studies continues. Our statistically based future projections show the continuation of the downward trend. We are currently working on using more sophisticated predictive curve fitting methods to get a better sense of what the future might hold. However, we do expect there to be two mitigating factors that will continue to prevent the complete collapse of ancient studies fields. These are the expected continued participation in ancient studies by both religious schools and by elite schools. As our research continues, we will investigate the three other indicators and expand to a worldwide perspective. We will construct a database for ongoing monitoring of the health of ancient studies, which will be publicly available so other re researchers can use our data. Beyond just describing the state of ancient studies, we are also working on finding solutions to this problem. This will take the form of research on the current ways in which ancient studies and the humanities are promoted or marketed, and our creation of a marketing package, which we will disseminate to university departments and ancient studies organizations for their use. We are also applying to foundations for financial support for this project, so we can continue doing this good work. In addition to support our research program and help guide its development, we recently created an advisory board consisting of a group of excellent scholars and leaders in the humanities. These include beginning from the top left and proceeding counterclockwise, Joy Connolly, president of American Council of Learned Societies, Charles E. Jones, Tombrose Librarian of Classics and Humanities, at Penn State University, 
James Cork Webster, Reader in Classics, History and Liberal Arts at King's College London, Stephen Hunt, Lecturer and Senior so Teaching Associate for PGCE Classics at Cambridge University, Robert Townsend, Program Director for Humanities, Arts and Culture at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, John Kutzko, Executive Director of the Society of Biblical Literature, and Young Kim, Associate Professor of the Department of Classics and Mediterranean Studies and the Department of History at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Thank you all for listening. And I wonder, wonder if we might have some time for questions, but I'm not so sure. I think we have uh, one minute if anyone has uh, questions. Um, we have a couple of comments rather than questions in the tradition of academic conferences everywhere. Um, Voices of Ancient Egypt uh, says that one thing is considered with these drop in numbers is that college age populations have actually gone down. Gen Z is much smaller than the millennial generation. So obviously that's going to have an impact on, on the enrollments uh, that we see. Um, and New Necro is saying, I wonder how the pandemic might have affected these trends. It feels unexpected how the recession has helped enrollment. Right, that's actually an interesting factor that might go forward um, happen again since the 2008 recession caused an increase in enrollment may, pot potentially the pandemic recession might do this a similar um, bump um, but it, it's really unclear and these um, the data for these indicators lags by two three four years depending on how quickly the um, organizations that collect this information um, produce it and put it together and put it out to the public um, but we do expect to continue to update our data going forward in the future. Uh, we don't seem to have any more specific questions, so I'm going to pass over to Lauren and Cassandra, who are going to speak to us uh, on uh, live events per, uh, that they do, because they are both awesome uh, and run all of SAS's live events. So uh, Lauren and Cassandra, you please take it away. Hi everyone, um, I'm just going to share my screen really quick. It will hopefully go full screen. Um, but yes, yeah, so hello, um, I am Lauren Kubash and then Cassandra will introduce herself in a second. Um, but we run the communications and live events team with SASA. Um, so we'll just get started telling you a little bit more about that. So SASA live events range from monthly book clubs to archeo tours and reading groups, and of course more. Um, you hear from your favorite authors, learn about our Port Ancient partners, sign up for summer and winter reading groups, and take live virtual tours of your favorite ancient sites and museums. So that's just a general overview of what we do. Um, Cassandra, do you wanna introduce yourself before I start getting into the individual ones? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, hi, I am Cassandra. Uh, I just joined the live events team, I'd say, in May of this year, uh, and I'm just very excited to work with SASA on putting these together. Um, I've been around with SASA forever, if you haven't seen me at all the live events, basically. <laughs> Um, but so one of the main ones, the one that I got started with SASA with, and one of the first ones we ever, first things SASA ever did was reading groups. Um, so shout out to some of our veteran reading group leaders as well, who keep coming back to, uh, lead groups, but the SASA summer winter reading groups, um, connect to those interested in the ancient world through a range of topics to explore in weekly live discussions. Uh, through this project, we can continue to open the ancient, um, or ancient studies to students from high school, college, and beyond. Um, we actually get a little bit of a older crowd in these, which is really interesting. It's a lot of people that are going back for studies or always wanted to study this kind of topic um, and come here to learn with us. They're all led by what we call SASA Educational Ambassadors, which are PhD students who um, their research specializes in the um, topic that they're doing for the reading group. Um, this year, we were very, uh, got a very generous grant from the Gra Gladys Kriebel Delmas Foundation for the summer reading groups and for the winter reading groups last year, um, we got a grant from the Society of Classical Studies to run the groups and be able to pay our lovely PhD students and our intern on the team who is amazing and does everything alley. <laughs> um, um, and also, so, so those are really great. We've always had a really good turnout in them and really amazing discussion. They 
are discussion groups, not um, classes where you have to do homework and stuff like that. Um, and we also, if you go to our page on our website, which is saveancientstudies.org slash reading groups, you can find all the saved live syllabi from each group. We have them saved in Google Docs where it has all the openly accessible links to the readings that we use throughout the groups. The groups are from one-time master classes to eight to even 10 week groups for a few of them. Um, so they're really good places for resources, especially if you're writing papers or doing research on these specific um, topics that they're on, it's a gold mine for that. <laughs> All right, this is me. I part of what I work on is the monthly book clubs. Uh, they're a great chance to delve more in depth with some ancient history authors. Uh, we like to target books as they're coming out, but we're always open to books of all types. Uh, in the past, we've worked with Dr. Kara Cooney, who's doing our keynote later today, I believe, uh, for When Women Ruled the World and the Good Kings, Dr. Bart. Uh, Ermitten and Natalie Haynes as well. Uh, we've got some great book club, clubs upcoming just this Saturday, uh, Electra with Jennifer Saint. Uh, and in October, as yet to be determined, Nectar of the Gods with Liv Albert. That's uh, going to be super interesting, I think. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah. Nectar of the Gods is a cocktail book, which we always have high demand for wine night at Casa. So we're hoping to plan something similar to that going along with this book. And Liv also came on one of our Archeo Gaming live streams, which was one of our highest viewed videos um, with Liv from uh, Let's Talk About Myth Baby podcast. Oh. Uh, yes, and Crewing the Ship, our Port Ancient Partnership highlights. Uh, what Port Ancient is, is it's a partnership network uh, through which we share a variety of projects that focus on different aspects of ancient studies. So really things of all types from podcasts to tourism, uh, gaming, uh, World History Encyclopedia is a big partner. Uh, we've got a list on the bottom of the slide here of some of ours that we've posted most recently. Uh, what we believe these projects do is they help pave the way to save ancient studies, uh, focusing on public outreach, accessibility, and engagement. Uh, and our dedicated out outreach team works to recruit partners that share our vision. I believe we have a link on our website for people who wish to reach out to us to join this. We're always looking for new partners. Oh, and then so the live streams for them, um, we just started yes. introducing some of our partners on short 20 to 30 minute live streams. Um, mm -hmm. And going forward, hopefully we will have more partners highlighting more of their projects and stuff that they have coming out, um, like new books or videos or things like that. Um, then we have Destination Ancient, which is our Archeo Tours. Um, so we've actually done most of these with uh, Darius Aria from Save Rome and um, the American Institute for Roman Culture in, in Rome, in Italy. Um, and then also um, our good friend, uh, Lillian from Travolution Tours. Um, so these, the idea of these, again, is all about accessibility and to get um, live streams of ancient sites um, out to, on our social media pages and shared with our partners so that people can see things um, not totally in person, but, you know, see things more personally um, without having to travel far and spend a bunch of money. So, of course, they're walking around the sites explaining, uh, the you know, whichever one it is, depending on if it's a museum or archaeological site or not. Um, and they are usually, you know, experts in these fields of what they're talking about. So they give a little bit of of a more ancient studies view on, on these archeological sites that are hot tours locations too. So we hope to do a lot more of those in the future because that is something that is all over the world and we can do anywhere. Another project that we have that's kind of under the live events, which they already gave their presentation yesterday, is um, our Archeo Gaming Live team. So they are absolutely amazing and basically run our Twitch channel for us and our Discord. Um, they usually go live every Friday uh, during the season, so they're taking a break for the summer, but they have a really great lineup of stuff coming up next season, and that's led by Kate Minetti and Alexander Vanderwalle. Uh, they both are PhD students, Alexander specifically 
specifically studies Archeo gaming like topics for his research. And Kate does a ton of Archeo gaming too. So they're really a great team. So definitely check out their little recording of what they've done and what they have coming up. Uh, and then I think this might be one of the last slides is uh, the SASA communications team in general. So we kind of went through all the live events that we do. We have other things sprinkled in here. They're usually kind of master classes over the fundraisers. So definitely check that out because we have a Halloween bash fundraiser at the end of October that usually has a bunch of live events crammed in all together of great guests coming on to talk about all different kinds of topics. Um, but so the SESA communications team is kind of the other side of the live events team that really runs our social media pages. Um, so as it says, you're responsible for everything you see on social media and the website, which we do kind of try to have a mini website team as well. We also have an intercommunications team. So shout out to Eric <laughs> and Alfie on the intercommunications team who does a lot of our mass email communication as well. Um, so yes, we usually have a small team of interns that work on posting everything you see. So advertisements for our Argeo Gaming learning modules, our educational modules, and for the access database from the communications about our live events and signing up for our reading groups and recruitment, um, basically everything. Uh, so we've had a really great team, mostly Charlotte, who created our TikTok page. So definitely follow us on TikTok. She's been our main intern over the summer, posting pretty much everything you see. And then a little bit more specifically, we have the Inspire campaign. So the Inspire campaign was developed in the first summer of SASA with uh, Dr. Pinar Durgan um, and a group of great interns coming up with all these categories you see on the side over here. I'll read some out. Um, of different kinds of things that we think people keep inter keep people interested in ancient studies and um, would want to be come back to learn more information and click on the link of the website that we have for them to learn more information. So that's a big part of where our partnership with World History Encyclopedia came from because we use them on their amazing <laughs> amount of articles and access to information. Um, to have more in-depth look on the things that we're talking about in our social media posts without having like story long captions and stuff. Um, so we have some categories like ancient anime, ancient steam is a new one. So it's kind of like STEM, but including the arts. Um, so that one's really cool. Um, Modern words, ancient roots talks about the etymology of different words. Ancient kitchen has different videos on YouTube, um, literally recipe videos, making ancient recipes. So that's been a really fun project that also was um, funded by Society for Classical Studies uh, the first summer that we did it. Um, so I think with that, that is everything that we announced that like, oh, I maybe skipped one. Oh yes, of course. Most importantly, follow us on social media, everybody. <laughs> we are everywhere. You can basically Google Save Ancient Studies Alliance. Our links are all at the bottom of our website too, at the bottom of every page. Please do follow us on social media. It really makes a huge difference for us and including our partner organizations with Port Ancient and stuff. And uh, yeah, keeping people interested in more pop culture type things about ancient studies is it, oftentimes what you hear, what ropes people into taking college courses, especially at the undergrad level. Um, so follow us everywhere and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lauren and Cassandra so much. That was a fantastic rundown of what you guys do and the very, very valuable work uh, that the communications team does. We actually don't have any questions. We also don't have time for questions. So we are going to move on to the first session of the day um, to try and make sure we keep everything on track. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to end my screen share. Someone can cancel uh, it for me. Here we go. Okay. There we go. I can just. So our first session of the day is uh, displays of power uh, with Catherine Nichols Wild. So it's a nice little infographic for you. We have Catherine ready and waiting to go. Uh, so I am going to find her introduction. Sorry. I dislike screen sharing. I always lose everything that I'm doing. Uh, so Catherine uh, is a PhD student in art history and Latin American studies at Tulane University. As an epigrapher and art historian, she investigates the ancient art and writing of the ancient Maya. She is particularly interested in the ways in which the Maya conceived of these two categories as extensions of each other. In her dissertation, she examines Maya full figure glyphs as a clear intersection of the visual and the textual. In addition to her academic work, Catherine is also the founder of the Mesoamerican Studies Online, a blog and podcast that aims to share current scholarship on ancient Mesoamerica with the general public. 
Uh, the title of her paper is The Spoils of War and the Privileges of Rulers, Maya Fulfigure Glyphs as Signs of Privilege and Dominion. And before I hand over to Catherine, if you are feeling the need to use hashtags at any point of today, we do have a lot of them. They are all in the program for um, the conference. This particular hashtag for uh, Catherine's session is OAW Session Displays of Power. Uh, so Catherine, thank you for your patience. Please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and we are set to go. All right. So thank you so much, first of all, to Sasa for, for putting together this conference and giving me the opportunity to present. I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm also currently in Mexico working on an extension of this research. Um, my internet should be good, but I'm apologizing in advance in case it's not. Um, it's not my usual internet. Um, but so I wanted to go ahead and just get started with this presentation. Um, I have made a slight change uh, to the title, The Spoils of War or The Privileges of Rulers, which will come into play throughout the presentation. In the 8th century CE, oops, excuse me, in the 8th century CE, Maya scribes at the sites of Quirigua and Copan, among others, began carving unique inscriptions using glyphs formed from the bodies of full figured deities. These inscriptions use standard Maya hieroglyphs, but build on their iconic properties to create a moment in which the glyphs appear to be living creatures, grappling with each other, straining to free themselves from the glyph block containing them, and in some cases sitting quietly and affably with each other in the civil attitude of rulers. My dissertation examines these inscriptions as both visual and linguistic objects, analyzing their iconographic content, their role in visual programs at Maya sites, and the way that they represent an ongoing interaction between the textual and the visual in the Maya world. For today's presentation, I focus on one specific question. In moments of conflict and competition, as is the case in Kiriwa's rebellion against Copan, what role did full figure inscriptions play, if any? I argue that rather than spoils of war, full figure glyphs function as an index of a ruler's ability to wield power and commission accomplished artists. But first, I want to provide some important context. The Maya culture began and continues to thrive in Guatemala, southeastern Mexico, and its Yucatan Peninsula, Belize, and the western parts of Honduras and El Salvador, essentially the right side of the screen shown here. The heart of the ancient Maya world, particularly the classic period that I study, resided in the lowland regions of Guatemala's Paten and extended into the peripheral areas surrounding it. On the eastern side of the region, just across the modern Guatemala Honduras border, the site of Copan became an, in, an important cultural center, despite being on the very edge of the Maya world. Its innovation in art and architecture make it stand out as one of the most famous of Maya cities. Just to the northeast in modern day Guatemala, the much smaller site of Quirigua sits near the Motagua River Valley, the most famous source of jade in all of Mesoamerica. This small site, originally established by nearby Copan, now boasts the largest stele in the Maya world. The Maya occupied this time, this area from time immemorial and continue to occupy the area today, surviving even the worst of colonialism. Those of us who study the ancient Maya generally divide our study into three periods, the pre-classic, the classic, and the post-classic, ending in 1521 with the European invasion of Mesoamerican shores. Today's presentation centers on a small sliver of time towards the end of the classic period, the eighth century CE, as the Maya civilization reached a peak of social and cultural development. The function and implications of full figure glyphs at Copan and Quirigua rely heavily on an understanding of the site's history and interactions with each other. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction. I mentioned previously that Copan founded Quirigua, it did so in the early classic period after the reign of its most famous founder, Kinich Yashkuk Mo, who Copan continued to revere for generations after his death. Copan's own founding stems from Kinich Yashkuk Mo's famous journey to the central Mexican site of Teotihuacan, where he participated in a ritual that granted him authority to act as a founding dynast and establish his own dynasty. Through the generations of uh, after Quirigua's founding by Copan, rulers of the smaller site would dedicate monuments that cited their connection to Copan. 
These connections largely reference a blood connection between the rulers of the two sites, suggesting that the site of Kiriwa might have been ruled either by younger brothers or half brothers of the heirs of the Kopan dynasty. Relations between the two sites are recorded matter of factly for the most part during the reigns of Kopan's first 12 rulers, and not much changed until the reign of Washak Lahun Ubah Kawil, Kopan's 13th ruler. This ruler reigned for more than 40 years and transformed much of the site. He dedicated a series of stele in the site's main plaza, each representing him in moments of powerful ritual. In 724, he supervised the accession of the new ruler at Kiriwa, Kaktiliu Chanyapat, a ruler who would prove to become Washak Lahunubah Kawil's political undoing. After 14 years subordinate to Kopan, Kiriwa's ruler, Kaktiliu, appears to have decided that he preferred independence for his site. Although the exact machinations of the event are unclear, what is clear is that in 738 CE, Kaktiliu Chanyapat orchestrated a rebellion with the help of a larger powerful site to the north called Kalakmul. In this rebellion, Kopan's ruler, Washak Lahunubah Kawil, was taken captive and later beheaded at the hands of his subordinate and likely relative. This event would provoke a level of animosity between the two sites that lasted for the better part of the century until the death of Kirigua's liberator in 785. Kaktilu Chanyapat's first act as an independent ruler are very revealing. Although no monuments are dedicated for about seven years after the battle, Kaktilu sets to work on a program of consolidation, opening a sandstone quarry from which he could harvest materials for his own monuments. His first stela, Stela S, was dedicated in 746 CE, followed by Stela H in later years, pictured here. This represents the first time in recent Kirigua history that a ruler had commissioned a portrait of himself in monumental architecture. Matthew Luper, who wrote a book on the reign of Kaktilu Chanyapat, argued that perhaps while he was subordinate to Kopan, Kaktilu was not allowed to commission likenesses of himself. And this would be the first sign of his independence that he commissioned one. I agree with this conclusion, especially because this idea of figuration and portraiture were really important aspects of elite monumental art. Another unique aspect of Kaktilu's monumental art program following the defeat of Kopan is that in the years following his victory, the monuments erected at the site seem clearly intended to improve on or copy those dedicated in recent history at Kopan including Stila H's attempt at copying Kopan's Stila J. And I'll kind of flip back and forth between these two so you can compare the, the monuments and the quality. Uh, David Stewart, Elizabeth Newsom, and Matthew Luper have all written about this phenomenon in which Kaktiliu appears to imitate the programs that became such a distinguishing factor at Kopan. But um, in the opinion of many, they never rise to the same quality that uh, was seen at Kopan. Full figure inscriptions also appear during the reign of Kaktilu Chanyapat, as I mentioned before, and this was the first time that glyphs of this type were used at the site. Other scholars have drawn attention to the fact that they only appear after Kirigua attains independence, and this led to my original question. Were full figure glyphs, or perhaps the scribes who carved them, a spoil of war taken by Kirigua after its defeat of Kopan? Perhaps the most popular theory for the origin of full-figure glyphs at Kirigua offers the possibility that during or immediately after the battle with Kopan, Kaktiliu Chanyapat took the Kopan scribes captive as part of the bounty accorded to him as the winning ruler. This theory is bolstered by evidence from other parts of the Maya world, including the mural seen here from Bonham Park, in which we see scribes taken captive after a consequential battle, and even in some cases with their hands mutilated so they can't continue to practice their craft. We know that scribes were also lent out from site to site and sometimes worked in a general region rather than at one site in particular. So it wouldn't be too outlandish to suggest that in this case, the victor might have captured the scribes of his captive in order to recreate some of the loser's greatest hits. Other theories exist though. In 2014, Stephen Houston suggested that the intense antagonism between Kopan and Kirigua might have driven them perhaps to aesthetic competition, resulting in an oeuvre in which each attempted to better the other. Although he leaves space for the possibility that the same scribes might have worked at both sites, he seems to suggest that each site would have had their own designated scribes, 
rapidly developing new technologies and forms of representation, trying to outpace the other. Finally, Simon Martin recently noted that although evidence exists in the Maya world for scribes that were borrowed out or even captured in warfare, it's possible that in this specific case of Copan and Quirigua, accomplished scribes, not necessarily from Copan, might have been attracted to Quirigua's newfound independence and wealth after its rebellion and brought their services there. He expresses doubt in the likelihood that a master capable of creating full figure glyphs was present at Quirigua and simply awaiting the opportunity to show off his skills. And he instead suggests that there's a greater likelihood that an accomplished artist would have been attracted to Quirigua after it grew because of its defeat of Popon. Each of these theories that I've presented here has merit in its own right and formed an important part of the foundation of my own study. However, these represent single sentences and most a paragraph in larger works that barely touch this event that shook the bedrock of the Eastern Maya world. By and large, no one has looked in detail at the immediate context of full figure glyphs within this political context. Even Looper, who wrote an entire book, um, only mentions these full figure glyphs in passing in his description of Kakibu Chanyopat monuments. So for the remainder of my presentation, I'll describe the advantages and disadvantages to each of these theories and present a few ideas of my own in an attempt to sift out a potential explanation for the emergence of full figure glyphs at Kibwa after the rebellion. So to create a clear understanding of the context in which full figure inscriptions emerged, I began by creating a timeline of the events that occurred at both sites during this time period and the monuments with full figure inscriptions that were dedicated. Previous scholars, including the ones I just mentioned, have done excellent work compiling the history of these two sites and their interactions and the order in which important monuments and buildings were dedicated, alongside a careful chronology of each site in particular. I've in turn compiled their data into the timeline here placed within the context of full figure monuments. And when we examine this timeline, an interesting gap emerges. You'll notice that these yellow triangles are full, full figure inscriptions dedicated at Copan, and the gray ones are inscriptions dedicated at Quirigua. Um, 738 CE, we see a full figure monument dedicated two years before at Copan, um, and then the fall of Copan at the hands of Quirigua. And then we have a huge gap between that moment and the first dedication of a full figure inscription at Kiwa. So rather than immediately using full figure glyphs as a way to demonstrate his newfound power and to taunt his defeated enemy, Kaktilu waited to commission the first full figure monument until 766 CE, nearly 30 years after Kapan's defeat. So if full figure glyphs were truly taken as spoils of war, why wouldn't Kaktilu flaunt them immediately? After the decisive 738 defeat, Copan and Kiriwa underwent four different phases that I've highlighted here in four different colors, each aligning with a change in rulership at one of the sites and each showing, uh, each showing a change in the relationship between the respective rulers. Um, excuse me. Um, we begin with the, de with the decapitation of Washapakunu Bakhalil and the accession of Kakoplach Chanyopat. Uh, and we notice at this point that he actually does not dedicate any monuments besides this one that makes a passing reference to Kiwa as its subordinate, um, a slight subtle jab um, re referencing the fact that Kiwa was still in fact in under Kopan's uh, control. Kiriwa doesn't really seem to pay much attention to this and continues building. Um, and we see the, the reign of Kakoplach Chankawil pass without incident. The following ruler, Kakipiak Chankawil, actually commissions monuments that seem to more directly rebuff uh, Kiriwa's independence um, at the hands of uh, the ruler Kakipiak Chankawil. He dedicates the hieroglyphic stairway that had been begun in the reign of Washakal Sonu Bakhawil. Um, and in this monument, we actually see full figure glyphs showing up on the staircase and at the, uh, at the shrine at the top of the pyramid. So what's interesting here is that when full figure glyphs reemerge, they reemerge uh, at Copan and not at Kirigua. So this sort of uh, weakens the theory, the idea that the scribes creating full figure full figure glyphs might have been taken as a spoil of war. 
The rest of this time period sees the construction of huge monuments at Kitigua, the tallest stele um, in the Maya world, but no full figure glyphs. Um, this still has not happened yet. And so in the third stage, we see the accession of Yashpasach Chan, uh, Chan Yopat, um, excuse me, I wrote Kawil here, but it's Yopat, um, at Kopan as, uh, as Katilu Chan Yopat continues to reign. So he's got a very long reign, he's still alive, still as ambitious and proud as ever. Um, and during this time at Kopan, Yashpasach Chan Yopat is uh, undergoing some social and political strife. So he's having to um, allow lower level elites to do things that previously they weren't allowed to do in order to garner their support. And that include allow, included allowing them to dedicate full figure monuments that we see here, these three that represent full figure benches. Now these were dedicated not by rulers, but by lower level elites and presided by, uh, presided over, excuse me, by Yash Pasach Chanyapat. And so, um, it, it's during this time period that we start to see the flourishing of full figure glyphs. This is also when we start to see them showing up at Kirigua itself. So we see the dedication of Kirigua's Stila D um, that is the very first instance of full figure glyphs at Kirigua. And I think it's very significant that it coincides with this third phase where um, tensions are starting to cool between Copan and Kirigua. Um, we're not seeing the intense antagonism that we saw with Kakipiach Chankawil. We also see more full figure monuments dedicated at Kiwa. It's as if at this moment in this third phase, once it's possible, Kaktilu does it over and over again. So we have Kiriwa Zoomorph B as well that has the longest uh, uh, inscription seen at Kiriwa of full figure glyphs. And then finally, Kaktilu passes into the underworld. Another ruler takes his place at Kiriwa and we see relationships fully restored between the two sites. Um, Jade Sky, the next Kiriwa ruler, actually carries out uh, a ritual with Yash Pasach. Um, and so it gives a very clear idea that these sites are becoming friends again. Um, we also see the dedication of one more monument with full figure glyphs, Altar O is seen here, and the dedication of Zoomorph P, which has been argued to be a full figure glyph in its own right. And I'm happy to discuss that more in detail um, in the question and answer section. Um, so looking at these proposed theories, the first we've already really discounted. Um, the idea that scribes competed with Copan doesn't make sense if these full figure glyphs are happening at a time when the sites are starting to get along a little bit better. Um, there was aesthetic competition for sure, but not during the time that full figure glyphs were being created at, at Kiriwa. So the two theories that I like are first that Kiriwa's growing power attracted accomplished scribes from elsewhere, or my own theory that after reconciliation, Copan allowed their scribes to work at Kiriwa and create full figure inscriptions. Um, now I can't present anything for sure now, but I am currently beginning my field research to examine the style and authorship of these monuments to figure out um, if there were, if the scribes working at these sites were the same scribes um, or if they were different. And then I'll do a comparison to other glyphs on the Western side of the Maya world as well. Um, so just in sum, um, these full figure glyphs give us a really great opportunity to look inside the world of Maya rulers, the way that they communicated their power through the use and manipulation of visual images. And um, as we study these with more detail and looking closely at the interactions between these sites, we get an idea not only of the rulers that were in power, but the way that the scribes creating these worked both within the political contexts and without them. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. That was absolutely fascinating, especially as someone with absolutely no information and prior knowledge um, about the region you work in. And judging by the chat, a lot of people found this really, really interesting. We have several questions and we do have time before we move on to our next session. So the first question is asking about the people depicted on these glyphs. Um, are they, do we know true to life? Do people actually dress in that way? Or is this uh, a special style kind of reserved for pictorial? depictions? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the most part, it depends on the glyph. So these glyphs represent deities um, and the they also sometimes represent rulers and ancestors, excuse me, and the occasional animal, right? Um, when it represents deities, we are seeing a true to life 
idea of how deities were represented in art. So they would usually wear a very simple loincloth. You can see one right here. Um, and the loincloth itself, although simple, was usually dedicated with jade and other precious materials. And they would also wear headbands made out of um, materials as well, very precious materials. Here we have a representation of a ruler, and this was also true to life. Um, the ruler would have worn these fantastic jade uh, pectorals, earrings, and a headband representing his rulership. Um, so yes, for the most part, these full figure glyphs are actually very true to life in the sense that they represent what is represented in figural art. And from what we know of uh, everyday life of rulers, they would have been represented the same way as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, someone asking, could it be that during the 30 years after the war, it's just that full figured glyphs fell out of fashion or maybe the glyph makers were engaged in other occupations? That's a great question. And it's something that, I, that I'm really looking forward to digging into because during these 30 years, we don't see full figure glyphs happening either at Copan or at Kirigua. They happened once at Copan right, right before the, uh, the big war, um, but then they fall into a hiatus. They do occur at Yashchilan, which is a site on the Western side of the Maya world um, during this period. So broadly, they still seem to be in fashion, but not at these two sites. And so it could be that maybe it was a, an ebb and flow of interest. Um, it could also be that because of the uh, the materials and the uh, the words escaping me, but the, the things invested, the amount of effort invested into the war itself and recovery, they just couldn't afford the artists making these. So yeah, it's another really interesting aspect that I'm looking in, looking forward to digging into. Thank you. Um, did the Maya build roads of any sort? Uh, the questioner can't recall ever seeing one. And did they have the wheel for use with carts? Great questions. Um, roads, yes, we have huge roads that are actually becoming a lot more easy for us to identify with the advent of LIDAR. Um, there's some really great documentaries about the use of LIDAR and the way that it's revealing roads and cities to us. So we know that they had a really intense networking system that connected all of the sites throughout the Maya world and throughout Mesoamerica in general. Um, they had the concept of the wheel, but they did not use it for transportation. Um, we've seen wheels only really for um, children's toys and for spindle whirls, um, but they, uh, all of their transportation of goods was on the backs of human beings. Thank you very much. Um, one final question before we uh, move on, uh, asking if this uh, kind of change in, in glyptic style could be to do with the legitimation, um, excuse me, Sorry, my four-year-old decided that now was an excellent time to barge in. He had a whole half hour where I was muted, but no, now is necessary. Uh, anyway, sorry, um, could this change have to do with the legitimization uh, in uh, Kiriguaya or taking the artistic form from Copan? Yes, and this was something that I was really hoping to be able to prove it right out the gate um, was that full figure glyphs were a sort of legitimization. Um, and they don't seem to be a form of legitimization at the very beginning, um, because I think portraiture does that. I think there's a really good argument that this portraiture is the beginning of legitimization. But I think that it's really significant that um, Washak Lahunu Bachkawil's last monument was a full figure monument. Um, I think that Copan and Kiriwa both pick up on that during their period of competition. And that Kiriwa sort of subsumes that or tries to use that um, as part of legitimization. And so it's something that I, I would really love to be able to prove. I haven't been able to yet, but I think that there's a, there's a decent foundation building for it. It's a great question. Thank you. And uh, before we say goodbye and let you go, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about your work and what you do? Absolutely, yeah. So um, Mesoamerican Studies Online, um, you can go to my website and from there it'll link to, um, to both Twitter and Instagram. Um, so Mesoamerican Studies Online is the website. I'm also personally on Twitter, uh, C underscore Knuckles underscore Wild. And that, that's linked also through, my, uh, through the Twitter page for Mesoamerican Studies Online. So um, yeah, mostly the easiest way is through the website and then the link from there to everything else. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for an excellent and informative uh, presentation. We have approximately four minutes before we start our next session. So in the interest of keeping things on time, I will put a holding screen up, uh, have a walk around, go grab some water, and we'll be back in four minutes. Thank you.
Okay, so we are just about at 12. Slight change to the published schedule. We will be starting today's session or this afternoon session with uh, Dr. Jackson Reinhardt, uh, as our first presenter is not yet with us. So uh, this next session is session four, Resistance Against Leaders. Um, Jackson Reinhardt is an independent scholar, podcast host, and freelance writer specializing in biblical theology. Not only has he published in a variety of peer-reviewed publications in patristics, biblical studies, and religious history, but he has been a longtime ally of Sasa and was a former intern for the organization. The title of his paper is That Ye May Be Able to Stand Against the Wiles of the Devil, Divine Vice Regency and the Armor of God in Ephesians. So I will end my screen share. And Dr. Reinhardt, please take it away. Thank you so much, Megan. Just one clarification. I'm sadly not yet a doctor, but maybe in the future. My apologies. Um, <laughs> no problem. I, it's, it's, uh, it, it's no problem. So thank you so much for SASA for hosting this conference. Uh, last year was absolutely fantastic. And the presenters this year have been even uh, more extraordinary. So thank you again for the opportunity. And I will begin. <clears throat> the epistle to the Ephesians has a troubled legacy within both majority position historical criticism and imperial biblical criticism the latter hermeneutic being the investigation of Rome's critical influence on the writing and thought world of the New Testament authors. In historical criticism, there is a now universal consensus that Ephesians is not the work of Paul of Tarsus, but from the hands of a later author writing within a post-Pauline or even anti-Pauline tradition. While this paper is not the place to review such arguments, this authorial position has led many scholars to argue that Ephesians lacks not only the theological tropes of a genuine Pauline letter, those being Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st Thessalonians, Galatians, Philemon, and Philippians, but also the radical egalitarian outlook of Paul himself. To Richard Horsley, the true Paul has been submerged in, quote, the liberative narratives, songs, and proclamations have been overlaid by domesticating disciples, end quote. Marcus Borg and J.D. Crossan go even further, identifying the Deuteropauline tradition in Ephesians, Colossians, and the Pastorals as the work of an anti-Paul. Indeed, the, this characterization is not without warrant. The political orientation of epistles like Ephesians is decidedly more accommodating, if not supportive, to the structures and systems of, of oppressive imperial power embodied in first century CE Rome, then the apostle who, by subverting the motto of Pax Romana, wrote that those proclaiming peace and security will face sudden destruction during Christ's apocalyptic return, and that is 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Typically, the evidence scholars utilize in demarcating Ephesians as imperial accommodationist literature is the hierarchical and patriarchal household codes in Ephesians 5, 22, 6, 9, which outlines how members of the pater familias are to behave in regards to one another, children to parents, wives to husbands, slaves to masters. However, in this paper, I argue that Ephesians accommodates the presuppositions and propaganda of Roman imperialism in that by clothing Christ in the language of royal ideology, and equipping early Jesus believers in the spiritual armor of God, the epistle simultaneously denudes the imminent and deeply political eschatology of authentic Pauline Christianity and places present opposition to the gospel firmly in the supernatural realm. I will look to both ancient Jewish and Greco-Roman political theology to see the intellectual and literary antecedents to the concepts featured and apply to Christ and the early Jesus believers within the epistle. Greco-Roman and Hebraic literature frequently portrays the political role of the king emperor as the vice regent of God and or the gods. This characterization was a core tenet of Roman imperial theology. Caesar was the earthly representative of divine rule. Official and unofficial histories, inscriptions, and political miscellanea from the first and second century CE claim the occupant in the role of Caesar was designated by, quote, the supreme god Jupiter Zeus, to be vice regent or agent to rule humans on the earth, end quote. The imperial cult of Domitian, 81 to 96 CE, forcefully promoted the notion that, quote, Jupiter protects Domitian as he carries out the task, manifesting Jupiter's presence, reign, and blessings for the well-being of subjects, end quote. Even the erudite Stoic philosopher Seneca in his letter on clemency declared Nero, quote, out of all mankind, has been chosen and thought fit to perform the office of a god on earth, end quote. 
The same thinking is replete in the Jewish tradition. Psalm 110.1 presents Yahweh imploring an unnamed king of Judah to become his vice regent. Quote, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. End quote. The second temple document, the Psalms of Solomon, features the same conceptual language as both Roman and Old Testament theology. The spirit of Yahweh fills this Davidic, messianic, ideal king and designating that the elect monarch will, quote, rule over Israel in the time which God chose, destroy the unrighteous rulers and cleanse Jerusalem from the Gentiles who trample her to destruction, end quote. When the proper divinely elected king is enthroned, there will be consequently a cosmo-terrestrial epoch of unending peace. As per Julian Smith, in both political and theological traditions of Greece, Rome, and early Judaism, quote, the ideal state of humanity, the ideal state of peace and harmony and virtue is enjoyed when God rules through his human agent, the king, end quote. In Ephesians, the author analogously employs this political theological rhetoric and applies it to the cosmic role of Christ after the resurrection. Christ has now been enthroned at the right hand of God the Father, Ephesians 1.20, placed, quote, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. He has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church. And quote, Ephesians 1.22, 21.22. In the epistle, Christ is thus the ideal chosen king, acting from his enthroned position in the heavenly places, having ushered in an era of cosmic reconciliation and harmony. Christ has reconciled humanity with the Godhead, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, and destroyed the separation between Jew and Greek. Quote, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down hostility between us. End quote, Ephesians 2, 14. Christ also establishes concord within the universal church and individual household, Ephesians 4, 16, 5, 22 through 6, 9. Like Domitian, Ephesians depicts Jesus' function as, quote, the agent of God's blessing to the church, the ultimate aim of which is nothing less than the restoration of divine harmony to the cosmos, end quote. Christ is all but defeated, in essence, the powers and principalities now under the feet, his feet, through his crucifixion and resurrection. Thus, to the author of Ephesians, Christ's reign is effective and legitimate in both earthly and spiritual planes. Nevertheless, Ephesians' notion of divine or vice regency deviates from common Greco-Roman Jewish concept of the divine warrior king. Instead of Christ preparing himself in armor to fight celestial and or worldly foes, the congregants of the church must wear these metaphorical military vestments. Quote, Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, end quote, Ephesians 6.11. This armor includes a shield, sword, breastplate, and helmet, among other military accoutrements. But if Christ is king, why is he not wearing armor? As one scholar put it, quote, in antiquity, the ideal king was nothing if not victorious, end quote. Military victory was a significant source of legitimacy for ancient kings. According to first century CE Roman poet Statius, a sign of divine election was not only blessing with an adequate food supply, but more importantly, triumph in quote unquote warfare. Indeed, the very foundation of the Pax Romana was military success and supremacy, or as the historian Tacitus put it, bloodshed. In the Hebrew Bible and second temple literature, Yahweh is described on many occasions as having put on armor before battling the forces of chaos or redeeming a forsaken Israel. See specifically Isaiah 59, 15 through 20. The wisdom of Solomon explicitly notes this, detailing that, quote, the Lord will take his zeal as his whole armor and will arm all creation to repel his enemies, end quote, wisdom 517. Indeed, when Ephesians speaks of putting on the armor of God, should not the author be speaking of Christ, who has valiantly played, placed all opponents below his feet? The congregational armament of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 subtly indicates that the author of Ephesians does not adhere to the belief in an imminent eschatological return of Christ. The authentic Paul fervently believed that, quote, the rulers of this age are doomed to perish, end quote, in the parousia, the return of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 6. Those rulers being, according to Richard Horsley, quote, 
human political actors, the Roman Empire generally, end quote. As the apostle states in Romans 13, 11 through 12, this perishing is coming quickly, quote, the hour has already come. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is almost here, end quote. In Ephesians, however, Christ no longer must engage in battles against the forces of darkness opposed to the gospel. In fact, Christ, through the Spirit, has worked regenerating congregants who previously followed the quote-unquote rulers of the air, Ephesians 2.2. In other words, the cataclysmic conflict between Christ and evil has seemingly already occurred. The decisive battle has been in the past. While there was no war, Julian Smith notes, there is still bloodshed. Yet, quote, the only bloodshed is that of Christ, end quote, during his crucifixion. Christ is cosmically victorious, sans apocalyptical chaos conf. And now the responsibility of standing firm, Ephesians 6, 13 through 14, against oppositional forces to the gospel lays upon the laity. Moreover, just as Christ's victory occurred in the past, so is salvation a historical event. In Ephesians, quote, this realized eschatology corresponds with the letters understanding of salvation, where the emphasis is on a salvation which has been already accomplished by the Christ event, end quote. Thus, even the salvific character of the Perusia, in which Christ will judge the living, the dead, and especially the present governing authorities, has been historicized. All powers, whatever they may be and whatever they may be, are now beneath Christ's feet, and the salvation of all elect congregants is guaranteed. See especially the language of predestination in this letter, chapter 1 and 2. Thus, what are Jesus' believers to do but live a life of normalcy and harmony thanks to this newfound peace of Christ and implicitly the Roman imperial order of Pax Romana? Thus, what Ephesians illuminates is that the concurrent powers of the earth, Rome first among them, are not to be confronted with any type of actualized or even rhetorical violence from heavens or here on earth. Ephesians 6.12 states, quote, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, end quote. Christ is our peace, claims Ephesians, and he, quote, makes peace in one body through the cross, end quote, Ephesians 2.14.16. As for Harry O'Meyer, quote, the author of Ephesians transforms a Roman ideology of imposed peace as a sign of secession of hostility to a peace won through the death of Jesus, end quote. Marcus Borg and J.D. Crossan further elaborate on the notion of peace between the writing of the authentic Paul, which they argue is diametrically opposed to that which is promoted by Rome. To them, imperial peace is when all is quiet and orderly, while Pauline Christianity promotes a peace when all is fair and just. But Ephesians effectively collapses the two. The Pauline hope of a divinely sanctioned overturning of impressive imperial powers and the restoration of creation itself, see 1 Thessalonians 5 and Romans 8, 18, 23, is dashed in Ephesians, replaced by a realized eschatology of the past, which may be just considered a theology of pacification. Christians do not fight actively against wickedness, but merely withstand, stand firm, prevail. These are the languages and verbs that are used in Ephesians 6.13. Against what? Idolatrous temptation and tempting cosmic entities, which they are able to withstand with the help of God's armor. The rulers of earth are here to stay. And in fact, their peace to Ephesians in no way counters the gospel of Christ. What does counter Christ's proclamation on earth is the supernatural powers and principalities evil cosmic forces and idolatrous temptations, which I mentioned. Much like the authentic Pauline letters of 1 Corinthians, specifically see 1 Corinthians 10.20, Ephesians focuses on the issue of prior and or contemporaneous worship sacrifice to different deities, idols, and spirits. The author of Ephesians sees, quote, pagan deities not as imaginary or lifeless, but powerful and evil emissaries of the devil himself, end quote. One needs the powerful armor of God in order to resist such diabolical wickedness and perhaps the religious cultural allure of paganism itself. Ephesians operates within a worldview common in Hellenized Jewish literature that there existed, quote, a reality of evil spirit beings, end quote, 
In fact, the author of Ephesians does not in any way demythologize this occultic influence within the epistle, but instead reaffirms the relationship of the devil with other forms of sin, such as the flesh. As scholar Clinton Ardell notes, quote, the flesh and the devil with his powers works in confluence, leading humanity into disobedience with God, end quote. To Ephesians, therefore, the only forces working against the peaceful harmony of the contemporary church are supernatural, unseen forces working in collaboration with the ghouls of paganism and other personified deadly sins. The totalizing, pervasive political structure of domination embodied by Roman imperial rule is passed over in silence. The issues of this earth are either irrelevant, solvable by application of proper household codes, interpersonal relationships that are elaborated within the letter, or mere misunderstanding of the root cause of the issue. It is not Rome's unequal or unjust imperial system that results in personal and or collective suffering or poverty, but rather the forces of evil lurking in the realm of the air. Thanks to the Pax Romana, the only conflict a Jesus follower, believer, has to face is spiritual, for there are no longer necessarily battles occurring between cities and states. However, it is true that the Ephesians metaphor of a Christian decorated in military garb is not novel to the epistle. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8, Paul urges his audience to, quote, put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, the hope of salvation. Also see Romans 6, 13, 23. Yet what differentiates the urging of the authentic Paul and the author of Ephesians is the purpose and nature of the armor. In 1 Thessalonians, putting on the armor is a matter of supernaturally, if not bodily, protecting oneself for the imminent return of Christ, in which the cosmic conflict involves both spiritual and physical realms. The imagery Paul utilizes in 1 Thessalonians is also typological. The frequent citation to Hebrew scriptures in 1 Thessalonians and beyond, which depicts the day of the Lord, referenced frequently in the minor and major prophets of the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, this, this event is a brutal and earth-shattering. It persuades a reader to believe that Paul himself thought a similar, violent, earth-shattering occurrence was to apocalyptically unfold when Christ's return. Ephesians lacks any such language. Truly, in the latter letter, the armor is practically unnecessary. Christ in Ephesians, especially 1 20, 22, is already declared victorious over diabolic powers afflicting the church. Christ is not a divine warrior, but an ideal king who in Ephesians 2 14, 17 is portrayed as a peacemaker par excellence. The armor of God is not a mean, means for kingly or corporate protection for an imminent eschaton or global divine conflict. Instead, Ephesians constructs it as mere personal practice against the persuasion of false worship. In conclusion, Ephesians is de-eschatologicalization, I apologize for that word, and supernaturalization of the early Jesus movement experience demonstrates the means by which the text depoliticizes the Pauline tradition, accommodating thought, theology, and behavior away from direct confrontation or even acknowledgement of Rome. God's armor thus becomes a metaphorical invocation of personal struggle with contemporaneous idolatrous practice and belief, and those idols being agents of the devil. The enemies of the church and its gospel have become supernaturalized forces that have no actual bearing on the course of human events. They have already been defeated by Christ the King, and individual salvation of the believer is guaranteed through predestination. Now, there should only be harmony amongst members of the church and household, a harmony that reflects this hierarchical, patriarchal household code of the Roman Paterfamilias, Ephesians 5, 22, 6, 9. The question becomes, are Christians still to proclaim justice, righteousness, peace, and deliverance? Well, in Ephesians, justice is within the household. Peace rules both the earth and heavenly realms under Christ's authority. Salvation is a historical fact. Thus, Ephesians not only depoliticizes Paul's eschatological message and supernaturalizes Christian opponents or opponents of Christianity, but promotes a religion of norm normalcy, passivity, and accommodation. The only issue to watch closely for are the spiritual forces of evil temptation. 
Ephesians seems to turn Christian eyes away from the horrors of Rome to desperately having them try to find and resist demons in the air. Yet, it is problematic to classify early Christian texts like Ephesians as wholly pro-Roman or in contradistinction, 1st and Corinthians and Thessalonians as purely anti-Roman. Indeed, early Christian writers and communities engaged in negotiating their own communal and theological identities with various manifestations of Roman imperial power that surrounded and submerged them. While some scholars such as Stephen J. Gaudet rightly claim Ephesians represents a fundamental inversion of the utopian hope that pervades the authentic Paul's writings. These assertions converge on being simplistic and ignore the essential hybridity that existed within these communities, a complex mixture of ideological and theological affirmations, negations and ambivalences that sought contextual ends for persons and collectives. In Ephesians, while the presentation of Christ is not a divine warrior in line with Roman and Jewish traditions, he is still portrayed as a king nonetheless, who has achieved victory, if in the past, Christians throughout the apostolic and patristic age, while not directly engaging in rebellion against Rome, would be clear and adamant that they worshiped only Christ and never the reigning Caesar. While Ephesians, quote, nowhere explicitly condemns Roman rule or lays out an alternative political vision, end quote, the letter nonetheless is still representative of an early Christian tradition that explicitly confirmed the kingship and lordship of a resurrected Jesus who, to them, possessed authority over all sovereignties and powers. Thank you very much. Jackson, thank you. That was very, very interesting. Um, I have a question. If anyone else has a question, please put it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, after my question, we'll be moving on to our next presenter. What is eschatology? Well, eschatology is merely the study or recognition of the end of the world, that, that, that eschatology discusses last things. That's what it refers to. In theology, eschatology can either refer to personal eschatology, what will be the state of an individual after their death, uh, or it can refer to the end of the world. So when we speak of eschatology or de-eschatologicalization, as I apologize for, what I'm referring to is that Ephesians does not include uh, apocalyptic discourse within its letter. So eschatology refers to the end of, end of the world, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have one question for you from the audience before we move on, um, asking if it is hard to quantify pro-Roman stances on a spectrum between appeasement and full-on de-escalation. Yes, it's, I, and I mentioned this with hybridity at the end, it's incredibly complex and impossible to put on a spectrum um, that that you were either fully in line with the Roman system or fully against it, even seemingly the most accommodative letters of the New Testament, uh, the pastorals, for example, First and Second Timothy and Titus, and we could also say Ephesians, have elements implicitly that resist a full-blown accommodation or support to the Roman system. And so I would say that there's no way to quantify, but through exegetical analysis, through utilizing hermeneutics such as imperial biblical criticism and post-colonialism uh, and feminism and the variety of different um, marginal uh, uh, hermeneutics of the margins that have ar arisen over the past 50 years, we can really see the ways in which texts do lend rhetorical or ideological support to imperial systems of domination. And we can also see too the ways in which texts that may have appeared apolitical actually are very radical in their affirmation of uh, differing political alternatives and orientations and different ways of structuring communities, etc. Uh, you know, I, I think the work of individuals like Richard Horsley and Neil Elliott, who have been very influential in my writing, who I, especially with Horsley, who I quote several times in that work, definitely have shown the ways in which we can read the New Testament with a focus on how it reflects or counters or supports Rome and empire more generally. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I know I said that was the last question, but surprise, we have had a couple more. I love uh, questions. And we have we still have a couple of minutes before we're supposed to move on so we can we can have a go at them. Um, what dates would you give to Ephesians before or after the temple destruction? Now, see, that is extremely difficult. Uh, and contentious. I know that there are some who quote who 
discuss it before the temple? I think probably not. I think Ephesians most likely written towards the end of the first century. Um, now, how that impacts the letter and how that impacts its orientation, it's very well possible that Ephesians written in light of the temple's destruction wants to cool down on some of the more radical elements of Paul and some of those elements that I do believe led to his martyrdom. But I, I think regardless of when it was written, the arguments that I outlined in the paper still apply. They, I think that I think they're they're flexible enough to apply to whatever kind of context it was written in with regards to the early Jesus movement's relationship and Judaism's relationship to the Roman Empire. Thank you. Um, and can we compare the theology of Irenaeus and Ephesians? Can we compare the uh, theology of Irenaeus and Ephesians? I I am not as familiar with Ephesians as I would like to be, but Ephesians. Uh, excuse me, uh, Irenaeus. I, 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 if I remember correctly, does quote Ephesians and uh, seems to utilize it within his against heresies. So I, I think definitely that um, the early apostolic and early patristic writers pretty unanimously ascribed Ephesians to Paul and would have had that letter very much influence their theology. Uh, so, so I, 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 I wish I knew a bit more about Irenaeus to speak to speak on that question. Lovely, thank you very much, um, Jackson. We, I think, everybody greatly enjoyed your presentation. Right. Um, so we will be moving on to our next presenter. Um, we have Dr. Aaron Higashi. Just... Hello. Hello, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? Yes, very well. Thank you. Uh, I'll just give a, a brief introduction, and then uh, we can get going on your presentation. Um, Aaron Higashi is currently an adjunct faculty member at the College of Theology at Grand Canyon University. He studied philosophy in undergrad and took an interest in the relationship between ethics and biblical interpretation. He recently completed his PhD in the Bible, Culture and Hermeneutics program at Chicago Theological Seminary, where he focused on Persian period texts of the Hebrew Bible, the interpretive method of ideological criticism, and the theology and ethics of womanist thinkers. His wife is a pediatrician, and he, and he has three young daughters. He is in an interfaith marriage and has worked in religious education in both Christian and Jewish contexts, in addition to his university teaching. He's currently looking to adapt his dissertation on the intermarriage crisis of Ezra 10 for publication in the form of a book and several articles. He also enjoys fiction writing, jujitsu, and spending time with his very busy family. The title of his paper is Everyday Resistance in Ezra 10. So Aaron, please take it away. Oh, thank you. Uh, allow me to share my screen here so that I can uh, bring up this PowerPoint. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to share some things that I've been working on and thinking about for some time now. Um, let, me, let me begin by saying, I think this is a rather dramatic and sorrowful episode that I'm gonna be talking about today in the biblical book of Ezra. Um, in my mind, it has interesting implications for the way that we think about the relationship between leaders and those they presume to lead in at least one small part of the ancient world. So allow me to set the scene for you here. Uh, the year is 458 BCE, and Ezra, a scribe in what is then, uh, uh, what is, who is knowledgeable in what was then the Hebrew Bible, travels from the heart of the Persian Empire to the province of Judea, where he quickly dispenses with some administrative duties that he's been assigned and then goes about instructing this newly formed Second Temple community in the text of his trade. Uh, several months later, a group of unnamed leaders approach Ezra and tell him that they and many other people in the Second Temple community are guilty of ethnic intermarriage with a vaguely designated peoples of the lands. Ezra mourns this discovery and then launches into this prayer of confession where he articulates that the intermarriage crisis constitutes an existential threat to the Jewish people's covenantal relationship with Yahweh and thereby to their continued existence in the province of Judea. Ezra is encouraged to take decisive action to rectify this crisis and for the people of Judea to re rededicate themselves to Yahweh. And he does exactly this. Uh, Ezra summons all the people throughout the wider region to the temple courtyard under threat of property confiscation and expulsion from the community. Uh, once the people are gathered together in a large assembly, Ezra announces that all the men of the assembly who have, get, who have married foreign women must divorce these women and send them and any children they have had by them away to fates unknown. 
The assembly responds to Ezra's divorce imperative over the course of four verses, chapter 10, verses 12 through 15. And then the remainder of the chapter lists more than 100 men who are guilty of this ethnic intermarriage. And as a result, who probably do exactly what Ezra has demanded that they do and send away these wives and children. Uh, this is, so far as I know, the only narrated example of divorce in the entire Hebrew Bible, and it is a forced mass divorce imposed by a community's leader on those whom they presume to lead. Uh, what is both curious and surprising about this event, though, is its outcome. First, for a problem that's supposed to constitute an existential threat to the community and that is supposed to require immediate and unprecedented action to remedy, the fact that there are only 100 men involved is somewhat odd given that the population of the Second Temple community um, uh, at the time is probably close to 100,000, that would mean that there's only 0.1% of the population who are among the men that are guilty of this offense. That doesn't seem like a systemic or even prevalent issue. Indeed, the list of guilty offenders presented in Ezra chapter 10 is so small that it has led some scholars to speculate that the list is incomplete in its present form and, is, and was originally much longer. Further, given that a significant percentage of the names on the list of guilty offenders are from priestly families, it would seem that this problem, to the extent that it is a problem, is a problem among those people who came up with the idea that it was a problem to begin with. And as a result of the assembly of rural people who are threatened to gather and submit to this divorce imperative is almost beside the point. It seems like the priests could have just handled this in-house among themselves and left out these coercive diverse divorces of rural peoples. Therefore, a question that we might ask is what happened between the beginning of Ezra chapter 10, where Ezra was encouraged to take drastic action against an existential threat, and the end of Ezra chapter 10, which reports this rather anemic result. We might wonder whether Ezra and his supporters overestimated the nature and scope of the intermarriage crisis and only realized this after the fact. But it seems like if Ezra and his supporters had a growing awareness of the true nature and scope of the crisis as it was resolved, and it was resolving in a way that they didn't like, they would have simply altered the process to bring about a more favorable result. Consequently, we need an alternative explanation where Ezra and his supporters are not the primary cause of the underwhelming result, and where even if they do, even if they do they become aware of the crisis's true scope in the midst of its resolution, they're not in a position to change the result. And that alternative explanation that I hope to provide is that it's not that Ezra and his supporters overestimated the nature and scope of the crisis. No, they probably got it right. Rather, I want to argue that the assembly Ezra forced to gather and submit to these mass divorces actually resisted Ezra in ways that are so subtle that neither Ezra nor generations of interpreters after him noticed. Now, if we're gonna argue something like this, we need a method specifically designed for detecting the subtle exercise of agency and marginalized group like the assembly in Ezra 10. Fortunately, such a method has already been proposed and described in some detail by biblical scholar Gail Yee. Yee's method combines tools from ideological criticism and insights from black feminist thought to help nuance our conception of marginalization, but the heart of the method employs the work of cultural anthropologist, James Scott. Scott spent years in Northwest Malaysia studying the lives of farmers during a transformational period in their economic base when technological innovations and new agricultural practices were imposed on these farmers from outside sources, uh, often resulting in increased unemployment, poverty, and suffering. Scott observed that the farmers did not passively accept these changes, but neither did their actions ever rise to the level of conventional rebellion. In an effort to describe what he observed, Scott posited a conceptual distinction between what he called traditional resistance and what he called everyday resistance. Traditional resistance is resistance that is hierarchically organized. It's frequently militaristic and violent. It's aimed at achieving systemic change and collective goals. Everyday resistance is the opposite of all these things. Uh, it's often unnoticed, decentralized, and deorganized. It's nonviolent usually, and it's aimed at achieving temporary relief, relief from exploitation for individuals rather than collectives. Traditional resistance is the kind of resistance that shows up in the official documentation and histories of superordinate classes and also the kind of resistance that tends to, unfortunately, be summarily crushed by those same superordinate classes. Everyday resistance is less likely to be crushed by contrast, both because it's more difficult for superordinate classes to perceive and then to record it happening, but also because there's no real group to crush even when it is perceived. Scott then goes on to distinguish between two types of everyday resistance, which he calls routine resistance and symbolic resistance. 
Routine resistance targets the material resources of a superordinate class and their ability to enforce exploitative practices on subordinate groups. Examples of routine resistance include foot dragging, taking longer to do than what you're told to do, uh, false compliance, not actually doing what you're told to do, feigned ignorance, pretending like you don't understand, and petty theft and sabotage. Symbolic resistance targets the ideological resources of a superordinate class and their ability to enforce a coherent worldview that justifies their exploitation of subordinate groups. Uh, examples of symbolic resistance include slander, rumors, ideological dissimulation, and the maintenance of a hidden transcript, which is basically an alternative story of the people's history that is invisible to those who are oppressing them. Uh, I think there are several examples of this everyday resistance in the assembly's response to Ezra in chapter 10, verses 12 through 15. And I think that these instances of everyday resistance are ultimately what caused the underwhelming result of Ezra's mass divorce. That is to say, I think Ezra and his supporters believed there were and then aimed to eliminate potentially thousands of ethnic intermarriages. But because of the assembly's everyday resistance, the end result was drastically smaller and also concentrated around the very priests who demanded the divorce to, to begin with. So let me describe for you three instances of everyday resistance in the assembly's response. Number one, foot dragging. First, <clears throat> after Ezra announces that the men of the assembly must divorce their wives, uh, and the assembly initially responds with what seems like an affirmation. They say in chapter 10, verse 12, we must do as you have said, but, and as you know, anything that comes before a but doesn't really matter, but the people are many and it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this a task for one day or for two, for many of us have transgressed in this manner. The assembly uses the weather and the ostensible severity of their own transgression as an excuse to change the mass divorce from a single decisive event to one that will take place over a long and drawn out process. Indeed, in verse 17, we learn that it took three months for these marriages to be investigated and for the divorces to be enacted. This lengthy process recommended by the assembly contrasts sharply with the encouragement to act decisively that Ezra's received at the beginning of the chapter and Ezra's own demand that the assembly enact these divorces now. Uh, one can only imagine that as the sheer weight of time and months of winter weather bore down on the people involved in this process, that the original conviction which inspired their divorces would begin to lose its momentum, likely resulting in significantly fewer divorces than if they had all been enacted immediately and or over a shorter period of time. The assembly also exhibits foot dragging in another way. After noting that the weather, after noting the weather and the severity of their transgression, the assembly also recommends what might seem like a helpful and efficient act of delegation. In verse 15, the assembly says that they will send elders and judges from their own villages to represent themselves and to aid in arbitrating these divorces. Ezra and his supporters might have been happy for the assistance, but this means that there is no longer just Ezra and his supporters deciding what, what does and what does not constitute an illicit intermarriage, but also people whose ideologies of ethnicity and identity are probably closer to the assemblies than they are to the priestly class of the second temple complex. These elders and judges may have been able to secure results in months of deliberations that are more favorable to the assembly. Regardless, it would involve more cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, and as Joseph Blankensab has pointed out, the most common way of shelving a proposal is to send it to committee. The assembly sends it to committee, uh, decreasing its ultimate efficiency rather than increasing it. Number two, false compliance. A second potential example of everyday resistance utilized by the assembly in Ezra 10 is false compliance. In verse 15, after telling Ezra that they will send elders and judges to assist in the process of the divorces, the assembly says that they will cooperate in the process until, quote, the fierce wrath of God on this account is averted from us. Now, doing something until Yahweh isn't mad anymore simply isn't the same thing as doing something until it's done. This allows for the possibility that the assembly will cooperate, but only to a point. And what would that point be? How does the assembly or Ezra or literally anyone else know when Yahweh isn't angry anymore? I will recommend a potentially subversive answer to this question, and I think it's implied in the weather that the assembly previously mentioned. So let me back up for just a moment. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 1, where the unnamed leaders first brought the intermarriage crisis to Ezra's attention, the unnamed leaders said that the peoples of the land that they had intermarried with had practices comparable to those of ethnic outsiders from Israel's past, namely the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and 
Amorites. That list of prescribed ethnic groups combines groups from several previous lists in the Pentateuch with whom the people of Israel were not to intermarry. and includes several groups that are unique to Deuteronomy, indicating that the theology of Deuteronomy greatly influenced these unnamed leaders' conception of this crisis. One example of this list of prescribed ethnic groups can be found in Deuteronomy 7. In verses 3 and 4, after listing seven such groups that the people of Israel are not supposed to intermarry with, the text goes on to say that if they do intermarry with them, they will turn to idolatry and Yahweh's anger will burn against them, the same kind of language. Four chapters later, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17, we get some additional information about what Yahweh's anger might actually look like in practice. Allow me to very quickly read the verses in full. This is Moses speaking uh, uh, about Yahweh's commands. He says, if you will only heed his every commandment that I'm commanding you today, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and with all your soul, then he will give you rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, and you will gather in your grain and your wine and your oil, and you will give and you will have grass in your field for your livestock, and you will eat your fill. Take care, or you will be subdued into turning away, serving other gods and worshiping them. For then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. He will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will not yield its produce. Then you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving to you. These verses indicate that the meteorological status of the land, the weather, and the covenantal status of the people directly correspond to one another, and at least the theology here in Deuteronomy that influenced this unnamed leader's conception of the crisis. If the people intermarry with prescribed ethnic groups, then they have not kept Yahweh's commands. Yahweh will be angry and there will be no rain. But in Ezra chapter 10, there is rain. And if there is rain, then Yahweh can't be angry. And if Yahweh can't be angry, then the people could not have intermarried with prescribed ethnic groups and broken Yahweh's commands. To put it even more simply, if there is rain, then Yahweh's anger must already have been averted and the assembly is no longer under any obligation to cooperate in the process of mass divorce. When the assembly says that they will cooperate until Yahweh's anger is averted, they are saying they will not actually cooperate at all. This is false compliance. Number three, ideological dissimilarity. Third and finally, another example of everyday resistance the assembly makes use of is ideological dissimilarity. Scott mentions that one of the basic tests of whether or not a subordinate class has been mystified by the ideology of a subordinate class is whether or not the subordinate class is enslaved on the level of ideas and thereby articulates their socioeconomic situation in the same language as those who are oppressing them. To express ideological dissimilation is to demonstrate variance of ideas by expressing variance of Basically, does the assembly agree with Ezra's characterization of the intermarriage crisis or not? And I think the answer to that question is no, for the simple reason that when the assembly says they will cooperate until the anger of God has been averted, they explicitly say the anger of our God. The danger of ethnic intermarriage is consistently presented in the Pentateuch and the following Deuteronomistic history as the danger of adopting foreign religious practices via marriage, committing idolatry, and thereby violating the people of Israel's covenantal relationship with, Yah with Yahweh, which demands that Yahweh alone is worshipped. When the unnamed leaders compare the practices of the peoples of the land to the practices of these old ethnic outsiders, is the fear that uh, it is a fear of idolatry and covenant violation that they are invoking. Does the assembly agree that whatever intermarriages they are involved in have led to idolatry? No, because they uniformly confess that Yahweh is their God. And that confession has always been one of, if not the defining ethnic differences between Israel and its neighbors. This is why in Deuteronomy 26, when the people of Israel swear their yearly oaths of citizenship, it is an, it is an oath to adopt a story as one's own, namely the story of the Exodus and Sinai experience. If the people of the assembly have adopted this story as their story and thereby this God Yahweh as their God, then there's no evidence of idolatry. Whatever else might be happening in the assembly's marriages, this simple confession seems to preclude the possibility that there is idolatry and therefore that there is an active existential threat to the second temple community. The assembly disagrees with Ezra and his supporters and, thereby ideal, and is thereby ideologically dissimilar from them. As a result, the assembly is less likely to uncritically adopt Ezra's worldview, which justifies the assembly's marginalization and much more likely to resist that worldview and its exertions of power by whatever means is available to them. In conclusion, I think the best explanation for the unexpected result of Ezra's mass divorce is not a failure in leadership, 
but rather the subtle everyday resistance of the assembly. The assembly employed in Scott's language, the weapons of the weak, foot dragging, false compliance and ideological dissimulation to attack and to wear down the material and ideological resources of the priestly classes that imposed an exploitative burden on them. And in so doing, they have reduced the ultimate effectiveness of that burden and even managed to reflect a significant percentage of its force back on those who had imposed it. I further think that James Scott's concept of everyday resistance can be a fruitful way of examining otherwise unnoticed agency of marginalized groups throughout the ancient world. Uh, and I do think, and I do not think that any analysis of the relationship between leaders and those they presume to lead or about who has power in these relationships will ever be complete without considering the possibility of this everyday resistance. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gashi. That was very, very interesting. And um, when I was in grad school, my area of specialization was uh, uh, royal inscriptions from Mesopotamia. So the idea of, of power dynamics between rulers and uh, or those in power and those uh, being subjugated is is near and dear to my heart and sure. also as a parent the idea of uh the foot dragging form of resistance is something i am intensely familiar with as i am sure you are um can you <laughs> think of like, <laughs> oh it's their masters my four-year-old in particular is just oh. Oh, perfect perfect yes. um can you think of like any like and this is very much off the top of your head so uh no problems at all if, if it's it's not something you can speak on can you think of any other um events either in the Hebrew Bible or in uh, history in general where you think that this uh, form of resistance could be uh, usefully looked at? Um, if we're talking about history in general, I mean, Scott himself raises the example of African-American slaves and, and gives several examples of ideological dissimulation and foot dragging and false compliance uh, in records of um, slaves in, in, in uh, sort of pre-antebellum South. Uh, so I think I think that would be a very easy place to sort of apply the same method. As far as places in the Hebrew Bible are concerned, I have <laughs> part of the problem is that you need you need not only an instance in which you have a subordinate class uh, subjected to a superordinate class, but you also need some evidence that they are engaging in foot dragging, and that's hard to come by, precisely because so often it is hidden from the relatively elite scribal classes that are putting these stories together. So I think this is probably one of the few instances in the Hebrew Bible where you get a very clear look at that. Um, but I am certainly open to the possibility and will continue to look <laughs> for other examples in which you can make this case uh, so that I can write some articles and books about it. <laughs> but I'm sure there are, you, I would just need to look some more for it. Well, thank you uh, very much. We actually do not have any questions from you from the audience. Okay. Um, we have a couple of minutes. Is there anything that you wanted to elaborate on and didn't have time for in the presentation? Um, one of the most interesting ways that this uh, sort of concept is being applied today, there's a, a womanist author named Cheryl Anderson, uh, who has applied this same story and sort of a subversive reading of the same story for thinking about um, uh, sort of segregation and racial intermarriage uh, in, uh, in the 20th century. And so I, I think these continue to be in some ways uh, hot button issues. Uh, as the lines between communities and uh, what sort of agency do marginalized communities, can they take, is justified for them to take, is expected for them to take in the face of um, this kind of power bearing down on them and disrupting their relations. Uh, so I think there's a lot here that, that could very well be applicable to people in religious communities today uh, to sort of think about. Um, and I don't think it would take too much work to sort of uh, to, to, to flesh that out. So I think it has a lot of value. It's it's not just a conversation constrained to something that happened 2,500 years ago. Thank you very much. And we do have uh, one question just for clarification. You mentioned um, a couple of authors, I believe, um, a little bit earlier on, and we're asked we're being asked for um, the full names that that you you shared. Uh, the cultural anthropologist who wrote the book is James Scott. Uh, the name of his book is uh, Weapons of the Weak. Um, that's that's the cultural anthropologist that this that these distinctions between everyday and traditional resistance uh, come from. Uh, he's written several other books, um, and biblical scholars have sometimes gotten their hands on them. But I think he's an underappreciated figure. There's also Gail Yi. Uh, she was just recently, I think, a couple of years ago, president of the Society of Biblical Literature, um, and she was the one who authored the article that originally sort of recommended uh, James Scott's 
work as a method for biblical scholars to uh, get at the agency of marginalized groups. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. um, uh, that is actually all we have. So, uh, Dr. Higashi, thank you again for well, thank a you very, very much. interesting and engaging presentation. Um, this is the end of uh, the current session. We are going to have a special session starting at 1 p.m. So we'll just uh, wait for the moderator. Until then, I'll put our little holding screen up. So again, stand up, stretch your legs, get a cup of water, and we'll be back at 1 p.m.
Okay, we are at one minute to one, so we can get going with our next session, which is going to be moderated uh, by Glenn J. Corbett, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Biblical Archaeology Review magazine and a specialist in the archaeology of the lands of the Bible, with more than two decades of excavation and field experience working on projects in Jordan, Turkey, and Israel. Prior to joining Barr, Glenn was Associate Director of the American Center of Research in Amman, Jordan, where he directed the award-winning Temple of the Winged Lions project in Petra. In addition, while working as Program Director for the Council of American Overseas Research research centers. He spearheaded efforts to help preserve threatened archaeological sites and museums in Yemen and other countries ravaged by conflict. So I will hand over to Glenn for this special session workshop on publishing forums. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Megan. And it looks like we, we already have quite a number of participants for this special workshop. Um, so no, it's really a pleasure to moderate this session uh, workshop on publishing platforms, which is really geared towards independent scholars and researchers who would like to learn more about publishing venues and platforms that are out there for folks who might wanna publish their research, maybe even outside a traditional journal or book publication, other platforms that might, might be out there that you might be interested in. So we're very fortunate that SASA has brought together uh, representatives from five different uh, publishers, organizations, platforms that you might be interested in. And during our session today, you'll hear from each of them what their organizations are about, the types of things that they publish, and each of them will tell you a bit more about the publishing process, the editorial process, um, and, and ultimately how, if, if you want to get your work published with them, how you go about doing it. Um, so this should be an excellent uh, hour and a half. I'm really looking forward to it. The way we've set it up is each uh, presenter will give a very brief presentation, and each one will follow after the other. Hopefully at the end, we'll have about a half hour, hopefully a little more to take audience questions. And you can either use that when we get um, to that time, you can either raise your, your Zoom hand to, to ask questions with your, your mic and your video, or you can use that Zoom Q&A function as well to ask your questions. Um, but yeah, other than that, I would just ask that, especially for those attending, if you could just keep your mic and your camera off during the presentations, that'll just facilitate um the the short presentations we have and then um yeah the q a will have everybody sort of chime in to uh to discuss and ask questions uh so with that and as you see we're already up to well over 20 participants so that's great so i'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker for today I'm just getting out my bio screen here our first speaker will be Stephanie Budin, who is the editor of Near Eastern Archaeology, a journal of the American Society of Overseas Research, or ASOR. She is an ancient historian who focuses on gender, religion, sexuality, and iconography in ancient Greece and the Near East. Her published works include several titles, including Free Women, Patriarchal Authority, and the Accusation of Prostitution, published in 2021, Women in Antiquity, Real Women Across the Ancient World, published in 2016, and Artemis, published in 2015. She's also written numerous articles on ancient religion, gender and iconography, and including most recently a blog post that she wrote for our, our website as well, which was really great. Uh, she has also lectured widely in North America, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. So with that, Stephanie, I'll turn the Zoom audience over to you. Hi, all. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Excellent. Always checking. Okay, hi. Uh, as Glenn was kind enough to point out, I am the editor of Near Eastern Archaeology, which is the more popular print publication of ASOR, the American Society of Overseas Research. Uh, meaning that uh, contrary to BASOR, the more formal and larger publication, we do shorter articles, uh, generally with uh, much glossier pictures. So it ranges from armchair archaeologists, as you might call them, all the way up to very hardcore archaeologists in the field and back again. So that is the range that we're generally looking at. So I was asked to talk a little bit about getting published in journals and uh, that sort of thing. So I'm going to start off with 
one statement, and I'm going to end again, if I remember, with the same statement. So making certain that I get this out very clearly to begin with. In modern times, and definitely with NEA, and this is now the standard practice throughout journals, academic journals, uh, peer review is normal, all right? So all articles have to be reviewed with NEA. It has to be at least two peer reviewers. Some article uh, journals will have maybe up to three. Two is normal. And the normal practice nowadays is to have what's known as double blind peer review. What this means is the author has no idea who the peer reviewers are and the peer reviewers have no idea who the author is. Now, the reason that I am saying this is there was concern the, uh, from people about, well, what happens if you want to publish and you're not in a standard academic path, you don't have tenure, you're not working with the university. And what I'm here to tell you is when your article is going through peer review, no one knows or cares. Who you are is completely irrelevant because it is anonymous. Articles are judged exclusively based on their content. Nothing is known about the authors themselves. So if that is something that holds you back or makes you nervous, allow me to assure you, no one knows or cares who you are when they are reading your manuscript. All they really care about is what you're saying, are you saying it well, and am I personally in your bibliography? Probably not in that order, but trust me, those are the three main ideas that are going through these people's minds. So don't worry about yourself and where you are in your career. Always and only focus on the quality of your writing. Okay, so like I said, that's where I'm starting, and I'm hopefully going to end with that if I remember as well, because um, I, I tend to babble an awful lot, and I forgot to keep track of how long I'm talking, so somebody will probably tell me to shut up at some convenient point. All right, so that said, there are a few other things I wanted to mention about publishing. All right, after that first bit about the peer review and the anonymity is the fact that once you write your article and write a good article, write a focused article, have something to say in your article, uh, always you know, make good use of your primary sources, all the stuff that you probably remember from whatever writing workshops or that sort of thing you have ever done, write a good article that really says something meaningful. Once you have done that, you're trying to find a place to publish it look at descriptions of what different journals do. You wanna make certain that you are in the appropriate time phase. Uh, Near Eastern archeology span goes up to the uh, late middle ages by which we mean our cutoff point is the rise of Islam. So don't send me something about 17th century architecture. All right, it's already out of our field. Uh, make certain the geography is right, the time is right. And this is really important folks. So write it down if you're taking notes, make certain your word count is right. All right, if you read that a journal accepts manuscripts up to no more than 5,000 words, don't send them a 10,000 word manuscript. They're just going to reject it. So really pay attention to those things. So always look for the guidelines for authors, the instructions for authors. There's going to be something like that on any URL, any web page for any journal and see if it is appropriate for the article you have written. So that is really the first and most important thing to look at there when you're deciding where to submit an article. If they tell you you need a certain number of images, they need to be color, they need to be black and white, take all of that into consideration as well. This is really going to make things so much easier for the editor when deciding whether or not even to continue processing your article, well, excuse me, your manuscript for submission. Because uh, keep in mind also that we have to ask people to do peer review. This is a favor they are doing for us. People don't get compensated for peer review, at least not normally in academia. This is a favor and we don't want to stress their patients or abuse them in any way. So if I look at an article and I say, yeah, this is never gonna get through peer review. I don't even bother sending it out because I don't wanna waste the time, patients or good resources or goodwill of our potential pool of reviewers. So keep all of that in mind. So make certain your article fits. That's point number one. Point number two, now this is very specific to archeology, span but I figure that's why he asked me to come in because that's what I'm doing here and it's the ancient world. So if you do literature, this isn't as important, but if you do archeology, span this really is. This is the only time that 
who you are actually matters because there are protocols involved with who gets to publish what when it comes to excavations and artifacts that come from excavations. Control of an excavation, including its publication, is reserved exclusively for the head of the excavation team. It is that person or really that group of people who decide when and what and how to publish a site. And until that group of individuals publishes the site and all of the artifacts that have been found, you don't get to. No matter how much you want to and no matter how long it takes to happen, this is simply one of the rules of academic archaeological publication. So you went out to watch the dig at a Telbite near some this summer, and it was really exciting. And you took a whole bunch of photographs, and you now want to write an article about the cool stuff that they found this year before the actual head of the dig does. You don't get to do that. And if you try to do that, your manuscript will be rejected automatically. So please keep that in mind. And I know how frustrating it can be. Um, I work a lot in classical archaeology as well. And there are some folks over there in Greece who excavated a site 20 years ago and they never published it. So no one gets to write anything about that particular dig. It's frustrating. There is a museum in Thermos in Greece where not a single one of the objects has ever been formally published. So you're not allowed to take any pictures in the museum. You're not allowed to draw sketches of the objects in the museum because of this. So keep that in mind. That is the only time when who you are and what you have access to becomes really relevant. Um, when it comes to objects, if it goes into a museum and still has not been published, you still don't get to publish that, um, that object. The Aditio Princeps, as it, is, as it is called, the first publication of an object, is reserved for an individual. You need permission to do that. Now, once things get published, go for it. Uh, have lots of fun with it, write your article, but keep in mind that that is a very important bit of protocol and your editors and peer reviewers are going to be very severe about it. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, at least for archaeology and art history. Uh, really, really avoid things that have been looted and do not have proper provenience. That's going to be topic number three in your list here. Again, this is relevant for historians and archaeologists, but so many things have shown up on uh, black markets, wound up in a museum potentially through uncertain circumstances. And Academia really frowns upon giving any attention whatsoever to objects that have come to light this way. So if you do not know that this object specifically came from an academic excavation has been published properly and is in the appropriate museum in the appropriate way, be very leery of it. And the sad thing is that there are certain museums that don't always have the best track record with the provenience of their objects. So <clears throat> the Getty Museum, perhaps, I'm sure some of you might have heard about this, that every couple of years there's a new object that they have to repatriate or they have to explain how they wound up with. Uh, so be very cautious with the history of your objects, even if you know that they've been published, if the provenience, if the origin is questionable, really give it a good birth, unless you are specifically writing about this problem in archaeology, art history, and publication. So that's just a bit of advice of things you want to say, stay away from. All right. Since this comes up very frequently, uh, images, that little part where I'm saying how many images do you need and photographs, this is always really difficult, especially with the rise of wiki commons. So do I have to get the uh, museum's permission to use this image, do I not? Uh, people at my end and our lawyers are still trying to deal with all of this. So really quick words of advice here. It's the difference between 2D and 3D images. If it is flat, like a painting, you really, really need the museum's um, permission to use it. If it is 3D, like a sculpture or a figurine, the individual photographers have some choice as to what angle they wanted to use in this way or that way. And I, I want to see if I can get the light a certain way. At that point, it's an individual work of art on the part of the photographer. And the photographer can claim the copyright for the image 
and granted to you via Wiki Commons. So when looking to illustrate your articles, like I said, anything 3D on Wiki Commons, you're probably gonna be fine. Anything 2D, it's probably gonna be more problematic. So those are the bits of advice that I can give you when it comes to submitting a manuscript and giving its best chance of getting published with little problem. And I'm going to end, as I said, I was going to end with remember that ultimately it's peer review and it is double blind and no one knows who you are, who wrote it until it comes out. So don't worry about who you are. Always just focus on writing a good article. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and an excellent overview of some very key points. Um, I also especially like the, the, the reference you made to images. I know at, at Bar and Bible History Daily, we're constantly sort of questioning our image use and what's appropriate, what's not. And so thank you very much for bringing that up. So we'll quickly move on to our next uh, two presenters from New Classicists. We have two editors, uh, Jordan Houston and Giuseppe Picacelli. Uh, Jordan is chief editor at New Classicist. His work reconstructs the financial aspects of the organization of Roman entertainment uh, between the first century and the third century AD through various techniques, in particular comparative studies and globalization. Uh, Giuseppe is also chief editor at New Classicist. He is currently a PhD candidate in classics at the Institute of Classical Studies at the University of London. His research examines the economic history of Roman aristocratic wealth from the third to first centuries BCE and how it influenced the political process. So with that, Giuseppe and Jordan, I will hand it over to you guys to arrange your presentation as you like. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, all righty, let me pull up these slides real quick. Okay, so yeah, as, um, as Glenn mentioned there, I am one of the editors in chief at New Classes. I represent the uh, the early career side of things, and Giuseppe Joey, who is also in the audience today, and I'm sure he'll chime up once we get to our Q&A session, um, represents our postgraduate side um, as an active PhD student himself. So who are we? Uh, New Classics is a double-blind peer-reviewed academic journal that's run by postgraduates and early career researchers. Um, and really, what we what we set out to do is to highlight this exciting new research that's coming from postgraduates and early career researchers. We kind of define that as five years post the PhD. Um, and we kind of want to be the safe educational space uh, for what most of our um, authors are first time publishers. So we really do go through a lot of uh, process on helping you get your article to a point where we we think it's going to have the best possible chance in the peer review um, process and uh, yeah and and that you know you kind of learn what is acceptable what is what isn't acceptable and and how to really efficiently publish an article in pretty much every other peer review journal out there um, we don't only publish Greco-Roman and Egyptian stuff. Uh, and while that is our uh, bread and butter and, and a lot of our articles do relate to that area, we do also have articles to ancient India, ancient China, and, and really we kind of accept anything archeological, literary, uh, artistic, anything like that. Um, as long as it refers to the ancient world, we're happy to take it on. So how do we work? Essentially, the author sends in their initial draft to our submissions coordinator. They will go through the draft and give give you any initial feedback. And really the purpose of this step is just to make sure that your publication covers as much of the basic points and that we know that once it goes out for peer review, it's not going to get kind of shredded to pieces because of some really obvious mistakes or, or typos, grammars, that's grammatical mistakes, those sort of things. Um, and this will kind of go back and forth as much as it needs to until our submissions coordinator um, believes that it's up to a, a up to snuff, essentially. Uh, once they're happy with that, that'll be assigned on to an editor who oversees the double blind peer review process. As Stephanie mentioned before, it's completely anonymous. So all your name doesn't go out to them and their names don't go to you. 
Um, it's really just about the content of the article and, and the validity of the, of the discussion. <clears throat> once the, uh, so once the article has been assigned to an editor, this will go out to, uh, they will then secure two peer reviewers. We usually are looking for established academics who have a, a good history of publication. Um, <clears throat> and the people that are not only going to know the, the topic very well, but also going to know sort of what, what the other scholarship in this area is saying and, and what a good article for your topic should look like. Um, this, this process can take about eight to 10 weeks. So this is a very lengthy process. So you can't expect to uh, send it in at the, uh, at the last minute and get it published in the next, in the next month or so. It does take time. We do about two, uh, two issues a year, and we have uh, submission deadlines, dead deadlines that are about six months apart, just to, um, just to accommodate this. Um, and then once both editors have submitted their feedback, the author will be sent a copy of both, both feedback forms that we get. Once again, completely anonymous, no names, anything like that. And um, you'll be asked to resubmit your article according to that feedback. And you get given about a month, a month and a half of this process. Um, once you've resubmitted, the editor will send the article for a second round of review to only one of the original reviewers. And this is really just to confirm the changes and to pick up any last minute corrections, anything that may be missed the first time, or if you've, uh, depending on your changes, if there's anything that just needs to be corrected or or fixed up on, on, your, on your amended copy. Um, once again, that's eight to 10 weeks. Doesn't usually take that long um, since it's really, like I said, just cleaning up. Um, <clears throat> once, that's, um, once that's been, that feedback has come back to us, that, that'll once again go out to you and you're given that month, month and a half to make those changes. And then after that, you're pretty much done. Once the final article has been received, we send it off to our proofs editor and then they prepare it for the final publication. And um, yeah, and you'll see it in our next issue. So what are some tips for getting reviewed or published? Uh, Stephanie covered a lot of the big points, honestly. Um, one of the big ones that we do uh, suggest is that you really, before you even submit, you go to your supervisor or even your mentor, um, for feedback about your article. They're usually more than happy to have a read of what's going on and they kind of know uh, where's the best place to publish or what's the best way to improve this paper and really get it to a point that it's, it's gonna really shine in, in, in publication. Another way of doing that is really reading similar articles around your topic and, and just getting a feel for what the writing level or the, or the discussion level is. Um, and, and that's really what we're expecting. We, we do get a lot of submissions that almost feel like essays um, rather than articles. And so we do, that's why we have that um, generous amount of assistance right on the front end, just to help you kind of get the feel of what an article should be, at least um, in that draft stage. But this isn't always the case for a lot of journals. You know, it, it is a long process and, um, we don't, not every journal can be expected to go through every single submission and, and kind of polish it up like that. So really it's, it's best practice to get your article as refined as possible before submission. And, um, and the big one when I was the submissions coordinator in New Classicist was, is, was really proofread, proofread, proofread. You can never edit something enough. It's, it's never going to be perfect. So you might as well get it in as good a shape as possible before it goes out. Uh, and then the final thing, and Stephanie touched on this as well, was writing according to the word limit. Um, if you've written a very small article, we, we accept articles up to 8,000 words. And if you've only used about 1,000 or 2,000 words of that word limit, um, make sure to use, use that word, the, that extra space. Um, <clears throat> you know, it can only improve your discussion uh, and, and help your argument. Uh, but don't make sure that you don't exceed it either. Uh, the reason why we do have it is so we don't get, you know, very long, lengthy articles and, um, and things that may stray from, from its original points. So it's kind of a fine balance there. Make sure to stay close to the limit. Don't feel that you have to write 8,000 words necessarily, but, um, but yeah, but don't go over either. Um, we will know. Uh, yeah, so those are all the sort of small tips that I have for now. Um, 
I suppose I'll pass it back to Glenn. Thank you, Jordan. Those are all very helpful tips. And I, I have to say, I was especially very much agree with your, uh, first of all, that at least, especially with Bar, a popular magazine, I often tell our authors it takes six to eight months usually before we sort of settle on a manuscript idea all the way to publication. So it takes a long time. And also definitely emphasizing the proofing aspect. The number of times we read and reread and reread what's submitted, it's an impressive amount. So um, definitely always proof your work thoroughly. Um, it will make the job of the editors that much easier. Uh, we'll go on to our third presentation now um, from Sapiens, the online magazine. Uh, we have Caridwin Cornelius, who is, is the Archaeology and Biological Anthropology Development Editor at Sapiens. She works with anthropologists trained in academic writing and helps them tell stories that are compelling, clear, and relevant to broad audiences. She's also a freelance journalist whose writing has appeared in Scientific American, The Atlantic, Medscape, Outside, The New York Times, and Sapiens. Uh, Caridwin. Just adjust. Can you hear me all right? Just fine, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you. It's been so interesting hearing the other speakers because the way Sapiens operates is so different. Um, so um, our mission at Sapiens is to bring anthropology to a broad audience. Of course, we have many archeologists, anthropologists of various sorts reading Sapiens, but, um, but our target audience is actually people who are not uh, academics or at least not in that specific field, um, but who are intelligent, curious, well-informed people um, who just are, are interested in, in knowing about this field. Um, so our articles are journalistic in style, meaning that we, again, we assume that people don't necessarily know anything about the subject. Um, and therefore, each article has to be, to be calculated to tell the reader immediately why this article is important, why it's relevant to them and their life, and essentially why they need to read it. And then basically every paragraph after that is calibrated to get readers to read the next paragraph. So we do that through compelling storytelling, evocative description, um, you know, interesting questions, thought-provoking comments, things like that. So it's just, it's very much geared toward getting people to, to be interested in the article being and, and keeping their attention because we all know that there's so many distractions um, on, on the web, especially. And so that's, that's kind of the focus. Our articles are not anywhere near as long as some of the other um, publications. So they can range from anywhere from about 800 to 2,800 words. Usually they're more like 1,500 is kind of where we like to keep it. Um, when you pitch us, we actually, it, you don't send the full article, um, unlike the other publications, you send, um, if you pitch through our website, um, sapiens.org, and you pitch a approximately 300 word um, pitch, which is just kind of saying like, here's the story. So you might just start with like, a, you know, an anecdote or a story or um, a sort of news peg um, or anything like that. And just kind of say, you know, just, just tell us in a very short period of time, Here's, here's what I want to write about essentially. And then we respond and might say, that sounds good, but could you start with, a, should we start with an anecdote about this? Or we really like this part. Well, and can you enhance that, this part? And that part we feel has been done a little bit too much. So, you know, when you turn in your draft, could you, you know, emphasize this and reduce that? Or, you know, we'll, we'll give you directions usually um, and, and, and how to submit it. And then at that point, you, you submit the article that's been kind of geared toward our, our discussion. So um, what are we looking for? Um, we, do, um, we don't do any breaking news because we actually work on a fairly slow you know, process. We're a small team and, and we put a lot of thought in, and we go over it many, many times. Oh, I should say there is no peer review process, but there is a, um, like a fact checking process and it does get looked at by multiple editors on extremely rare occasions if something is quite controversial we might run it past other experts in the field but that doesn't usually happen um so there there is no such uh, peer review um but so we don't do we don't do breaking news but we do um uh write about 
um, recent, you know, recent papers. So if you have a paper that's coming out or, you know, you've just been re researching something and you want to tell people about it, um, that's, that's fantastic. We certainly accept that. And what we usually are looking at for that is kind of the backstory. Are, are there, are there certain stories about your interactions with the people or the place or something that might bring something to light um, and and reveal something about the big picture that's going on or the effects of, of your research or how it's related to other research and how that is evolving the way we think about a certain issue. Just kind of maybe things that either wouldn't make it into a normal academic paper um, because maybe they're a personal story or something like that, um, then th we, you can expand on that as long as it's clear why, why that's relevant um, to people. And it's not inside baseball type thing. Um, so we also publish a lot of articles inspired by current events. So I'm working on one right now um, inspired by Roe v. Wade on the archaeology of personhood and um, abortion. Um, I mean, I'm editing it, the, the archaeologist pitched it. Um, and then we recently published something on the anthropology of smell uh, inspired by people losing their loss of, the, losing their sense of smell because of COVID. So, um, you know, we, if something's happening in the Ukraine or something, you know, we'll, we'll, we could publish articles on that. And it doesn't necessarily, like, you don't have to have necessarily a new paper about that or new research about that, you know. It, it could just be like, I've studied this in the past, and here's the insight I can bring to this current issue based on all my uh, previous knowledge and previous research in this particular area. Um, so if some issue comes out in, I don't know, Jordan, if something, something's happening there and, you know, you can say like, I've researched this area and I, yeah, I can bring, you know, um, illuminate some, some aspects of this issue. Um, then we're all about that too. So um, what uh, we also do um, commentary and op-eds, um, which kind of exist on a spectrum. So um, I assigned one recently, um, uh, after the um, English heritage projected the image of the queen onto Stonehenge, um, there were some archeologists that were in, in a bit of an uproar about it. And so I commissioned an article basically um, talking about uh, how images, uh, ideas of nationalism have been projected onto Stonehenge. Um, so that could be something like that. Um, and then, um, Oh, I just I just published one on um, Neanderthal art. Neanderthals get a bad rap, and 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 new evidence comes out all the time showing that perhaps maybe they actually did art and were more advanced than we think. And so this person is essentially this this archaeologist is essentially um, defending Neanderthals and saying like, yes, this is art. Um, so um, that kind of op-ed. Um, we also do book excerpts. Um, but only if the book is geared toward a popular audience. If the book is geared toward an academic audience, then we wouldn't publish an excerpt of it. However, there may be an opportunity to do a, um, a spin-off essay inspired by it. Um, and sometimes we actually do both. Sometimes we'll publish an excerpt and then we'll publish um, an, an op-ed uh, aside it. So um, for example, um, uh, Kara Cooney, uh, an Egyptologist, um, had a book called The Good Kings Come Out. And um, so we, we published an excerpt of that book. And then she did um, an op-ed alongside it, um, talking about the sort of angry reaction she's gotten um, uh, from the patriarchy about in response to, to that, that book coming out. Um, and we also do personal essays. Um, I'm, I'm working on uh, one right now. Um, it's a beautiful essay from an archeologist whose father died and she excavated his uh, study and at exactly the way an archeologist would excavate something and she labeled everything and put everything on a grid and had a, had a blueprint, like she used all those principles in order to find out things that she didn't understand about her father. And it was just a wonderful way to explain how archeology span works to people who don't know how it is, but in a, in a really emotionally moving way. Um, we also do photo essays um, and even poetry. Um, and, and in terms of the photos, um, we do welcome submissions of photos from people, but typically we actually find the photos ourselves. So it, it, it goes both ways um, with us. Um, let me see, pitching, I think. Um, 
I think I'll leave it there. I think that's probably probably good. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. And that's you know, it sounds like Sapiens covers a lot of material, especially for you know making the worlds of archaeology and anthropology available available to a popular audience. And so it sounds wonderful all of the different ways y'all are able to explore that with your authors. And I'm sure we'll have questions for you later. Um, all right, our fourth presentation. Uh, from Open Book Publishers, we have Rupert Tagani, who is co-founder and director of Open Book. He is a fellow of Trinity College in Cambridge, where he is uh, director of studies in economics. His published academic work includes microeconomic analysis of competition in online markets, game theory, and search theory. He has held visiting positions at MIT and the University of Florence, acting uh, acted as an economic advisor on several EU competition studies, is on the advisory board of a range of open access initiatives and speaks frequently on the open access movement. Uh, Rupert, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Glenn, and everybody for the invitation. Um, so yeah, although I'm an economist, um, uh, clearly that's not why I was invited here today. It's more about um, open access book publishing and particularly to talk about the uh, the book publisher that uh, I co-founded um, with Alessandra uh, Tosi, uh, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. So let me share screen. And I think probably the easiest thing is if I just go to the website and we just chat about, uh, you know, the thing about open access is that everything should be accessible. Uh, so this is always one of these tests, you know, it's now that the, uh, that the, the, the everything, um, you know, dies or, or, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the website doesn't work for some reason. But anyway, so hopefully uh, people can see that. Yes, that's coming through. Open Book Publishers is a open access uh, academic book publisher. We're a non-profit organization set up by uh, some scholars based in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, so I, I recognize that there's quite a lot of differences between ourselves and and uh, the other speakers that we've heard. So first of all, of course, we publish books, academic books, and we can go back uh, a little bit to some of those. Second is uh, that they are all open access. And that's something I'm, I'm happy to talk about more, but open access is becoming an increasingly common part of publishing in academia now. It means that the works themselves are available for free online so that they can all be read uh, online in their entirety for free. And it also means that they come with some sort of uh, creative, in our case, with some sort of creative commons license, which allows various degrees of sharing of the content. So at the very minimum, somebody could share the PDF uh, that with, with other people uh, costlessly and without, without need for any permissions to do that. We heard about some of the copyright issues with images and things earlier. Uh, so if we, um, uh, just just scroll down for a little bit. So we've published um, about 250 uh, titles so far. Uh, and and I, I guess the, the key thing about open access, as soon as you start making material available online for free, you know, surprise, surprise, there's a lot of demand for it. Uh, a lot of people are interested in accessing materials and are a little frustrated by the ability to access high quality academic works when they've got large pay uh, paywalls to them that are preventing access. Uh, and so that's one of the motivations and one of our key motivations is to make this accessible for people, not just in the elite universities, but, uh, but generally around the world. And just to put a little bit of perspective on it, there's been quite a few reports coming out recently looking at academic book publishing. The typical university press uh, book uh, published, you know, high quality peer reviewed academic university press uh, book has sales of around between two and 300. So that's it's tiny. It's it's tiny sales, uh, and so it it, it the, the ability for global audiences to interact with that material is very limited. Uh, as we will see, uh, is when when we put things online, suddenly the interaction with it and accessibility of the work becomes increasingly uh, by orders of magnitude large, larger than that, and we can have a look at that in a second. Um, so uh, open access uh, has got, at, at sometimes there's funding models that require authors to pay for publication, but that is not a funding model that we use. So authors are not required to, to make any payment for publication. 
uh, we have various forms of, of revenue that comes through. Uh, we get make revenue from the sale of the printed works. Uh, so our works come out both in, in printed paper, paper traditional books, uh, but also in various formats, digital formats. Uh, so we make we do make some money out of the sale of the printed works, and that goes back in to fund further publications. Uh, we also have a library membership scheme where over 200 libraries around the world are, are sponsoring the activities that we do through a membership scheme, and that gives us uh, about a third of our revenue comes from that, a third from the various sales, and a third of our revenue comes from from grants that authors might be able to apply for. So that although we don't require authors to pay anything, we do say, you know, if you know of a grant and you could apply for it, then that would help us offset uh, our publishing activities. Uh, and about a third of our revenue comes through from, from grant funding. Uh, and we do work with authors to apply for grants as well. So we uh, um, are a very, uh, as far as the quality assessment, we've heard about peer review, uh, uh, we follow a fairly, fairly standard um, peer review process, possibly a little bit more rigorous than, than, than many um, uh, book publishers. So we typically ask for the manuscript the, and we ask for the entire manuscript, which we send out for peer review. Uh, as we've heard before, we send it out typically to two peer reviewers. Sometimes it might be three, but typically it would go out to two peer reviews. We do a single blind process. So we heard earlier about the double blind where where neither the reviewer knows the author or the author knows the reviewers. With books, that's not so common. Uh, and in fact, it's single blind. So the reviewer is anonymous, but when the book goes out, uh, they, or the, the reviewer is made aware of the, of the author. Having said that, and, and, and to go back to the um, concerns people might have for, for, you know, non, for independent scholars, uh, we really do support uh, independent scholars and early career uh, researchers. We've got a large number who have published with us. And in fact, one of our um, uh, initial uh, d founding directors uh, called William Sinclair, who fortunately died last year, but he started himself as an independent scholar and, and then moved into academia later on. So there's a very, you know, very, very strong commitment that we've got to support independent scholars uh, in, in their publishing. Uh, so uh, if one wants, one can see, uh, you know, we publish across a whole range, we've, we're across a, Across a whole range of disciplines, but as far as uh, and so you can see the sorts of things that we publish. Uh, you know, we could look at some of the series if you if we if we wanted or some of the categories. Maybe you can see that we've got uh, a, a large range of categories, but some that might be particularly appropriate here would be things like like the classic series, um, where we have a range of books. Uh, some of them studying particular issues, such as you know the the, the hotter stones and in. in um, Ancient Athena, uh, um, ancient Athens, and and um, uh, and others are more textbooks. Um, uh, and and each of these, you can go in and have a look um, and and see. You can you know you can read either HTML versions or PDF versions online. You can download various types of digital works um, uh, with an XML version as well for people that that are interested in, in, in accessing the, the, the code in that format. Uh, and of course, in, in uh, um, paperback and, and, and hardback editions as well. Uh, and then you can look and see the types of, uh, and, you know, if you want to just cruise the website and have a look, but we have things like usage metrics, you know, so this was a book that was published when in January, um, and it's had, you know, 400 downloads from the OBP website, um, uh, another hundred readers, you know, more from OAPE and Google Books and places like that. So you can see that we've already got, you know, this part of a thousand readers uh, um, who are who have engaged with the with the work, um, uh, which is far in excess of what you, one would expect in a in, in a printed work. Um, and and other books have clearly um, uh, much more than that. So the other thing that I might just quickly uh, um, Mention, you know, there's other series there that we've got a Semitic series, uh, which looks has got works, you know, dating back from, you know, the first first millennia. Anyway, so uh, there, there's lots of lots of again um, early uh, ancient um, studies uh, books in that series. I, I just also just uh, would like to mention it 
while, while I'm here that as well as uh, typical, you know, book, text, images, uh, we also have quite a number of works which have embedded other digital materials, such as 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 music or, or music files or videos or things like that, which can be embedded into the digital work. For the printed works, we create a QR code so that you can scan it on your telephone and access it through a mobile. Uh, and so these are the 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 we're we're very interested in engaging and in, in pushing out the boundaries of of what is traditionally. Uh, conceived of as a book uh, to embed lots of extra uh, material, 3D images of, of, of an artifact, for example. Uh, all of these types of things can be embedded into the works to enhance the nature of the engagement with the audience, which is, of course, the point of the, of the, point of the exercise. Um, okay, uh, so uh, any other points that we that I had to do peer review process the copyright rules we can talk about open access uh, later if it's quite a big topic but um, uh, but the copyright of the works remains with the author so for us it's very important that the publisher does not take the, the copyright so the copyright of the work remains with the author all we ask is for a non-exclusive license to uh, to publish the works in the various formats that we do. Uh, the submission process and things like that, again, can be, there's lots of information. We've got to publish submissions, information for new authors, et cetera. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tab there. Uh, it's a fairly standard, you know, to, we've got a, a, a form uh, that we would ask people to, to uh, fill in and submit about the nature of the work and the audience and, and what you're wanting to do with it. Uh, and, and, but just an email to start with uh, is, is also a useful first point of contact. Okay, uh, that's probably my time. Um, Thank you. Happy to take questions later on if, if, if anybody has any. I'm gonna break my own rule and just ask a, a quick follow-up question. Is, are there various uh, strategies for promoting and advertising the books other than the website? Do you, I mean, through university libraries or what, what are the portals by which you get word out about the books? Okay, so so uh, open access works. It's it, it's uh, you know that's wonderfully easy <laughs> because there's no restrictions on access to the work. So we use a lot of social networks. Um, we also put it through all the traditional uh, distribution channels. So the printed works uh, uh, go through all the traditional. You know the 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 um, Gobi is the is the standard thing that goes through to libraries. Uh, but also all of the works are listed on WorldCat. Uh, they're there'd be hundreds of libraries that get access to the metadata for the works that go into their catalogs. They're on Google Books, they're on the Internet Archive, they're on, they're on uh, there's a directory of open access books and OAPEN. So there's about 25 different platforms that we put the books, that we distribute the books out to uh, so that they can be broadly accessible. Uh, and when it comes back to those metrics, as, 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 as maybe you were alluding to, you know, we don't get the metrics for an awful lot of those places. So we don't know how those books are being accessed. Um, uh, they're just out there, um, you know, uh, EBSCO is doing its stuff with them. Uh, and, and well, Google Books we get back from, but, but other places, uh, have you trust, we don't. And so there's, there's, there's lots, of, lots of places, uh, Internet Archive, we don't get uh, data back from them either. So you know, there, there's um, lots of, of platforms where they're available and accessible of it that, um, uh, yeah, that's open access that goes out there. Um, it's distributed by Twitter feeds by people saying, <laughs> hey, look at this, you know, um, uh, there's the link to it. Um, certainly a different world than it was 15 years ago, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, very good. Thank you, Rupert. So we'll move on to our uh, fifth and final presentation for the workshop uh, from the World History Encyclopedia. Jan Vanderkam is the founder and CEO of World History Encyclopedia, one of the world's most read history publications. Uh, the organization's mission is to engage people with cultural heritage and to improve history education worldwide. He has worked in the field of history related digital media since 2006 and holds an MA in War Studies from King's College London, as well as a BA in Journalism from the University of East London. Uh, Jan. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen shortly. Um, give me a second. There we go. 
Um, one second. Sorry. Uh, okay. All right. So here we go. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, quickly talk about World History Encyclopedia, who we are, um, what we do, why we do it, and how you can get published with us and why you might want to. <laughs> so um, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are also an open access publication, like some of the others before. And um, for us, uh, really, the kind of the tagline that we have that we, we kind of present is history grows the mind. We think that history in all the academic fields actually takes a very special place um, because it is the, um, the one kind of uh, discipline that truly informs how we understand our cultural identity, our national identity, and how we see other cultures, right? Um, it, it really has an impact on exactly that. And obviously that changes the way we see the world, which is why for us, the mission is to engage people with cultural heritage and to improve history education worldwide, as Rupert just said. <laughs> um, now, you know, be, because uh, the uh, historical importance, sorry, the importance of history for understanding our cultural identity and so on, um, we think that history is something that is not just an academic discipline, but it should really be for everybody, um, because the more people know about history, the more open-minded and less xenophobic our culture and our world can be. I mean, we can look at you know what's happening in Ukraine to see how different understanding of history and cultural identity actually causes wars. Uh, we can also look closer home, for example, in the United States, where there are very serious discussions about what is acceptable to be taught in history class in high school, uh, you know, particularly related to slavery and uh, certain censorship potentially going on, right? Um, now, the more people understand history, the less they can be influenced by uh, politicians and pundits uh, who like to use and misuse history for their own, you know, political gain. Um, which is why we think that open access, which we consider ourselves an open access uh, resource and an open education resource, open access, uh, we think needs some redefinition. Uh, open access isn't just about it being free and freely available. Open access should very much be also about being accessible. And by that, I mean that not only should it be easy to find and to, to, to get to, many journals that are open access are still very much hidden in university libraries, but uh, it also needs to be understandable uh, for the general public, the layperson, uh, because only once the lay people can understand it, they can actually make use of it. And so we see ourselves a bit as the bridge between those two worlds, the, the world of the general public and the academic world, because obviously there's a place for academic publishing. It's a very important thing. <laughs> um, but there should be the uh, complement of speaking to the public, sharing research and knowledge with the public. So that's kind of that bridge that we see ourselves in. So shortly about us, so we are a nonprofit organization. We've been around since 2009, uh, and we are one of the most read history publications in the world, not just on the web, but in general, I think. Um, so uh, yeah, we are mostly run by volunteers, but we have a core team of about 10 employees, soon 11, uh, who work from all over the world. We don't really have an office, and we um, you know, run this with a small team. I'll talk a little bit later on how we managed to do that. But um, lastly, a little bit more about our readership. So in the last 12 months, we had around 30 million individual people who read um, articles on our website. And um, at the moment, we have around 3,380 articles published. We have a large media library with images, maps, videos, and 3D models as well. And uh, uh, over 680 people have contributed uh, to our encyclopedia. So now I want to talk a little bit about the publishing process. So uh, first of all, 
uh, our publishing platform is custom built from the ground up. And um, it is due to this that we are able to do this with a small team. Um, basically, the way it works is that our platform will, uh, you know, submissions come in through our platform, um, our editors edit it in that platform. And then once things get published, the platform will also automatically figure out which um, articles it should link to. Everything gets interlinked automatically. Um, and uh, our editors, though, inform those links as well through tagging and keywords and so on. Um, the same is true for the search. So the search uh, obviously is, is done by the machine, but again, our editors have a strong influence on how the search delivers search results. So we are trying to operate this kind of hybrid um, platform where our editors guide the computer in order to put everything together um, in a very lean team, thanks to the automation. Now submissions, um, who can submit? Well, uh, so we accept submissions from scholars, obviously, who are somehow qualified in uh, fields of history or archaeology or have relevant experience. Um, we also take people who are not in historical fields. For example, if there's a, an economist who writes about something historical related to economies, then that's fine too, of course. Um, submissions to us, uh, don't cost money. So it's not like an open uh, access publication that charges or anything, um, but we also don't pay. So it is simply free to publish with us. And um, as I mentioned before, all the submissions are handled right through our website. We also accept uh, book excerpts. So we work a lot, for example, with Oxford University Press and get excerpts from some of their books. And in exchange, we also promote the books, obviously. Um, so there we go. Now, once something is submitted, it goes into editorial review. Um, so this is not a double blind peer review or anything like that. It is an editorial review, um, much more like, you know, what we saw with uh, Sapiens magazine earlier. And um, our editors take great care to make sure that everything is accurate. Of course, we, we fact check, but maybe even more importantly, we also check that it's engaging and easy to understand. All right, because, as I said, open access is great, but we need people to actually want to read it. And um, so our editors work with the authors to make sure that everything is easy to understand. Um, we publish for everyone. So uh, for us, the readers are the general public. Uh, and uh, as we're an encyclopedia, we're being used very much also by school students who might be 14 years old or older. That's kind of the target audience we look at. We are aware of some students who are younger as well, but we, we don't aim younger than that. Um, and it's it's really important be, to, to keep that in mind because students at school, they might not care about history. They might not even want to read about it. They might be forced to do so. So for us, it's really important to make sure that it is not boring. It is easy to understand that we can pick them up and get them interested. Uh, and of course, at the same time, we hold all the publications uh, to a rigorous academic standard um, to make sure that it is high quality um, so that teachers are comfortable recommending it as well. So we like to say that story is the key part in the word history, uh, which is why, you know, we don't just list facts in our articles and we work with the authors to tickle out the interesting stories again very similar for what we heard earlier about sapiens magazine um, we want to make sure why these things matter and explain the context and ideally relate it as well to the present day make it relevant um, and again our editors work to source the images we and, and create maps sometimes even for it uh, we have graphic designers um, and find videos, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, we also accept uh, submissions from the uh, authors themselves. If they've taken photographs themselves, that's entirely fine as well. And we can acc accommodate that too. And then once something is published, we also promote it. Um, so we have a large social media following, uh, closing in on a million followers at the moment. We have an email newsletter with over 27,000 subscribers. and. Um, since about a year ago, we started doing push notifications as well, which is people who subscribe get a little pop-up on their phone, a little notification, hey, there's this new article, 
if you want to read it, I can just click on it. And that's working out really well for us in terms of getting people interested. Uh, finally, we also translate articles. Um, not every article necessarily, but we try to translate as many as we can into essentially all of the languages of the world. The two biggest languages for us, apart from English, are Spanish and French. Um, and our team of translators obviously continues to expand that. So at the moment, about 20% of the um, readers are reading not in English, but we expect that uh, to grow to about 50% in the next year or maximum two, uh, because, uh, yeah, as I said, we are rapidly translating, and that is adding a lot of new readers to our website at a rapid pace at the moment, because obviously English is only going that far on a global audience. Now, speaking of a global audience, um, Authors who publish with us, they can reach a very wide audience. And I picked a picture of a football stadium, which is not something you would usually associate with history. Um, you know, uh, Rupert earlier said that the typical university press book gets about 200 to 300 sales. Um, now, we're talking in completely different dimensions here. So most articles published with us will gather tens of thousands of uh, readers quite quickly, essentially filling a football stadium. And some of our authors have reached over hundreds of thousands of readers for their work. Um, obviously, not every article will attract an enormous audience, but it's entirely possible and very common. And what we do as well is we provide the uh, authors with the uh, stats on how many readers they've had and so on, because we are aware that in some countries, particularly in the UK, where I am at the moment, um, academics have to kind of prove to the university that their work had public impact. And that's what we want to provide. We want to provide that public impact for academic work. And that is a complement to publishing in journals and books, which is impor very important and has its place in the academic world because it's what's driving research forward. But we are, we are essentially trying to be that complement to drive that public engagement. Uh, finally, we are a respected publication. Um, I hope many of you know us already, but um, you know, many institutions recommend us. Oxford University, the School Library Journal. Um, we've been peer reviewed by Merlo 2 and Common Sense Education, and many, many other universities, schools, and libraries. Um, so, you know, you're in, you're in good company here. <laughs> so, write for us. Don't be shy. Uh, you know, tell your world about your research um, or your area of expertise. People want to know about it. And I think when, you know, when people are used to publishing in academia, you know, they are used to small numbers, like two to 300 readers. Um, these numbers are very small. You'll be amazed at how many people actually want to know about your work. So there we go. That's us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jan, for that very good presentation. And I just had very one quick follow-up question. Um, and maybe you mentioned this, but do you actively seek for, for new submissions, new stories in certain subject areas, since you are an encyclopedia and covering such a, a, wide, a wide swath of, of topics and time periods, or does it just kind of develop organically in terms of the content? Well, we uh, do uh, seek submissions actively on specific topics that we are about to cover. So we generally work in the sense that we look at the global curricula in schools. So we have a big database to know what subjects are covered. And so we kind of want to tick those off first. Um, now, we sometimes approach academics specifically where we know that that academic might have a specific, um, you know, uh, specialty or expertise in the subject. Um, but more often than that, academics will come to us and they will just write about the thing that they happen to know about. And in that sense, it does grow organically. But um, for example, we have one academic, uh, um, she's a, a professor from Pittsburgh and she writes about um, religious, uh, ancient religion. Uh, and so with her, because she's a regular contributor, we uh, work to cover very specific areas of within her field to make sure that the key things that people we know are interested in are actually covered. 
And uh, we also have a needed content list. So it's oh. on our website. And also people can just write to us and be like, hey, uh, this is my specialty. What do you want me to write about? <laughs> we get that sometimes. Well, thank you to all five presenters who gave wonderful you know, uh, overviews of their organizations and their publishing platforms. I would now invite everybody who's comfortable anyway to turn on your camera, at least your camera, so we can see everybody who's out there. And um, yeah, we'll begin the Q&A portion of uh, this. We have just a little bit less than a half hour to go over any questions or comments that people have. I'm not, I don't see it in my Zoom, but if there's a, a raise your hand function in Zoom, uh, in your Zoom interface, you can use that and I can call on you. Um, do we have that? Am I seeing hands? I've seen hands clapping, but I haven't seen a, a raise hand. But so, or you can use uh, the Q&A chat function as well um, if you want to use that uh, to ask a question. So are there any questions out there for any of our presenters? I have a few loaded up in case we need them. But <laughs> I definitely want to give it over to the audience first. Um, there's a raise hand function in reaction. I don't, does anybody see any raised hands on them? Yeah, there's Maybe. one raised hand, I think from Heather, no? Okay, there. Yes, I'm demonstrating the raised hand function. Ah, there it is. Yeah, okay, you're, you're in my upper left. Okay, please ask your, your question, Heather. Okay, great. Well, thank you to this amazing panel and what, and thank you to Sasa for organizing this. Um, so I um, am approaching this uh, from the perspective of an independent scholar. Um, several of the panelists were explicit that independent scholars were welcome to submit. Um, so I just wanted to see if there was any um, uh, hesitation on the part of any of the panelists. I noticed um, Kerdequin on Sapiens on your website, it says that you're interested in publishing anthropologists and specifically affiliated anthropologists or current students. So I'm just wondering if that is, if independent scholars should um, submit to your uh, publication. And yes, that's a question specifically for you. Um, but, and you know, there's no judgment here. I mean, every publication can apply its eligibility cr criteria however they want. I just want to know um, for the purposes of a resource document I'm putting together for independent scholars, which publications are open to independent scholars? Okay, so that's one question. Another one is, you know, if, if you have experience working with independent scholars who are submitting, are there any, um, you know, specific issues that have come up um, that we should be aware of um, as we're submitting? Um, is there, I mean, I, I I'm not, I don't really know what issues there would be, but I thought I would ask this extra expert panel if you have seen things come up when you're working with independent scholar authors that don't come up with academics or vice versa. So I'll just lead off since uh, with the question for me is, um, yes, we, we do accept. Um, so I, I think, I can't remember how our website phrases it, but it's like you have to have a degree in anthropology um, or be affiliated with um, an anthropology department. So if you have a degree in anthropology and you're an independent you know, person, then that's totally fine. Um, and it's just, it's really on a sort of case by case basis, but, but you're absolutely welcome uh, to pitch. And I don't recall any issues that ever arising? I don't know. I don't know either what what issues would potentially arise um, with independent scholars. It's I um, as far as I'm concerned, everyone's welcome. <laughs> it's all it's all good. Um, yeah, I'm, I know I'm doing I'm doing a Q and A right now that I'm actually I don't normally write for the website, but occasionally I do, and I and I'm doing a Q and A, and one of um, the people that I um, am interviewing is uh, independent. Yeah, um, he has a degree in anthropology, but um, is not affiliated with anyone. And I was like, he has he has really interesting things to say, and he's worked with uh, some some interesting um, um, indigenous communities, and it's worked perfect for the article, so it's totally fine with me. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Yeah. I, I can maybe add to that as well. Sorry. Um, I can maybe add to that that from our experience, uh, we, we publish independent scholars as well as affiliated scholars, but uh, we have noticed that quite often 
uh, independent scholars are actually easier to work with because they have um, less red tape. <laughs> and uh, also, quite often, they are a little bit less in deep in their subject in the sense that they are less academic about it in a way, which for us is a good thing because we write for the general public. Um, and so there's less editorial work on our end to make it good for the general public. I'm not saying the quality is any better or worse. It's just the writing style is often easier for independent scholars. <laughs> Super interesting. Thank you. Then the other panelists want to chime in about that, whether there's any particular challenges or issues that come up when dealing with uh, submissions from um, non-traditional scholars or independent researchers. I can I can pitch in to just say I I, I don't think really <laughs> really uh, very many. I mean I I, I must say that. Most of the independent scholars that we've published have got um, PhDs or uh, equivalent. So, you know, they know when it's going out to a peer review, we're an academic publisher, we're looking for an academic work. You know, that's that's very different to the work that Jan's um, just been discussing, you know. And so there, there's a different style and different, you know, detail footnoting that's required. But, you know, most people uh who, who've done phds know all about that so it's not it you know there's really not a not not an issue there uh, we do occasionally get you know a, as you'd expect as a book publisher we do occasionally get completely wacky things that have come out of cloud nine um and uh and 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 so we do a, a disc we do a fairly serious disc um uh assessment uh early on to decide what to send out to peer review and and, and whatnot but, Somewhat related question just appeared in the chat is uh, among those publishers here, do you, are there opportunities for people at the undergraduate or maybe sort of immediate postgraduate levels or master's degree students to publish in these forums? Again, is it is it more just the nature of the search and the quality of research or are there certain minimum um, educational requirements? Um, for new classes, at least we do, we do accept things from master's students. Um, so I, I, we don't really look at anything that's from undergraduates. We'd point those to other directions, but um, yeah, the immediate postgraduate we definitely provide opportunities for that, and it, it's more about the quality of the content there rather than whether you have a PhD. Um, at Wait. Sapiens, we typically don't go below master's degree. However, that's not like a 100% no. I mean, we, we, would, we would consider um, a really strong pitch if, if there's expertise in, in a field, it would, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, but it would be unusual. Um, however, I mean, there are also many publications that are, I mean, journalistic publications that Obviously, don't care that you know. There's not you don't have to have a degree to be to publish in in journalism. So you know there are plenty of of, of other things like Smithsonian or you know um, or or that route that that you could publish um, and and say that you have a degree in that and that might help you. But you would still have to have a very compelling pitch and um, and and show that you have expertise in this area. Um, but um, but it would still be it would still be possible. That's a, you know journalism is open to to pretty much anyone with a really really strong idea. So I I when I was you know getting my my master's degree and I didn't didn't have it yet. I turned in one of my homework assignments to the New York Times. So it happens occasionally and it got published. Um, so you never know. Can I just quickly add, add, add one thing? So we don't we don't uh, typically ask for a CV. So we've got no idea whether people you know what their educational background is um uh when the book comes in um however specifically we do not publish uh phd theses in immediately so uh so we would ask for some revision from a phd thesis to to create the monograph um rather than just the publication of the phd thesis um and then you know as i said before you know I, I, uh, one of our founding directors um you know did not have a phd didn't have master's degree you know it just was uh, um a, a very good scholar uh, and so you know that this is neither necessary nor sufficient conditions 
Well, for us, uh, we tend to look at a completed bachelor degree and above, but again, it's not a strict rule. <laughs> uh, and another thing that we uh, tell people who don't have necessarily the experience or the background is that we also publish things that are not necessarily fact-based um, in the sense of, you know, a report about I visited this museum and this is what I have to say about it, or this exhi or an exhibition review or a book review. These are all things that somebody who is an undergraduate student can easily do, and we would be happy to publish those without question. It's just when it comes to the, you know, like have an encyclopedic definition on something, then yeah, we want to be sure that it's good. It doesn't mean you have to have it necessarily, but it would be good if you did. <laughs> at yeah. NEA, we publish original research and generally at that level, you, you don't have anything quite original enough or significantly meaningful to say about it. Really let things incubate, give yourself time. Uh, you don't want to write something really bad when you're kind of young and then years later look back and go, oh my God, what was I thinking? Because I can assure you that's gonna happen anyway, but you wanna deal with the degree of humiliation that your future self is gonna be feeling looking back. So remember scholarship is a timey wimey process and it's gonna take you a while even past a degree or whatnot to get to the point where you really have a grip on what you think you're talking about and what you think you understand. So you need to give yourself time to ferment. Uh, Anne actually has a, a good question. I think that a lot of you can speak to is, um, do you have any advice for early career scholars on how to turn their dissertations into an article or a series of articles or an actual published monograph? And I don't know if one of you, maybe the, the book publishers can start with the monograph and then the, the journal folks can deal with sort of maybe breaking it down individual articles. So Rupert, do you wanna take a first stab at that? Um, so uh, typically what we would say for somebody who had a, a dissertation, um, a PhD dissertation has got a, you know, the first chapters of a PhD dissertation are, you know, I, I need to prove that I've read the work, I read my background and I need to, you know, justify that, that you know, that I've really read all the stuff. A lot of that is, is not going to get, is not particularly useful uh, in, in, the, in the final uh, research monograph publication. Um, and so we would be looking for the person, uh, not necessarily to completely rewrite it, but to really focus about, okay, now your audience, instead of being three people uh, who are going to decide whether or not you get a degree and therefore you've got to prove some credentials and, and that things, you've now got a slightly different audience that you're addressing. And so the question is, how would you want to be addressing that broader audience? What's the information that they would find useful? and engaging and bringing them in. And that could be that there needs to be, you know, another section that might really help it, or it might be that you want to cut things, change the way that things are written a little bit to make it, uh, just thinking about the audience. You know, I, I think it's it's important that one writes, writes for an audience. You know, you, you, you've got something to say, you want to say it, you want people to understand it, but you need to understand who those people are, you know, and how would they want to be engaging with it? What's the information that you can do? And that's probably the same for, for all the various publishers. But, you know, with books, it's, it's you know, that why would anybody want to read this? Um, and, and what's the material that you want to bring in to do that? And so it just requires a little bit of a focus rather than here's me showing off with my credentials, please give me a PhD, which, you know, it's a, it's a very different sort of mindset, I think. Jordan, Giuseppe, Stephanie, did you have anything you want to add, especially on more the turning sort of larger dissertation um, level manuscripts into articles or individual articles? Um, personally, I would say don't, or at least wait a very long period of time before trying to do it. Because once you've finished your dissertation, you know it, it has eaten your brain. Um, you are too close to the topic. So it's very hard for you to write about it in a way that a person outside of your brain can understand. There's too much that you're taking for granted that you think is expressed that is not expressed. And you cannot get into the mind of someone who isn't in your brain to see it from an outside perspective. Um, I've seen a few too many articles that people submit and it doesn't get through peer review. And part of it is that, well, you know, you didn't address this and you didn't address that. And 
I, I wind up getting the rather uppity response of, well, it's in my dissertation. And I always want to say, no one's reading your dissertation. You have to write an article as an integral object in and of itself. So you need to give yourself time to get away from it. Secondarily, and this is something that freaks people out, um, you cannot summarize your dissertation. You cannot summarize a chapter of your dissertation. If you wanna take your dissertation and generate an article from it, you get one sentence from your dissertation and you turn that sentence into an article. And if you try to do anything more than that, it's not going to work. So give yourself time, focus on something else for a while until you can come back at it. And it's like a, a bit more objectively and a bit not it eating your head and take one sentence, maximum two, and see if you can turn that into a good, well-written, tight integral article, but nothing more than that. Uh, Rupert and Stephanie made excellent points. And I would just um, add just something from a, from a, just a writing structure perspective. Um, one of the most common things I see um, it, from people who are used to academic writing who are turning in an article to Sapiens is that they begin the article like they would begin a dissertation with the introduction. Here's the background. Here's the whole history of this, this story. That doesn't actually keep readers' attention. And so we always tell people, start with an anecdote, start with a story. And I would say that if you're trying to conceive of a way to, um, to turn your, your, your dissertation into something, start with, a, start with a story, which may not even be in your dissertation. It may be some story that happened outside. Of, you know, I'm thinking of one of our, one of our researchers, um, Sophie Chow, who, who works with the uh, Merind Indigenous uh, Group in um, West Papua, Indonesia. And she did her dissertation on them. She she knows everything about uh, I don't know her specific topic, but um, one of the stories she wrote for us was about how how this group adopted a wild animal because there had been loss of habitat and things like that. That wasn't in her dissertation, but the story of this moving of this of this animal that she encountered during her research um, showed just how. Um, how poignant this was that, that, that animals were losing land and people were losing land and all of this. And so that was like something that came out of her dissertation that wasn't really in it. So think story is sort of what I would, would add to that. And if I might just say one more thing, um, with the dissertation, the focus tends to be on showing what you know when you're writing, you wanna focus on conveying information. And these things are so radically different from one another because when you're trying to impress people, you're using all the jargon and all the shibboleths and you're trying to sound extremely uppity and precocious. And when you're writing for you know normal people, you want to convey ideas and you wanna speak their language and you don't want to intimidate them the way you wanna think you're intimidating your dissertation group. So just the way you think about the writing is so radically different. So keep that in mind as well. And I would say yeah. just from my, my own experience too, I, I often tell our authors who are you know senior leading professors, like don't take our editing personally. You know, it's, it's really, we're just trying to communicate to our audience what you want to say. And typically academics write for their own audience. They write for their peers. They write for their colleagues. And in our case, we're just editing their work to make sure it's digestible and accessible and understandable to just, the, as I like to say, just middle America. And so uh, often you have to tell people just, you know, we're, we're not trying to critique you. We're not trying to, um, you know, tell you you're a bad writer. No, it's just we're trying to help you communicate. So. Um, very good. I think somebody else wanted to make a point. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add there as well that sometimes when adapting things like a, a dissertation or, or a thesis, you know, the, the theses in particular, they're, they're quite long and they have a lot of tangents and, and, and sometimes, you know, you have one large general topic, but to make that to make that argument, you need to build it up with lots of little things. Whereas with an article, you know, you've got a lot less space to work with there. And so what I really recommend and, and the way I think about, you know, adapting these things myself is, is really just picking one, one thing out of it and going with that and keeping it focused or, or even just choosing an interesting tidbit that you discovered along the way that didn't actually fit within your dissertation, but kind of stuck in your head. And, and it's just, it's, yeah, keeping it, you know, manageable to the word count and, and yeah, exactly writing to the audience. 
We have one more question in the chat, and I'm going to, James, by, by chance, do you mind turning on your, at least your mic, and then, because I, I don't want to garble your question. I'll, I'll try to, but it's in the chat, but basically, if I understand James's question correctly, it's sort of in regards to those journals that have a double-blind peer review process, the idea that academia is basically really a rather closed group of people who basically know of each other and can therefore, even if it's not formally explicitly made clear who the reviewers are and who the authors are, that, that people sort of know. And is that a legitimate critique, I guess, of the double-blind review process? And James, I hope that reflects a, an accurate representation of your question. Sometimes it depends on what the topic is. If it is an incredibly niche topic, and especially if the author has written about it an awful lot, then people will probably be able to guess, but it is a guess. Beyond that, uh, you will have things, remember how I said before that only people in charge of the excavation are allowed to publish the excavation? Well, if someone is publishing about Hala Sultan Teke, the peer reviewers are going to guess, huh, it's probably Peter Fisher or one of the excavators at Hala Sultan Teke, and they are going to be right because no one else is technically allowed to do it. Uh, something more general. Uh, something potentially more art historical is going to be harder and harder to guess. So unless you have an amazingly identifiable writing style, believe it or not, no, uh, the, the blind is in fact very blind. Mm -hmm. And I've seen enough uh, misguesses when someone says, oh, so-and-so wrote that, right? Like, nope, not at all. And I once had a colleague who thanked me so much for this positive review I wrote of the book he did. And I had to say, Sorry, dude, that, that wasn't me. He's like, but it had to be. It sounded just like you. The person had a sense of humor. Like, I don't know who it was. So there are enough mistakes to indicate that no, blind is truly blind in this case. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, we have had a few cases where we do send, uh, you know, proposals or abstracts out to to reviewers and they've kind of said, oh, I may have heard of something like this. Um, and exactly, they guess. Sometimes they're right, very rarely they're correct, in which case we probably wouldn't go with them. Um, but yeah, you'd be surprised. It's, it's a lot harder than it sounds, really. Can I just add one thing? The, another part of that question was suggesting that, you know, colleagues could be uh, helping each other. I think very few journals would ask a, a colleague from a from a, an, a the same institution or a known colleague to be a reviewer, and 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 you know if if for some reason you know you don't know who everybody knows, but it it is fairly common for a reviewer to come back and say actually I know this person I shouldn't be the reviewer. So so it it no it's it's not really a a, a closed net. I mean there's lots of problems with with peer review as as we all know, but but. You know, there's also there's a lot of lot of care that's taken to make sure that you don't get those little closed groups all peer reviewing each other. Let's go ahead, David. Hi, thanks. Um, thank you all for your time today. Um, it's, it's really been great. Um, I think an important question is how do you um, decide what the line is between something that's um, publishable in, in terms of its idea um, or that's not publishable, meaning that it is too far away from the scholarly norm. How does that process work? How well do you argue it? Um, as someone who publishes an awful lot of things that are very contrary to received wisdom, uh, you have to be amazingly explicit in your use of primary sources. And it is the argumentation and the data and the organization that is going to determine whether it's this really whacked out theory about where Noah's Ark is actually located. Okay, that's partially a, a joke there, but biblical archeology, span you get stuff like that. Um, as opposed to, you can look at someone like Joan Breton Connolly, perhaps who had a radically new idea of what the Parthenon freeze actually represented 
and got it published. And I think won an award for that and did very well because she was meticulous with her data wrangling and her analysis and her presentation. So anyone can come up with a, what seems like a wacko theory because it goes against the currently received wisdom, but the currently received wisdom is frequently wrong by the way. And it always needs to be readdressed, but you have to do it very carefully and very well. And always, always go back to those primary sources. So at least that's how I would make a call like that, either for an article or for a book or anything else. For us, it's a bit different. If it's not the uh, consensus, we don't publish it <laughs> because um, we're an encyclopedia. We have students in high schools using it. Uh, if a student comes back with some theory, then they might get a bad mark from their teacher and we can't have that. So. Um, we will publish it when the consensus changes, but that is not our job. <laughs> at, at Sapiens, the approach would be more like what Stephanie does. So we would publish you know, something that would be controversial as long as it's definitely backed up, so. I would say the same for new classicists. I think the when I was editor, the first paper, I was involved in the process for the double blind review. One of the reviewers said, well, I don't really agree with the argument, but it was well argued. So yeah, go go ahead. And I mean, I told the um, the author, you know, that's a great compliment actually that the person actually didn't actually, you know, agree, but said that it was well argued. So yeah, no, I would agree with Stephanie. It's just about argument and how well you argue it. Well, everybody, it looks like we are now at 2.30 and based on the SASA conference program, I think that's actually time for a much bigger thing, which is the keynote address. So uh, I wanna thank all of the, the really wonderful panelists uh, during the session. It was a great pleasure for me to moderate as well. And I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed getting to know a lot of my colleagues and editors and publishers and other venues. So I really appreciate your time. And I'm sure for the audience, if you wanna get in touch with any of these folks, I'm sure SASA can make their emails uh, and contact information available to you. And yeah, I hopefully we'll do this again sometime, David, right? All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Enjoy the keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Glenn and to all of the members of that marvellous workshop. Uh, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm definitely going to be going back and listening to it again, because that was an awful lot of very explicit information that for grad students and early career researchers is very often not made explicit. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. Um, as Glenn mentioned, we're now going to get underway with our third keynote, um, which is Dr. Kara Cooney. If you are tweeting along with us, the hashtag is OAW Keynote Cooney. Everything, uh, all the hashtags for the day should be on the conference schedule. So if you're interested, you can go to that and use those. So I have a brief bio for Dr. Cooney before we get started. Uh, Kara Cooney is a professor of Egyptology at UCLA and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Specializing in social history, gender studies, and economics in the ancient world, she received her PhD in Egyptology from Johns Hopkins University. In 2005, she was co-curator of Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Her popular books include The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt, and The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World. Her books, Recycling for Death, A Social History of Ancient Egypt Through Coffins of Dynasties 19 to 22 from American University in Cairo Press and Ancient Egyptian Society, Challenging Assumptions, Exploring Approaches from Routledge are forthcoming. The title of her talk today is The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World. Dr. Cooney, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, thank you, Sasa. Um, I'm... I'm a, I'm a little jet lagged coming from Hawaii on a red eye, but it's, this is gonna be great. And I think um, this keynote in many ways follows up on what you were talking about in your workshop quite directly in terms of speaking to the public, leaving the ivory tower, having conversations with a larger audience and making ancient history um, as relevant as possible. And as we go through many of the changes in the world around us today, I think that all of us can see how very relevant um, ancient history actually is. So let's let's jump into that and I'll keep this to um, 30 minutes, she said confidently, so that we can have a vibrant um, Q&A discussion. So um, 
I think we all know that that in the ancient world it was an easy thing to divinize rulers. Perhaps it was easier in ancient Egypt than in any other place, and more on that in a moment. But even those places that profess to hate um, the the divinization of rulers, the the connection between uh, politics and religion in such an overt way. Even these other places found methods of divinizing their rulers, whether explicitly or implicitly. And that's that's um, of great interest to me. But Egypt, I think, excels in the optics and packaging of that divinization, of that connection between state and God in a way that no one else on the entire planet to this day has been able to do. They are able to present themselves as the good and perfect king, um, as the one who, sorry, that was a call for my son, um, the, the good, and he may do it again, so we'll, we'll just keep coming back and I'll keep declining that call. Um, but the, the good and perfect king who is the one who connects the earth with the heavens, who is the one who knows literally in the Egyptian um, hieroglyphs how to do things, the, the year at, um, Hoot is the Egyptian for the ritualist, the chief ritualist. He knows how to make the offerings, as you see here, to light the brazier, to make things happen in the world as they should. He is the one that keeps your world safe. It keeps it, he keeps it protected. He is your last best hope between uh, absolute chaos and, and um, all of the other bad things that could happen without a king. And Egypt ancient Egypt excelled in producing pessimistic literature of what the world would be like without a king. So there's there's um, positivism presented, there's fear mongering presented, but really the way this, this divine state is packaged is something that continues to draw our gaze to um, make us uh, be Pharaoh's groupies, as I call it in the book. And, um, and really that's going to be our starting point for how this is actually very relevant for us in, um, I apologize, that's my son again. Um, I knew he would call again because that's what he does. Uh, yeah, so, um, so this slide is probably my most controversial slide. Um, so you think you don't have a king, um, where, what is the rise of authoritarianism? How are we to understand this? How can I jump from ancient Egypt to modern American politics? Should I even be doing this? What, what is this discussion? Well, you can read the book and decide for yourself, but I do go back and forth between ancient authoritarianism and modern authoritarianism um, with the overt claim that modern exceptionalism is a myth, with the overt claim that what the ancient Egyptians did so well, we would love to do better, or many of us would love to do better, and that much of our democratic um, system is based on the very same divinization, this idea that some presidents deserve to be carved into the sides of mountains sacred to indigenous peoples, whereas others um, uh, do not. But, but we do divinize our rulers as well. And we engage in many of the same practices that the ancient Egyptians do. And th that's, this is the book, the, the title is The Good King's Absolute Power in the Ancient World in the Modern Day. And I'm trying to get to a particular slide, um, this one here, where we may think we don't have these strange ideologies. We may think that we don't have this packaging of church and state. We may think that, um, that we're absolutely separate from, from this way of, of propagandizing power in the ancient world. But this is exactly why I use Egypt. Mm. I apologize. Egypt is about um, as recognizable as you could possibly get. It's also uh, uh, something that you see very quickly. You see its strangeness. You see the crooks and the flails. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. Jules, I'm in a talk. <laughs> I'm in a public talk right now in front of a whole lot of people. Can I call you back? It's okay. I'll call you back as soon as I can. I'm so sorry. I love you. Okay, bye. Um, Dr. Cuny, my four-year-old photo bombed us earlier, so you're just fine. It's his first day of school and new school, and so oh, bless. And he's just like it's just a school thing. So I'll I'll try to focus, and then I'll come back. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it together. It's going to be okay. Um, so getting back to our our topic at hand, um, the the Egyptians are so recognizable 
that it makes it obvious to us what's going on. So that when you see a king standing before a God with a lit brazier claiming that he's the only one that can keep you safe, you might roll your eyes and look at it and say that we would never do such a thing here. But my point is, is that this strange ideology was not strange to the Egyptians. These iconographies, elements, symbols were all pulled from the world around them, from their geography, from their flora and fauna. This was the water in which they swam. And to them, this ideology was able to hide and veil how politics was propagandized and how their authoritarianism actually worked. I would argue that in the modern world, that what we call a democracy and much of the, the constitutional idealisms that we create, particularly in the United States, um, are ideologies as well that they're veiling the um, pay to play economics of our politics, that they veil how state and religion are actually quite intertwined in politics around the world. They veil how many places are actually authoritarian to get money from the IMF, to get money from UNESCO or, or other organizations. You must claim to have free and fair elections. And there are many states around this globe that claim to be democracies when in actuality, their authoritarian regimes. And there are democracies that have presidents or parliamentary rulers who are authoritarian personalities. So the point is, is that Egypt is there to jar us and make us wake up and see something for what it is. And we can see it with Egypt. And then I turn our gaze back to the United States, sometimes to modern day Egypt, other places, and say, look at it there. Now try to pull the veil from your eyes, try to see it for what it actually is. And, and then you can take a lot of the positivist tropes away from your history. Um, I would argue that there is no more positivist history of the ancient world except for ancient Egypt. Maybe ancient Rome, particularly in its connection to the United States and its political um, rubrics and schema, but we, we glorify these Egyptian kings. We feel no shame in creating blockbuster exhibitions, in consuming the treasures of dead kings in, with our eyes and, and, our, and our coffee table books. Um, these things are very positivized in, in our eyes. And that's part of what I'm trying to tear down. And you can imagine that um, this doesn't always work well with some of my colleagues. But in short, we're gonna go back to the, the um, Egyptian kingship and, and I'm going to give you some elements of the Egyptian kingship and how it is authoritarian and how it works. Most of this should be no surprise to, to any of you, um, but it sometimes is jarring to, to people who spend their lives dedicated to this ancient field. And then we'll talk about a few kings and, and some of the parallels that we might make to the modern world um, and, and just some of the, the patterns that we have in this um, system of authoritarianism that humans seem to turn to with such regularity. The first point would be the king is superhuman. He's not just a god, but he is a, a human being of flesh and blood that is different from other peoples. He is colossal. He is of uh, precious stones. He is something unusual. He is superhuman. And he is monumental. He can be depicted as a building. He can be depicted as a temple. He can be depicted in um, colossal statuary. He is greatness defined. And that is why so many Egyptian kings are called the great, right? Ramses the Great, I think, um, is the case in point. And we'll, we'll certainly end with him. There is a great continuity to these kings. And they pride themselves on being able to say that they exist in this world from the beginning and they will continue to its end, that they rule for millions of years. And while that may not actually be the case, the continuity that the Egyptian kingship was able to create some 3000 years of the same language, the same general culture, the same religion, same political system is astounding to us and rather seductive. Something that we would in many ways love to take on instead of this ups and downs and parties and who knows who's gonna be ruling and all of this competition, it can be quite exhausting. And this continuity is, is something that is quite alluring for many of us. This king's divine body, we've, we've already discussed, but it gets quite explicit in some of the mythologies where the king claims clearly and directly to have been of a body possessed 
possessed, um, his father's body was possessed by Amun Re, um, impregnated his mother with actual divine seed, and his body is of that divine seed. And there's complex mythologies that go back probably to the Middle Kingdom, 12th Dynasty, to make these claims of, of div divination in, in physical corporeal form. There is a justified brutality, a monopolization of that brutality, that the king is the one who is meant to hold the mace aloft to smash the skulls of enemies. It is only the king who is, who is supposed to be doing something like that. He is depicted larger. He is the one whose brutality is God-given, is accepted and expected by the, the heavens. This is something that keeps all Egyptians safe. He is the stereotypical strong leader in body as well. And of course we have to put um, Putin on horseback because it fits perfectly with the image of a shirtless Tutmos III to the right. And even if you're not of sound body, like um, Roosevelt who got polio as a young adult, you can still make yourself of sound body, put yourself behind the wheel of a car, give yourself agency to be able to drive and show your power in a different way. There are ways of showing strength and youth even if you are an older man, um, would that women were able to create the same kinds of subterfuge in a patriarchy, but I have not seen it done successfully thus far. Um, these patriarchal systems, and really is the first time we're bringing up the word patriarchy, the rule of the fathers, a system in which we still live, obviously, though I think many would try to say that we do not, um, because we've had this sexual revolution and all, and I'm speaking to you, but I would say that patriarchy is going quite strong and is cracking down. Um, on, on many uh, liberties that, that have been um, grasped by the people at the grassroots of society today. But these elite patriarchal systems, they serve themselves and they commodify and, and maintain their power um, through uh, partnerships with other elite men. And these elite men connect with each other, have control of their women and their children and their families in a hierarchical way. And very much um, the kingship is very much a balance between himself, his palace, and his elites. And that's, that's a lot of what the, the book I was writing was about. Now, these authoritarian kings, they, they do seduce us. And they're, the discovery of their treasures, their gold, their fabulous wealth, their coffins of 269 pounds of solid gold, and we're here on the um, centennial of King Tut's discovery. Um, these things are very much in the news. We don't necessarily question this. We just assume, yes, a king is supposed to have this much gold. Yes, this is something that we will then put into our museums and share with the public. And, and very rarely do we actually bring up the, a critique of the hoarding of all of, these, of all of this excessive wealth in any sort of way beyond the simplistic. So I discuss five kings in the book the good kings. And we'll only be looking at four of them here today. And I have some 14 minutes left. So we'll be flying through. But the book exists in an article in Sapiens or two. Um, an excerpt is in Sapiens. Um, and I wrote an op-ed in Sapiens about this book and the reception thereof. So you can check that out. Um, it was a hot and controversial article. So, so do check out the Sapiens piece on the good kings. But let's jump into um, Khufu, the first and in some ways, the, the most integral of our discussion, and we'll really focus the most on, on Khufu and, and Akhenaten, though Ramses II will, will come into play as well. Now, Khufu's pyramid is usually discussed as something that you build because you can, like Mount Everest is there, that's why you climb it, you climb it because it's there. And I would like to reframe this, and I'm not the first to have done this, this is John Baines who was the first to have done this, but to claim that you build the pyramid because you have to, because you must, because there is a need for a, a reinvestment in the propaganda of kingship. Uh, a re oh, unless, um, if some of you are worried about me using the word propaganda, I myself was skittish about it, but now I've gone all in and I'm using the word propaganda. We can discuss that too. Um, but this pyramid, arguably in the fourth dynasty, not the first, not the second, not the third, it's built in the fourth, this straight-sided pyramid, was built because the kings needed to reinvent themselves. They needed to become something bigger and grander than they had been before. And here you see the three attempts of Khufu's father, Sneferu, starting out with the bent pyramid, at, um, starting out with the, the pyramid at Maidum, then the bent pyramid at Dashur, ending with the first straight-sided pyramid 
in human history, also at Dashur, known as the Red Pyramid. And this is then transformed into Khufu's well-known pyramid. We have Khafre there um, in the center and then Menkaure, the smallest pyramid in the group of three at Giza. And I go into much more um, close examination of the building of these pyramids, the reasons for building them, what they did to society. But um, let's, let's suffice it to say that the pyramid in my estimation is a weapon, an, an ideological weapon of stone. It is a weapon on the mind and it still works very well today, too well, I would say, so that you can turn on the History Channel and you can watch Ancient Aliens and they'll tell you all about how pyramids can be used as electricity generating structures, as um, that, that they are not really burials, that the Atlanteans built them, that aliens built them, all of these different things. And while we may roll our eyes and call these theories racist and all of these things are, are I validate all of them, it, it doesn't, um, discount that if Kufur were looking down today, he would be like, ha, it's still working on their simple minds today, because it very much is. The building of the Great Pyramid was meant to do precisely that. It is meant to make people think that the person who built it, who ordered it, who, who constructed it, is beyond human, is superhuman, that this could not have been built by human hands. And, and what a functional thing that was. However, when Khufu built that pyramid, he, there were unintended consequences in so doing. And every time a king reaches an apex of, of power, let me, it, well, we'll leave it here, there is a fall. And the seeds of the king's destruction or the dynasty's destruction are generally, in my opinion, sown at the very height of power, the most aggrandized, the most opulent, the most over the top. That's when the seeds of destruction are sown. Khufu is building this opulent, over-the-top, extraordinary structure, but in so doing, he must empower elites beyond anything that Egypt has ever seen. And some of those elites are related to him, some are new men, um, and these elites are now in the fourth and fifth dynasties, showing, particularly in the fourth, showing themselves with, with personalities, with their own portraits, something that an Egyptian is not supposed to have that only the king is meant to have. Only the king has a portrait that is recognizable and of a real person. Every other Egyptian gets some bland face X, face Y. You can see this on coffins, you can see it in, in tombs. They're not meant to represent the person. They don't deserve that. Um, this elite empowerment that Khufu creates diminishes his kingship. And if you want, you can read a lot, you can read Solon's engraver on this, that, that his kingship is, is so um, sacralized that he loses his power in the process of building that structure. So this is my point for Khufu, and we're going to move along to Simwasrit the third. I have like one main point for each of these guys, otherwise we'll never, we'll never get out if you're alive. Simwasrit the third is a middle kingdom king, 12th dynasty, and really this is the apex of power of that middle kingdom. And the main point that I wanna make with Simwasrit the third is how to reclaim his power from a number of recalcitrant elites who have gotten too powerful, as long durée result perhaps of Khufu's building of the Great Pyramid, that he builds a new capital. And that capital city is called Ichitawi, um, and, or he, is, he extends a new capital because Amenemhet I, the first king of the 12th dynasty, was the one who started this new capital. But it was Simwasrit III who really cracks down on the elites and makes them come to the new capital. He populates this new capital in a way that it had not been before. These provincial elites had their own fabulous tombs, their own um, outlook on, their, on the world. They were lined up along the, the Egyptian, upper Egyptian landscape, some ostensibly in the Delta, though we have less evidence for them. And they, they show themselves with um, uh, in, in a great stature, very similar to what a king might have. They show, oops, they show themselves with um, private armies in their tombs. And this is something that Samwasrit III is, is done with. The kings before him of the 12th dynasty have tolerated this. He's not going to do it any longer. And as his grim visage shows, he is going to use a carrot and stick approach to get all of these elites to come to his capital. And the, the way that he does this is probably with a combination of threat and cajolery, um, bribery, um, in the same way, I, I would argue 
that they're doing today in, in modern day Cairo with a new purpose built capital. And the same way that Louis Cators did with Versailles. A new capital gets around old systems. It swipes the, the slate clean. It allows a king to have a new starting area. It puts elites on the back foot. They don't have the networks that they used to have before. And it's a, a very useful way for a king to break down old and entrenched power and bring power directly to him. And meanwhile, to, to create a new bureaucratic class that cuts between the elites and the king. The comparison to Louis XIV, Louis XIV, and his construction of Versailles and his turning away from Paris, I think is, is a wonderful one. And it should surprise none of you that in the same way that a couple of generations after Louis XIV, we see the king's head getting cut off in Paris, a couple of generations after Samoasrit III, the very height of his kingship, you see the dynasty utterly collapsing and moving into something of much less distinction than what it was before. Now I have um, some six minutes, which will never do Akhenaten any justice, but will suffice it to say that this king of the 18th dynasty, his contribution to our discussion of authoritarianism is that he changed himself and, and reclaimed an ideology of kingship by changing the religion such that it impacted his kingship and made him bigger than the god in some ways. So he changed his name from Amenhotep IV, moved into the name of Akhenaten, and created a top-down religious imposition of ideological change that was startling, upsetting, disruptive for the Egyptian population. And only an Egyptian king, you could argue, would be allowed to implement such change. If a leader tried to do this in Greece, Rome, Mesopotamia, Syria, I think they would be cut down before they got this far. But in Egypt, which tolerates such authoritarianism, he was able to rule for some 17 years, um, create a, a series of shocking and awe-inspiring statues, build his own new capital that was very similar to his name, Akhenaten for Akhenaten, and create a, a new understanding of divinity, a divinity that as his reign developed, became a kind of monotheism. I would argue the first monotheism um, on the globe. A very debatable point, but um, the texts say it quite clearly that this is the God and a God alone, and you can see him moving towards this. It may not have been that way at the beginning of his reign, but it seems to be his end point, and it's towards the end of his reign when you start to see more iconoclasm as well. Um, this god receives new names. We have no time to discuss those names. Uh, Akhenaten connects himself, his new god, his aggrandized god, because the Aten did exist before, to a new prosperity gospel. And much of his religious display is of wealth. It's of money. It's of food and excess laid out on altars for everyone to see. He shows himself in his window of appearances, which with his wife and children, throwing out golden baubles to his grateful and loyal elite. This is a, a very clear, they're probably the clearest image of political religious co-option that I've ever seen. And yet throughout all of this, we learn from bioarchaeological information that the people who built this new capital were woefully mistreated. And there was a very dirty underbelly to how all of this um, happened. Now, the, the hymn to the Aten um, that he says he created tells us that there is a, a unique God, there is no other beside him. Um, again, the monotheism element is debatable, but I will, um, uh, I've already connected to the, the iconoclasm against Amun Ray in particular, but I will give you a quote from my book um, and I'll read it out loud, which is, I'm not saying that every practicing monotheist is an authoritarianism, is an authoritarian. I am saying that monotheism was specifically invented to support authoritarianism. So that's a, that's a bit of a mic drop moment. You guys can mull over that and we can discuss it in the, in the um, Q&A after. But I connect the, the creation of this kind of um, a loyalty test religion where you're either with him or against him with authoritarianism specifically. Now, there was a, an unintended consequence to all of this change as well, and that was the empowerment of a military, which when the 18th dynasty lineage started to fail after the reign of Tutankhamun, 
quickly snapped up the reins of power and we see a series of what could be arguably called military coups um, moving into the, the palace environment of Egyptian kingship, which brings us for the last two minutes, we'll give him a little bit more, to Ramses II, whose family is of mercenary origin. And he, he tells us this outright. There's a well-known stela damage, but it's called the 400-year stela, which talks about the mercenary origins, the, the military origins, general origins of his family from the Northeast Delta, maybe even Levantine origins of this family, um, arguably an immigrant family uh, coming into Egypt uh, as soldiers, as generals, and then moving into very high positions of power. His father, Seti I, um, connects himself to arguably Levantine gods. His name, Seti, is Seth which is uh, akin to Baal in the Levantine system, a very unusual name for a king to have, particularly a king that's supposed to be um, the son of Osiris. And of course, Osiris was murdered by his brother, Seth. I'm not saying that Seth was evil, but it's not something that is as clearly associated with kingship as it does become in the Ramesid period when we see many more images of Seth than we saw before. War making is the income here. And my main, if we're going to give each king a contribution, like a one word little phrase, the phrase for Ramses II and Seti I before him is populism. This is a king who is using a um, military base, in some cases a temple base of lower elites to cut through his um, balance of power between the high elites and himself. It, it's also connected to a great deal of, of nepotism. Um, this, I think, would be the, the system, this and a little bit of Akhenaten thrown in for fun, would be the system that we connect with most, I think, in our current uh, political regimes around the globe. Ramses II and Seti I, his father, they claimed this kingship ideolo ideologically. They had to work very carefully building temples at Abydos, the ground zero of kingship, to do so. Uh, they they chose different ways of presenting their kingship. And Ramses II in particular chose quantity over quality. He built everywhere that he could. When you go to Egypt as a tourist today, it often feels like the Ramses the Great show. Uh, because of the amount that he reused, he was able to build quickly and cheaply. He could take the statue of another king, reshape the face, reshape the chest, Re redo the inscription and boom, another colossal added to the list. And this was done in temples and, and religious spaces all over Egypt. And by doing that, he created a celebrity kingship, a kingship that, that drew the common man to him, that created a base of incredibly loyal followers who were not loyal to a patriarch of their own in their homelands, but were loyal to their king, to their fearless leader, to their warrior, who used war and campaigns to bring spoils back to that loyal base and to, to build a system that would soon eat itself <laughs> from the inside out. Um, this is a king who engaged in subterfuge and fake news like, like we do today. So that the Battle of Kadesh, which resulted in the first documented peace treaty in all of global history, which was certainly a draw at best and a failure at worst, he presents as a mission accomplished, ab absolute achievement that he personally saved the day. Only he could have fixed the problem of Kadesh. And he represents this big lie, if you like, all over Egypt and all of his um, most monumental temples. This is, this is something I think we can really associate with today. The populism um, connects him to places where his military base would go such as this temple at Abu Simbel near the, the second cataract um, in, in Egypt. And of course, any sort of populism seems to depend on nepotism as well, which is an interesting connection I have yet to explore more. But Ramses II was the first to openly show his sons, to openly show his daughters, to name them, to give them platforms of their own power. Again, the seeds of destruction are shown at the, mo at the apex of the wave, right before it crests. And in my opinion, this is one of those seeds of the destruction because 
it will, and this is the tomb of Ramses II's sons to give you an idea of the kind of nepotism and, and openly named power brokers we're playing with. But the aftermath of Ramses II's kingship is a, a seething wound of different power players, of hundreds of different power players competing with one another, sons, grandsons, and great grandsons of this great Ramses II, all vying for power. And so it is no surprise that you see Egypt breaking into twain and a civil war developing between different relatives of Ramses the Great. So there we are. That's, that's the end of it. And it's 1203, my, my goodness. Um, but you can, you can see that my final point is that um, the authoritarianism in my view in the world is alive and well. Each time an authoritarian grows, they sow the seeds of their own destruction, they fall, but it is rebuilt in a bigger form each and every time. We continue to do this. We are no different from the ancient Egyptians. We keep going. The difference in my opinion, and the last chapter of my book is about this, is that the earth is not getting bigger along with us and there is a hard out in terms of climate change and climate devastations around the globe in which this kind of growth, this patriarchal growth, hoarding and monopolization of resources cannot be sustained. It, it won't continue if the human race wants to have its own continuance. And I will leave it there on that, on that happy note. Um, well, thank you. Dr. Cooney, thank you so much. I have to say I am deeply impressed that you only overran by three minutes because I normally <laughs> go I normally go a lot more and I'm never covering as much as you just covered. So many congratulations. That was masterfully done. Um, for people who are watching, if you have questions for Dr. Cooney, we do now have a Q&A session. You can put them in any chat of any platform that you are currently watching on. They are being aggregated and relayed to me. And I will ask Dr. Kahuni as many as we can get through in the time that we have. We can go till what? 3.15, so we are, we're we just gonna go for it. Um, so you spoke about elite empowerments and the dis diminishment of kingship following that the empowerment of those elites. Um, I was wondering if you saw a corollary in American politics at the moment. Have we reached the point where the diminishment is, is going to happen or do you think it, we're not there yet? Oh, we, we have our elite kings. When, when a single person can be worth 300, over $300 billion, and I'm talking about Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, then you, you don't need to put that person into political power and call them a king. But what do you call somebody like that? How do you understand it? Um, how can, and, and yet with that $300 billion in the, in the ownership of that one person, we still have an ideology of don't tax me that benefits him more than anybody else. So I think that, yes, indeed, we are reaching that point, but I don't know if we've reached the top of it yet. Um, it is the most embellished, aggrandized, opulent period. We are sowing the seeds now. Uh, what, what that will actually be, um, we can all debate. So yes. Okay. Um, we have a question. Um, would Akhenaten, do you think, be considered the worst or most dictatorish um, despotic pharaohs? Um, I think that there's the most evidence for that because Akhenaten, he, we have the blessing of this capital that he created that was only inhabited for a decade. And then it was bricked up and everyone left. And yes, while they may have destroyed some things or carted away other stones, things were left in a rather pristine condition so that you can go there as an archeologist and you can dig up the bodies as, as many bioarchaeologists bio have done. And, and you're able to see the conditions that people were working in, in cemeteries that were set aside for laborers. And those bioarchaeologists, and I'm trying to remember a name um, right now and it's not coming to my, my head. Um, we all, if I remember it, I'll, I'll bring it up. But they've found a graveyard of children separated from parents who show the same uh, stress fractures, acute trauma, um, long-term stress um, trauma, malnutrition, that show the same conditions, work camp-like conditions that the adults were in. And you wonder how, how does that work? I don't think that any DNA analysis is, has been done. How would you even do it to determine if people are Egyptians or not Egyptians? Um, that, that, that gets really tricky with uh, DNA in Egypt as it is. What you can say is that this regime depended on an empowerment of elites and uh, corruption within that and, and a breaking of, of um, patronage contracts such that 
elites were given large amounts of wealth to do with as they want, to skim off the top as they wanted, but without social contracts that that were functioning over a long term because everyone's plopped into a new place, the abuses are able to, to mount pretty quickly. And people did indeed abuse their power and mistreat those who built that city. Um, so I would say that he's certainly the most hated and reviled afterwards as well. That adds to this reputation of being, as you say, the most despotic of the of the pharaohs. Um, so I'll, I'll go with that as well. I think he's he was uh, much more ideologically driven and less clever in some ways. But what Akhenaten did has certainly lasted with us to this day. Um, it's something that I think lay dormant, but was was around. People discussed. It was talked about so that it could be picked up by some hill country kingship and a bunch of priests who, de who were dedicated to Yahweh. And given the connections between Egypt and the Levant and how close those connections were, I don't think saying something like that is, um, is that mad. Though, though I, am, I know there's very little evidence for it, except for some Psalms that have very similar phrases from the hymn to the Aten to biblical Psalms. But for me, that's, those connections are pretty, um, are pretty clear. And it's interesting to see how how that religious power can be inviolable and can be used so, so cleverly to this very day, as I, as I sit in the United States, that is, you know, that, that many people want to turn back to Christian nationalism yeah. like, like that. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, so someone is saying that the idea of Egyptian gods, uh, G Egyptian kings being gods in flesh is new to them. And it's interesting. And they were wondering uh, how much you, think and it's a difficult question to get a, a, a like a true answer to but how much you think uh people believed and bought into this idea that the kings were actually gods how much the kings themselves actually believed that yeah we can look at this again and this is a way that we keep our modern modern exceptionalism and tell ourselves our, our myths and, and keep our own innocence is by saying, oh, we would never do such simple things. But the Egyptians were very clever about how they did this. They didn't claim to be a great god like Osiris or Amun-Re until after their death. They were not a netcher a a they were a netcher nefer They were a good god. They were, they were something that was in human flesh that was, that was, um, uh, meant to die and would die at some time, but they were of the gods in a sense. So there were all kinds of mythologies to, to make this work. And then there were all kinds of ways to reify this. For, for instance, if, um, if you have a good economy, we still do this as part of what's in, in the book, that we use tell ourselves prosperity gospels all the time, that if the economy fails, who do we blame it on? The president. Did the president make the price of milk double? Probably not. Maybe. I, mm, how connected is that? But we in our simple human minds connect our own economic well-being with that of our kings. Egyptian prosperity from its Nile was more plentiful than a rain-fed agriculture in Mesopotamia or Greece or Rome. And it was easier for Egyptian kings to say, you see this plentiful Nile, I did that. I made this temple, I did the offerings. And those other kings, when the Nile wasn't working, they didn't do the offerings right. You know what, he would be right. Because when the Nile's not working, you have what's called a third intermediate period or a second intermediate period, when there's civil war and all hell is breaking loose and the kings can't build any temples. And so the king is able to say, you see, with your own eyes, when, it's, when I'm doing it right, you benefit. And everyone's like, you know what, king, it's so true. And so we end up telling ourselves these, these mythologies, I, in the same, I was just telling my husband today, it's like, um, you know, you'll put minority students in the United States in schools with less funding and then claim that they don't work hard enough. They just don't work those people and it's ingrained and in part of their bodies. And that's how you reify racism and, and, and keep that going for hundreds of years in the United States. Whereas if we distributed that money and made those schools better, you wouldn't be able to necessarily say that anymore. So there's all kinds of ways of using money ideology, building, monumentality to, to make those claims and to reify it in people's eyes. People are clever and yet not at the same time, um, but, you, but you can work with that. So. Thank you. And, and kind of related to that, um, someone's asking why you think Americans would maybe disagree that the USA could be argued to be in like an authoritarian regime <laughs> like Egypt. Well, like, what do they uh, think the difference is? 
yeah, I wonder what country you come from, but you're not here. And all you have to do is, you know, go to some place. I grew up in Texas. You know, I was, I'm just reading an article in the New York Times about the, the Republican Party in Arizona. Um, it's it's um, very easy to be a part of this authoritarianism and to yet tell yourself that you're not an authoritarianism, authoritarian. It is very, very easy. And uh, I would quote James Baldwin here very loosely by saying that white patriarchal, white supremacist patriarchal America has been able to maintain its innocence, that's his word, his innocence, by claiming that they are doing um, what is God given, they're bringing Christianity to people, they are bringing prosperity, they're bringing jobs, they are, they are doing all of these things that are right and good and necessary, they are working against um, aberrant sexualities, they're saving babies from abortion, all of these things are taking precedence over the authoritarianism and all of these moral ideologies are obscuring the the actual power grab the authoritarian power play and it's very hard for people to see what's actually going on um so i'll, I'll leave it there but um I, I don't think these things are only happening in the united states i know they are happening in other countries but um it's it's quite easy for for somebody who finds themselves suddenly in the white minority and not believed to be the kind caretaker of their people or the good and noble Christian anymore, they're going to push back harder than they, than they had before, which is why in this moment, we find ourselves, in my opinion, in the United States on the cusp of a, a cold civil war right now, um, written but with different laws in different states, different taxes, different, different codes, different cultures um, that could soon become hot, that civil war. Um, but uh, there, there's this civil war and these differences of opinion are all led through ideology. They're all led through belief. And that is where Egypt helps us the most. How do you get people to believe that you are the good king rather than see behind the curtain that you are the authoritarian? You have to tell them that, that story instead. And this actually leads perfectly onto our next question, which I'm afraid everyone will be our last because we have run out of time. But who then has the authority over ideology in ancient Egypt? Is it the pharaoh or is it the temple priests and priestesses? This is a wonderful question and I love it. And I, I hit up upon that many times in the book, but it is a combination of both. It can't just be one top down situation in the same way that that in with authoritarian personalities and leadership around the world, you must rely on your elite who are directly benefiting from the system that you are giving them. And those elites are generally going to be the, the most pious believers of the ideology that, that you are selling because they benefit from it so much and they see it's God-given power. So it's, um, it's like you could look at Ramses II. I'll just give this one example and then we can, we can end this. <laughs> but Ramses II, during his reign, uh, you see the publication of a number of underworld books that were not visible before. You see the book of earth, you see the book of the heavenly cow and the reign of his father, you see the book of, of day and night, um, book of caverns, all of these underworld books that were not there previously. The king is not sitting down and creating this ideology himself. He is depending upon a group of intellectuals to create this ideology for him. He then decides how and where to publish it. And he does this um, in temples as well, not with those sacred books, but with other things and publishes things that had not been previously published before to mix things up, to keep people on their toes, but also to um, allow a lower elite bureaucratic group to create ideology that cuts into the patronage that the upper elite was providing. So this, this um, creation of ideology can work one set of elites against one another. Um, th that's, a, that's a bold statement that I've made, but I would argue it's a dissertation that could be written um, with some very careful analysis. And I will, I will leave it there. There yeah. we have it, folks. If you're interested in this particular dissertation topic, Dr. Cooney is at UCLA and is taking applications. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Please do not. We, we take up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again. This was an absolute delight. Um, and we will say goodbye and I will move on to uh, our next and I believe almost final session of the day. So Dr. Cooney, thank you. Thank you. Take care.
So our next session is session five, reinterpretations of leadership. And we will be starting with Massimi, I'm sorry, Massimo De Sanctis Mangeli. I'm sorry if I mangled your name, um, who is a PhD student in classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania. In the past, he worked with tragic fragments and published an interpretation of a fragment from Aeschylus uh, Edonians. Recently, he has been dealing with an application of political theory to Greek tragedy in the analysis of the tragic tyrant. Other interests of Massimo include power and power dynamics in Herodotus and the memory of the Roman Republic in the early Roman Empire. The title of his presentation is Finding Refuge with the Enemy, Implications of the Giving King in Herodotus. So Massimo, do we have you with us? Yes, yes I'm here. beautiful, thank you very much. Thank you, Megan, for this introduction, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. And it's a pleasure. It has been so many interesting talks so far, and I'm really looking forward to delivering this paper to you and to like hearing your your thoughts, of course. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's the title of my presentation. And so before going to the paper itself, I just wanted to spend like 30 seconds on context. Um, just, just to give you this, like, again, uh, this context for like one minute. And so basically, I just wanted to point out that I'm, this, this paper, this talk is going to be dealing with the Persian Wars and the account of the Persian Wars in Herodotus. But you should be reminded that whenever we, we deal with the Persian Wars, and the Persians in general, actually, I'm not going to deal, going to be dealing with wars a lot. But whenever we are dealing with Persians in Herodotus, we're going to have to be reminded of two different times. So one time is the time of the histories, the narrative that Herodotus covers, which is for the wars, from like basically the, the whole of it. But then we should always be reminded that he writes all this stuff, like at least 50 years later, around 430, and a lot of things had happened in the meantime. And he's probably, he probably writes for like Athenians in Athens. So always be reminded that there is like a filter between like what actually happened and his own time. But moving on, um, in this paper, I will investigate a cluster of passages in book six of the histories to bring out the implication of Herodotus' portrayal of the great king, of the Persian great king, as su surprisingly benevolent towards his subject his subjects. I first show that these episodes, when taken together, form a pattern which emphasizes Darius's magnanimity and generosity towards Greeks whenever the latter are brought to his presence, although the context suggests we might have expected a punishment. Indeed, verbal repetition and a generally similar sequence of events link all those episodes and encourage us to look at these events as particularly meaningful, at least for Herodotus. But why are these scenes significant then? It has been suggested that episodes of this sort show that Herodotus aligns with the conception of the great king as the universal ruler, prone to wrath and to mercy alike, always reaffirming that the kingdom is his to dispose of. That Herodotus was well aware of the Near Eastern ideology of universal kingship is arguably true. Less of a concern though has been the reading of those same passages in light of the role um, in light of the role of the king's subject here, namely the Greeks. In fact, Darius's beneficence towards his Greek subjects in these passages is part of a pattern of the general good treatment the Greeks received at the great king's court, a theme which runs through the whole of the histories. For the Greeks pervade the Erosian narrative even when it is focused on Persia, and the privileges granted to them are often both disproportionate and telling. In this paper, I will attempt a reading which focuses on Herodotus' audience and contemporary political issues. In particular, I will try to show that the magnificent Persian king was a way for Herodotus to hint at the attractive power of Persia, which affected several Greek figures who were active during the Pentecost idea, whom Herodotus refers to, or has in mind, in the course of the histories. For Persia continued to be a force to be reckoned with down to Herodotus' own time, and continued medizing was likely the clearest threat to the Panhellenic political project. In fact, recent scholarship has shown that the closeness between Greece and Persia, and particularly between Athens and Persia, was a theme running beneath the surface of the histories and a major political concern of Herodotus', Herodotus own time. 
So in the first of this set of passages at 620, Herodotus is describing the aftermath of the capture of Miletus by the Persians. This involved a quite crude deportation of the Milesians to suicide to the presence of the great King Darius. There, Herodotus says, what you've got here in, in the PowerPoint, but the King Darius, having done no other evil to them, settled them next to the sea called Red in the city of Amphis. It is perhaps expected for Darius not to do any further harm to a people who have just become subject to his own will. Nonetheless, being reminded of the many episodes of gratuitous cruelty perpetrated by former Persian kings, I was somehow surprised by Darius's magnanimity here. Also, I think the particle de in Greek has maintained its original adversity force and therefore suggests that the following statement is somehow unexpected in light of what has just been said. This doing no harm on Darius's part has at least three other equivalents in the same book. In the context of episodes that bear at the same time many resemblances and differences to this one. Following not the chronological order of the episodes as they appear in the book, but rather the level of unexpectedness Herodotus elicits in Darius' benevolence towards his subjects, I now want to mention 619, namely the stories of the Eritreans captured and brought to Darius' presence as a consequence of the expedition of Darius and Artaphernes. The two Persian commanders bring the Eritreans to Susa. Here, Herodotus first explicitly mentions that Darius used to cultivate a significant hatred the non Holon towards them since they were the first among the non-Ionians, he implies, to begin hostilities against the Persian empire. This notwithstanding, when he has them in his own hands, epete de however when, he does no further evil to them. In Greek, epoise kakon alo uden. Not only then does Herodotus here describe a situation analogous to that of the Milesians, where he seems to challenge the expectation of his listeners slash readers of a possible further punishment, of Darius's subjects. He does so using the exact same words. Those very words occur once again in the same book in a similar context, within the micro story of a Greek individual, Metiochus, son of Miltiades. At 641, Herodotus tells us that the Phoenicians fail in an attempt to capture Miltiades, but they manage to capture one of his ships, captained by his son Metiochus. The Phoenicians, as soon as they realized that he was a son of Miltiades, brought him at the king's present. They did so, Herodotus notices, quote, in the hope to obtain significant gratitude, end quote, since Miltiades was the one who encouraged the Ionians to cut the bridge on the Danube to the king's detriment, at least in Herodotus' own narrative. However, as soon as he contemplates Metiochus, he doesn't, he doesn't do any further harm to, harm to him. Again, Herodotus uses the exact same phrase to give the exact same image, as Darius does not do any harm to Metiochus. But here we have more, since the great king actually benefits Metiochus significantly by granting him a house, a possession, most likely in the form of land, and a Persian woman whose children had the privilege of being counted among the Persians. We don't know what happened to the Phoenicians who brought him, but it seems ironic that the only one to be rewarded here is Darius's former enemy. I conclude this section of my paper with Herodotus 630, namely the passage that deals with the death of Isaeus. After he is captured by Artaphernes and Harpagus, Herodotus puts forth a theory of what would have happened differently had his theus been brought to Darius. And that, that's it. Not surprisingly, we could say, Herodotus states that in his opinion, his theus, quote, would have suffered no harm. Notice that this is the same construction found in the first three passages cited, with the only change being that of the main verb from poieo to pascho, in accordance with the shifting of the subject from Darius to Hestios. But Hestios's fate turns out to be different since Artaphernes and Harpagus impale him on the spot, quote, fearing that he might become once again influential with the great king, end quote. Then they embalm his head and send only that to Darius. At this, the great king reproaches them for not having brought Hestios to his presence and then gives a worthy burial to his head, quote, as belonging to a great benefactor, both to himself and to the Persians, end quote. This is again striking, since Herodotus clearly presents Hysteus as one of the main instigators of the Ionian revolt, and one who deceived the Greek king out of the hope of going back to Ionia. What makes Darius's benevolence even more significant here is that this implies a strong tension between the, within the imperial system of power, since obviously the Sadar Artaphrenes had very different ideas about how to deal with that fugitive. 
The text simply says that Darius accused both Aerophrenes and Arpagus, but the imbalance is nonetheless significant. To judge from the similar sequence of event which links those episodes, and from the usage of the same sequence of words to describe Darius's generosity, I believe that these scenes constitute what Imervar calls narrative patterning, in which Herodotus uses repetitions to link various episodes together into narrative units out of which he created a large unified work. Such displays of generosity by the great king in the histories have generally been interpreted as simply reflecting an oriental narrative centered around the munificence of the great king. In particular, several studies have paused on the great king's notorious behavior of pondering good versus bad deeds when it came to deal with prisoners. However, I believe the focus can be shifted to the recipients of Darius's benefits in our passages when one realizes that they are all Greeks and from other Herodotian passages it is clear that Greeks in Herodotus were granted a special place within the Persian system of power. Individuals like the physician Demosidus, the diviner Onomacritus, or some Greek generals from the islands in the Persian fleet occupy center stage in the narrative as close associates to the great king. The consistency with which these Greeks are spared, well-treated and even rewarded is indeed striking. Thus, the passages in book six that we employ to open the discussion are perfectly in accordance with what happens elsewhere in the histories, notwithstanding the initial element of surprise, given the nature of the context in which they appear. The Greek centrism of the histories emerges here with extreme clarity. Herodotus' own audience must have inspired him to a larger role and the treatment granted to Greeks in Persia, as Brian notes. In relation to narrative patterning, many scholars, such as Fornara, have shown that Herodotus tended to use certain narrative strategies to hint at events that extend beyond the time of the histories proper, namely those developments that a contemporary audience might have considered as politically relevant. Therefore, Herodotus' continuous attention to this aspect of the Greek-Persian relationship could have further implications if we consider another time, namely not that of the histories, but Herodotus' own, asking how this Persian benevolence towards Greeks might have functioned in the narrative of a text written and performed at Athens during the Pentecon Thetia. In the last section of my paper, I propose that by means of these narratives of Greeks who are benefited by the great king, Herodotus anticipates the vicissitudes of some other Greeks of his own time who ended up medizing and encourages his audience to draw these parallels. In so doing, Herodotus could also suggest what it was that rendered the very acts of medizing alluring namely that it granted a life of luxury and political relevance under a benevolent king. For Herodotus could use the Persian trajectory from heart to self-culture as a warning to the Greeks themselves, as exemplified by the story of Posenius. Also, he could, he could silently offer a critical evaluation of Medizing as a form of Persian conquest alternative to the use of brute force, which was still fully at work even when force failed. This model of thinking allows us to appreciate further developments in the Herodotian narrative that might have escaped us in the, for, in, in the first place. That the Samians, for instance, were notorious throughout the fifth century for their attempts at medizing seems to be reflected in the consistency with which Herodotus depicts them as having power and prestige at the court of the great king. A certain, a certain Silicon, a Samian, is presented as being the first Greek ever rewarded by Darius in narrative sequence that stresses once again what we might call the unexceptional exceptionality. And you, you have this passage here. And who is this Greek benefactor to whom I owe thanks? Since I just had the kingship, either one Greek or no one has come to our place and have no debt towards any Greek man. Guess what? He's going to have a debt with this one and he's going to reward him. The same is true for the passages in book six we use as a springboard to our discussion. If that is really granted to the capture Eritian some benefits, Artaxerxes could have made similar concessions to the same people who tried to medize in 453 as testified by epigraphy. It is not impossible, though difficult to demonstrate, that those Eritreans heard from their fellow countrymen in Persia. Revolts and civil strife in the late 50s are attested in the case of Miletus as well. And though no Persian agency is explicitly mentioned, it is perfectly possible that charges of medizing, true or alleged, were made in order to get rid of political adversaries. But it is mostly with benefits granted to individuals that Herodotus seems to develop this model of hinting at later outcomes. 
If we, will, if we go back to Matthias, we may notice that some elements of his trajectory could remind the Herodian audience of that of later figures. That he was given a Persian woman as a wife can help but remind us of one of Pausanias' requests as he approaches the great king. In a letter he allegedly composed and which was recorded by Thucydides in 128.7. Pausanias, sovereign of Sparta, sends you this man. Um, Having captured them in war, wants to please you, and I propose to agree to marry your daughter and to make Sparta and the rest of Greece subject to you. I think I'm able to achieve this if you support me. If they like these conditions, send a faithful man to see through whom we may negotiate our terms in the future. Here, Pausanias grants the king that he would make Sparta subject to Persia. More interestingly, he asks for the privileges, privilege of marrying Xerxes' own daughter. That request will obviously not be satisfied, but is nonetheless indicative of Pausanias' willingness to become a real Persian. In fact, later on in the Archaeologia, Thucydides describes Pausanias' entrance at Byzantium, quote, in a Median dress, attended by a bodyguard of Medes and Egyptians, keeping a Persian table, end quote. That Herodotus was also interested in Pausanias' sudden change of attitude towards Persia is proven by a passage in Book 9, whose ironical reading seems inescapable. There, Pausanias admires the splendor of Mardonius' own tent, as he orders two meals to be prepared, one in the fashion of Persians and the other of Spartans. He then commands, Men of Greece, I gather you here for this reason, since I wanted to show you the foolishness of this leader of the Persians, who, having such a way of living, came against us who have such a miserable one to deprive us of this. Pausanias' thoughts about the foolishness of Mardonius betrays him as an admirer of Persian luxury. This is another example where the time frame of the histories proper did not allow Herodotus to fully describe later developments concerning a historical figure, though it didn't prevent him from living hints. Like Pausanias, Metiochus is the embodiment of the everlasting possibility for Greeks to be corrupted by Eastern wealth and luxury. A similar pattern can be observed if we consider the Herodian treatment of the figure of Isaias. We underline the grip the Herodian Hestias apparently still held on Darius to the point that it clearly created a tension between Darius himself and his Persian subjects, who evidently consider him as a rival. The exceptionality of the role of Hestias within the court hierarchy must have reminded an Athenian audience of what had happened to Themistocles, whose presence at the great king, the great king's court, was so prominent that in Pulitzer's works, Quote, he became hateful to those in, pie, in power. For the honors he enjoyed were nothing alike those of other foreigners, but he joined the king in hunts and in the household hobby so that he used to see the king's mother and became familiar with her. And when the king ordered, he even listened to the words of the magi. His honor exceeded those usually granted to foreigners. Notice in particular the reference to his familiarity with the king's mother as another case of a Persian woman being mentioned as the final proof that someone has become a real Persian. The popularity of Themistocles' story makes it likely that Herodotus wanted to present Hestios as another lesser known Themistocles with the close relations and influence he had over the great king to the point of eliciting jealousy in the satraps. Another feature which links Hestios to Themistocles is their common role as political representatives of Persia in strategic places at the border between the two worlds. For Persia's alluring power consisted not only in the wealth that being a member of such a splendid court could give, but also in the political centrality Persian kings could grant to their Greek advisors. As Brian notes, the historical reality seems to suggest that even though the great king used Greek representatives consistently, this was mainly for the relations they maintained with the Greek cities. This is, again, something that Herodotus never fails to notice. Hystasis' political power in a place of strategic importance is evident, but one must notice that elsewhere Herodotus is still consistent in hinting at the roles of these first order Greeks as recipients of land grants, either as proper tyrants or as simple administrators. Many of these figures, like Demaratos and Hippias, were politically dead in their homeland and looked for rehabilitation in Persia. Among the later figures whom Herodotus touches only tangentially, the same fate belongs to the aforementioned Pausanias and Themistocles, who perfectly exploit the charge of medicine directed at them to make a good impression on the great king. Another figure who sees Persia as a perfect opportunity for a political springboard after his previous failure is Alcibiades, who, after a brief but intense stay in Persia, manages to acquire once again a predominant role in Athenian politics. Therefore, 
It seems a strong possibility that Herodotus used the great king's benevolence towards Greeks as a way of addressing the issue of constant flow of, of this constant flow of individuals and peoples in Persia. Um, the image of the merciful, the image of the merciful king, encompassed all the stories of Greeks in Persia, while at the same time standing as a symbol of all the benefits that were open to any Greek who wished, who wished to change sides. Clearly, this also meant a much more subtle threat to the stability of the Greek war than that posed by open war. Herodotus seems to suggest that Persia could still conquer Greece by incorporating its inhabitants within the Persian borders with the prospect of a life of luxury and or political relevance. In this paper, I used four episodes in Herodotus book six as a case study for analyzing what could lie beneath Herodotus' presentation of Persian great kings as being extremely generous towards Greeks. I moved the focus from the om omnipotent king of the Persian narrative to considering these passages as being part of a Greek narrative, mainly intended for a Greek audience of the second half of the fifth century, where Persia was ideologically reframed, reframed and made dangerously closer to Greece and Athens. In fact, I observed that the given king was an embodiment of Persia's alluring power towards Greeks and that those who benefit from him might recall other more significant figures who, in the course of the Pentagon Tithia, turned to the king and obtained privilege, privileges in the form both of simple prestige and political relevance. And these are the main works I quoted. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you guys. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was uh, very interesting. Um, we don't have any audience questions just yet. Um, so everyone, if you do have a question for Massimo, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will move on to the next person. I did want to ask um, something that I run into a lot with Herodotus as a, an Assyriologist is maybe the lack of accuracy, let's say, for dealing with foreign cultures. Um, do you think he is more reliable for ref as a reflection of, of Greek views, um, both of, of themselves and, and then of the cultures that they come into contact with? More reliable, like in general? Um, I, 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 do you, yeah, do you think he, what he says about Persians maybe reflects more what the Greeks think of Persians rather than what Persians themselves would maybe describe as themselves? So yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. It recently, like it has been shown that Herodotus used Persian sources a lot as well. So obviously there is this conflict that it's obviously difficult to determine exactly how much like, okay, this is Persian, this is Greek. Like, I, I think that's almost an impossible exercise. The, he wasn't just interested in Persia. He had material from those places. What, what I would like to say though, is that I really believe in the, in a sense, in the direct or in indirect capacity of the audience of orientating how you tell something, how you present a material. So even though, like, obviously, Herodotus tried to gather sources from all over the world, of course, he spoke, he spoke with Egyptian priests and so on and so forth. I believe that especially when Greeks were more or less concerned he tried, I don't, want, I don't want to say that he tried to give them what they wanted, but he tried to, at least as, as he tried to show, to enlarge the role of Greeks there. So in, in a sense, it's not even true that he was more faithful whenever it, it came to the Greeks, because I mean, the Greeks were, in a sense, they were always there. And, but, but, but I mean, in this respect, it's like, it, it, it's just difficult to tell. But yes, I, I think it's, instead of saying what faithful versus not faithful, we might want to reframe the question like, People should like, it's, it's likely, it's legitimate to think that like those people, those audience, like had to be interested in what he, in what he was saying, not only in terms of like, this is just a good story, I wanna hear that. And especially whenever, he, I don't even, even wanna say whenever he got there, but even when he came close to dealing with some affair, affairs that we might, might wanna call like, like that deal with politics, like whenever something like came close to Athenian ideology, for example, for example, I don't want to say that he was just like uh, the mouthpiece of that, but at least mm -hmm. that he was reflective of that. But reflective of the ideology of Greece, that, and especially of Athens, that was developing in those years. And, 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 and that is where this whole argument falls. I mean, this whole like, 
openness of Persia was like of like Herodotus wanted to ring a bell in, in, in the spectators. Like, I mean, Persia is still there. It's not that since I'm telling this story and we defeated them, it's over. It's kind of like it's it's something that we still like we still see. Wonderful. Thank you. That's an excellent and very full answer. Um, we don't have any audience questions, so uh, I will let you go and we can move on to our next presenter. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter is Brian Kinsbrunner. Uh, Brian is an experienced spiritual care chaplain with over, over 15 years of experience working in senior care and hospice. He's a board certified chaplain and recently completed his two year term as president of the NAGC, NAJC, uh, Neshama Association of Jewish Chaplains. Brian has uh, ordination from Yeshiva University and spent his career closely working with people on areas of spirituality, grief, loss and transition. He is passionate about helping others discover their authentic spiritual selves. Brian currently runs a private coaching practice, New Beginnings Spiritual Coaching and Consulting, LLC. His uh, title of his topic, uh, the title of his talk today is Are They Divine or Are They Human? Reading the Biblical Characters Through the Eyes of the Talmudic Rabbis. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Megan, and thank you to the conference organizers, and thank you everybody who is uh, participating in this conference. Um, I've actually really been enjoying the last two days of delving into a different area than my professional life, which is really playing which is in the realm of spirituality and coming into this world of scholarship again. Um, I'm gonna share my screen in just one second here for all of you. And let me give you a little bit of my thinking as we get started here. So we've been talking a lot about leaders and leadership and one of the fundamental areas and questions that so many of us, I think, grapple with is the question of how do we see leadership in relationship to areas of good living, morality, and so on? And I think that in relationship to ancient studies, this question becomes very relevant, as we heard in our keynote just a little while ago, and in the topic at hand here, is these leader, the leaders of the past were always put, were very much put on a pedestal. And if we look at their lives, we struggle with the question of why are they on a pedestal when their lives weren't exactly um, of the most moral character, or maybe they were. And when it comes to spirituality, religion, faith, and the development of Western culture, if you will, Western civilization, especially in, the, in a Judeo-Christian context, this becomes an even greater question. And what we're going to look at here in the time that we have is really the question of how do we read the stories of the Bible? And how specifically did the Talmud, did the rabbis read some of these of the Talmud period, read the stories of the Bible in relationship to the characters? And the reason that this becomes important is if this book is something that's supposed to be time immemorial or presumably time immemorial, and here we are in 2022 still looking in this book as a place of inspiration, what do we do when the characters that we read about don't seem to be living up to that, to, to the persona of a person who is supposed to be receiving the word of God, for example, a prophet, or, or being an exemplar or the beginning of a, an entire nation. And part of where my thinking took me to was the question of when the Talmudic corpus was being put into, was being written down and it was being debated over the course of those few hundred years from um, let's say 200 to 500 and even going back before because some of those interpretations go further back. What are they thinking about as they're saying these things? And there's a lot of material. I'm gonna deal with just a couple of areas. Um, one being a little bit about Abraham and Jacob. Of course, Abraham, we still use, we still talk about him today in political terms, right? The Abraham Accords in the in the Middle East that we that we have going on currently between Israel and some of the uh, Middle Eastern nations, for example. Abraham is right there because he's considered the forefather of multiple nations. Well, how did the rabbis understand him in relationship to the Bible? And 
his grandson Jacob, there's a particular th- uh, story, an issue with his life that is ultimately the result of how they interpret one of the interpretations that they give him. The other two topics are going to be is the question of why do human beings die and why did the great leaders of that time die? And we'll see what that looks like as well. And then number three is this whole section, which I'm not going to get too deep into because of time constraints. There's a whole Talmudic discourse about the question of if you say so-and-so sinned, well, then you made a mistake, not not that they actually made the mistake. Um, And we will see all three of those as we go through the and keep in mind, there are myriads of other ways that one could approach the subject. Uh, there's actually a whole genre of educational literature that's been written about over the past 30, 40 years. Um, how do you teach these characters to middle schoolers, high schoolers? Areas that I think um, oftentimes get thrown into the, get subsumed under the guise of religious education, but I think are important for scholarship as well as we look back and try to do some comparative work. To begin with, there's a Talmudic statement in, so most of the Talmudic statements I have, actually all the Talmudic statements I have are from the Babylonian Talmud, um, which is the more, which is considered to be the more um, refined Talmudic uh, source. And this one is a question about Abraham. Oh, sorry, I went, went ahead. We know the Torah, the way that the, Bible describes that the Torah was given at Mount Sinai many generations after Abraham's life. However, the rabbis reading some of the anomalies that come up in the story, for example, um, it says, it, it describes how when the, after the angels came to visit Abraham to give him the promise of the blessing of a son, they went to the city of Sodom and they went there and were served matzah, presuming that it was Passover and presuming that there's some sort of that they were celebrating this holiday, of course, which was completely anachronistic to the time. So the rabbis reading a bunch of those verses suggest that Abraham, our patriarch, fulfilled the entire Torah. And there's another passage that expands that not just Abraham, but all the ancestors up until Moses are following the entire Torah. And it even goes so far as to suggest that they're following laws that were only established centuries and centuries later. So we see in this first source that Abraham, our patriarch, fulfilled the entire Torah before it was given. As it said in um, in, Gen- in Genesis, because Abraham hearkened to my voice and kept my charge, my mitzvot, my statutes, and my Torahs. And so there's a debate well, about, didn't he just fulfill the seven Noahite laws, which are these laws that some consider to be the natural laws, don't murder, don't steal, and so on or they're considered to have been the laws that were given to Noah for the basic building block of the world. And then Abraham's law, the laws of Moses, the Mosaic laws were given later for the entire world. Anyways, the point being that, but he followed circumcision, which presumably is a Torah Mosaic commandment. Oh, so say he followed that in circumcision, but ultimately it says, no, he followed everything. My Torah, which implies the entire Torah. Now I bring this up for two reasons. Number one, it puts a heavier burden on the ancestry than a reader of the text in a very literal sense would necessarily want to put on. And it opens the door to pointing fingers at the later generation, specifically Jacob, because we know that Jacob marries two sisters and right there in the Leviticus law uh, in in Leviticus in chapter 18, the whole section regarding um, that describes the ancient the ancient Israelite ideas regarding sexual morality, um, and you shall not take a woman with her sister in marriage as rivals. So if you say that they follow the entire Torah, you put yourself in a position where now you're saying that Jacob, the forefather of the twelve tribes, the 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 nation of Israel, was an out and out was not fulfilling one of the one of the laws of the of the Torah. And so um, the, one second. And so the, the, Gemar, the, the Talmud asked the, the Talmud asked the question and suggests that, oh, here's the way around it, that Rachel and Leah actually had to con- convert. And by their conversion, they are no longer considered sisters because we have the idea that a convert is considered a child just born 
and not tied to the previous family. So the rabbis have to go through intellectual, so through philosophical intellectual hoops to get around this idea because they box themselves into it by claiming that the forefathers follow the Torah. This is just one example of follow the entire Torah. This is an example of that, and the reason this be, the reason I suggest this is one of my ideas about the question, are they divine or are they human? is if we want these characters to fulfill everything, we're almost implying that they have to do this on a higher level than the average person, that they are the exemplars of how to do this. But if they're making mistakes, then how can they be the exemplars? Now, my personal opinion is, and that is not scholarship, but my personal opinion is that the fallibility of these ancestors is part of the story that makes the Bible so unique and maybe f- helps us understand why it has lasted the, um, over 2,000 years as a source of inspiration is that it's not a divine book, but it's a book that can speak to us on our human level, on our imperfect level. But with that said, let's jump ahead to another passage. And many of us might be for, are familiar with this. I'm sorry, my uh, trying to screen share multiple things at once. Many of us are familiar with this idea from the standpoint of the whole debate about understanding the question of original sin or not original sin. And the Talmud itself is grappling with that. Um, as we know, Judaism and uh, early Judaism, early Christianity in this Talmudic, in this Talmudic early Christian era, are growing up literally next to each other. We have evidence archeologically that they're in the same towns. We have evidence uh, in the literary traditions that they're reading, obviously not just reading the same text, but having the same conversations and making very similar interpretations. Um, And even debating this, there's an example that I came across in um, a book on the early monastic literature and Babylonian tradition by Michal Bar Siegel, where she quotes from the a uh, passage from the sayings of the of uh, the desert fathers regarding again Jacob that when the brothers when Joseph's brothers come to him when Jacob's children come to him and want to bring Benjamin down to Egypt to um, at the request of this viceroy which they don't realize at the time is their brother Jacob turns to them and he says well you've left Shimon Simeon there. I don't have Joseph. Are you going to steal another child from me by taking Benjamin? And there is this debate in this one particular source where these two, um, these two, uh, men, these two thinkers are are sitting together, and one says, "Woe is to Jacob! Um, how could you know?" Uh, and the other one says, "Well, no, you shouldn't be speaking of Jacob like you would understand him because he's on a higher level." And so very similar in this sense of are these people on a higher level? These are the debates going on. And again, these are debates that I think you would find today. If you walked into a synagogue and you walk into church, you're going to find the same thing. And so subsequently, the same thing here with this question of, of sin. So there's, a, there's one uh, source that suggests there's no sin without, there's no death without sin. Implying that if a person didn't make a mistake in their lives, they wouldn't die. And there's no suffering without iniquity, which gets us into the question, of course, of, of, of uh, punishment and, and reward. We're not going to deal with that, but we're going to focus on this. There's no death without sin, because it also says in uh, right after that, it quotes from Ezekiel, the soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Right. So there won't be divine vengeance in the, in, in from one generation to another. Now there's neither the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness shall be upon him. So you yourself suffer for your own sin or quote unquote, you die because you were human. Um, and there is no suffering within, without iniquity. Why are these passages there? I would argue that this is one of the examples where they're saying, no, it's not because of a single sin that we, that we all die, but because we ourselves are imperfect because by our very nature of how we live, we will never do everything a hundred percent. However, they're arguing this question um, and raise the following. The ministering angel said before a holy one, blessed be he, master of the universe. Why did you penalize Adam with the death penalty? 
And God returns back and says, I gave him a command and he violated it. And so the angels say back to God, didn't Moses and Aaron who observed the whole Torah in its entirety nevertheless die? And so God says back to them, there's one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean. And that means that everyone dies. And so there's this debate whether death is because of a single event or because of the individual actions. And then we go on that one of the Tanaim, one of the earlier generation, Rabbi Shimon ben, ben Elazar said, even Moses and Aaron died due to their sin because they didn't believe in me. They hit the rock instead of spoke to the rock. This is the story in the 40th year in the desert when the Israelites are complaining about water for the second time. There's the parallel story in, in Exodus right after they cross over the sea where they're complaining about water and God tells Moses, hit the rock and bring out water. And this time God tells Moses, the 40th year, speak to the rock. And Moses in a fit of anger hits the rock. And because of that mistake, I hate to use the word sin, but because of that mistake, as a result, even they die. They don't get to go into the land of Israel and or the land of Canaan, excuse me. Um, and so the the Talmud is back and forth in this debate, thus again questioning, well, are they perfect or are they not? If they're perfect, well, death is because of humanity, everyone must die. If they're not perfect, that means that they're human and that they're not these mythological divine beings that they're really again something people that we can relate to on some level even though they speak to god they're connected to god they have special status that most of us don't have and finally in that section just one additional point there's this strange tradition that comes right after this it says that the truth is there are perfect human beings there were four of them benjamin Jacob's son, who we mentioned before, Amram, the father of Moses, Yishai, the father of David, and, and one of David's sons, Kilav, and they were all considered to be perfect. We learn this according to some tradition, except for Yishai. The point being here that are these characters in the Bible supposed to be considered extraordinary, or is this somewhat of a history book? Is this telling us the story of ancestors who were ancestors? You know, you can imagine, we, we write these books even today, right? Imagine, um, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, or I used to be, I guess. I haven't, it was a, when that was 20 years ago when the movies came out. And if you read the book, and you, as a, more so than the movies, if you see read the story of Aragon, who becomes the king eventually, and if I'm spoiling it for anyone, read Lord of the Rings already. It's been out for, you know, 90 years. Um, He's the descendant of this, of the mixture of the elves and humans, and he has a special status, but he's trying to downplay that status. And the way that Tolkien wrote his mythology is that every generation, they kind of, there was a descent of generations, and they kind of lost that status and became a little bit more fallible and a little bit more fallible. But, you know, sometimes there's a tradition that that one was perfect and this one wasn't. But let us move on to the third section, which I think it, um, I particularly find moving and has taken on a lore in the modern world, which has no business to have taken on because this was clearly a singular opinion. As you're seeing in a lot of these places, we quote one rabbi to suggest something. And I'm just going to look at a couple of them. There are about six different, char uh, six different character stories here. Um, I'm going to start with Reuven. Reuven. So there's a passage that I didn't quote here, that has a debate about, there are certain texts that one should not read out loud and uh, translate out loud in public. And one of these is the story of Reuben, Reuben. And what's the story? So it says as follows, anyone, Rabbi Shmuel, Shmuel Bar Nachmani, who is the progenitor of this entire line of thought, suggests as follows. He says, in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, that anyone who says that Reuben sinned is nothing other than mistaken. What's the story? So Ruvain, after the death of Rachel, um, is said to have laid with Bilha, who is Jacob's concubine. So Jacob marries two sisters, J Rachel and Leah, marries their maidservants, Bilha and Zilpah, or, or, or makes them his concubines. 
And of course, there is another rabbinic tradition that goes even further and suggests that all four of them are sisters. So just go back to what we said before and um, add to that embellishment of the troubles that Jacob had by marrying four sisters. Nevertheless, Reuven laid with Bilha. But Shmuel Bar Nachmani suggests, no, you didn't lay with her. What he did was he moved Jacob's bed back to the tent of his mother, Leah, because he felt that by Jacob moving his tent to Bilha, who was Rachel's maidservant, Jacob was grieving at this point, as one can imagine. And he was trying to look for the replacement for his beloved. So he went to Bilha instead of Leah. Ruvain, of course, moved. So they Ruvain does one of two things. Either he violates his, Jacob's concubine, forgive the language, I know that's a very harsh language, um, or he moves her bed, very cleaned up version of this. He does something innocent. Um, if, for those who are students of pseudepigrapha and the testaments of the 12 tribes, Ruvain, the, the description of Ruvain's testament is interesting because he has this whole long description that. He was, he was actually taken by Bilha. He was attracted to her. And then he, perhaps if you read it this way, he, he goes so far as to um, rape her. Um, but the rabbis are struggling because again, Reuven is one of the 12 tribes. He's a progenitor of the nation of one of these, of, of the nation of Israel. He's the ancestor of one of the 12 n- tribes which make up the nation. How could he have sinned? And in fact, as it says even here, he's still part of the 12 even afterwards. So somehow he must have done something. It wasn't as we understand it. We'll move on to the, to, to the more exciting ones, of course, King David and King Solomon, which many of you are familiar with, I, I presume. So King David's story, of course, is whoever says he sinned with Bathsheba is nothing other than mistaken. Now, um, the Talmud goes through hoops on this one. They suggest that he... He that he established this idea that anybody going out to war would write a uh, bill of divorce that would only take effect if the person died. So therefore, they wouldn't be considered married from the time they went out to war. Um, And of course, as we are very well aware and other sources in the Talmud suggest, well, he admits to his sin in the Bible. So how can you come and say he never sinned? Well, one could argue that by admitting to one's sin and by repenting, that in itself wipes the slate clean. And we're, we'll see that in one other passage later um, going forward. King David, of course, is probably in this sense, the most challenging of them all because he is the ancestor of, well, the hope that all of the Judeo-Christians have of some sort of future era some utopian messianic era whether one sees it as the you know in the christian tradition of course seeing it seeing him as the ancestor of jesus and of course all that that entails or in the jewish tradition of awaiting some sort of future utopian uh just a world on um, some sort of messiah the son of david that is spoken of in a lot of the literature and of course um has the whole history unto itself about false messiahs and true messiahs i'm going to skip to um, actually, Josiah, just to, for the sake of time, I'll skip Solomon, unfortunately, for our context. His is an uh, interesting story as well. But King Josiah is interesting because Josiah was always seen as a figure of revival. His period of time um, was the last gasp of the first kingdom's attempts at preventing God's wrath. And so the question is, It says here, anyone who says Josiah sinned is nothing other than mistaken. So what sin are we talking about? He's seen very positively, um, but it said he did that because it says he did that, which is right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of David, his father. However, what do I do with, and like him, there there was no king before him that returned to God. So what return does he do? He must've done something wrong in the past. And so, so the suggestion is that, he didn't judge favorably in the years leading up to his 18th birthday, where he was no longer the regent king, but he was actually the king. And the rabbis go so far as to suggest that he repents by repaying all the people who he financially caused struggles with leading up to this point. Okay, 
So I just gave you a few examples. There are myriads of other sources on this question. Um, for example, just one that uh, I, I went over years ago that really sh uh, struck me was, so we know the stories in the book of Judges where you have a lot of leaders who are not, who are anything but perfect. In fact, probably the most imperfect leaders um, that you will find before the times of the kings. Um, and the rabbis try to either lift them up or really downplay them, depending on which tribe they're from, which story it is. There's a mirror, there, there are a host of reasons for that having to do with who said it when, um, trying to downplay rebellion, uh, play up the idea again that they are biblical characters. So should we be doing this? Should we be reading them favorably or infavorably? Or in other words, should we be suggesting, should we be following the lore of Shmuel or Bar Nachmani who says, if you say that so-and-so sinned, you are making a mistake. And by the way, I should just say that as centuries have gone on, we've taken these six characters and we've extrapolated, many in the Jewish tradition have extrapolated this further because I think that we're trying to learn moral lessons from people that may or may, that we may or may not be always needing to be, uh, that we may or may not be, it may or may not be easy to learn from, excuse me. That's question number one. Question number two that I just leave with, again, these are questions to further engage you all with. Are our more, as our moral compass has changed, what do we do with these characters? Should we be reading them even more favorably today or should we read them less favorably? Even in some of the very uh, ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities, it's interesting which characters they try to uplift and which characters they downplay. For example, the, some of the rebellion stories in, in the Bible, in the Torah, just very quick, um, the rebellion of Korah, so there are some who see Korah, this is the uh, story in the book of Numbers, there are some who see him as actually coming out better, even though he's the one who gets punished in the end. And they do that because they reread the stories um, in, light of some, uh, in light of certain subversive, quote unquote, subversive readings that they're offering. And what do we do today? Um, this is very important, both in scholarship and also in practice because we use these books not just to understand the past or try to read the past and not necessarily historically but how did people read the past right and we also use all of these works not just biblical works but um we saw in the previous again in the keynote you know we saw a picture of marcus aurelius for example his meditations are fundamental in many self-help books today which is fascinating unto itself these are we, we always go back to them, to these sources. So how do we read them? Do we read them literally, figuratively? Do we do all kinds of sophist? Do we do all kinds of exegetical interpretations to fit our moral compass or do we read them to fit the compass back then? So these are just some of the thoughts that I have. Um, they do play out, you know, they're coming out of a world that's trying to deal with pantheons of mythology. They're trying to deal with the understanding of what does it mean to have a son of God in the Christian tradition. They're trying to offer polemics um, and they're trying to break away to create their own traditions. So, the, so um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope that um, I've given you all some food for thought today. Thank you, Brian. That was very interesting. We do have a couple of questions. Um, what evidence have you found? Oh. Let me just take the share off. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, no, you're fine. One second. How do I Ironically, how do I get back to seeing everybody? <laughs> um, hold on, let me see. There should be a big red out. button at the top of your screen. Oh, stop I'm sharing. missing it. Yeah, they're probably. Oh, there it is. Thank you. I, I'm. I'm sorry. I've forgotten no, how to no, use you're, this. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, someone is asking whether you have found any evidence of Canaanite traditions in the Tanakh. Uh, linguistics are a big key in discovering this, and I'm curious what or if you found. Uh, I haven't done a lot of that. I will. I will admit. Um, I'm the I'm the true independent scholar of this bunch, meaning that like this is not my day job. But I will say that when you look at if you look at even if you're looking at the 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 entire if you look at the area as a whole, like again, I only go I go back to what was said even just an hour ago. It's always good to listen to other people, but very simply, if you think about the divine kings of the Egyptian world and pro, and given that the Egyptians had control of the Canaanite uh, Canaanite world through much of this period that is being written about 
subsequently or written about at those times, one can only imagine that as they're writing these grand stories of Samson, Gideon, and others, people we didn't even touch upon, um, they're, they're writing these stories sort of with the back of their mind of, are we writing about divine leaders who are talking to God? Or are we writing about humans that God is choosing for some sort of reason or whatnot? That would be my understanding, but I'm not much of a scholar in this area. So I will unfortunately punt the question to people who are, but I love the question. I'm going to have to go look at that for sure. No, um, that's that. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so we have one that is maybe a little bit more within your wheelhouse. Um, was a lack of right. sin used to explain particularly long-lived people? Uh, the questioner is think, thinking of people like Methuselah. So I actually think so, um, personal opinion. But I think that, and, and I think that, so the perfect example that there is a Midrash, thank you for that question. There is a Midrashic tradition that tries to explain Enoch's life which probably also you find in his works. Enoch dies younger than everyone else at the young age of 365, which of course- Miss Tripling. Which is anybody think, uh, there is actually a later commentary that does point out, I believe there's a later comment that says, think about, you know, 365 is a very important number in calendrical purposes. But very short point is he dies at a young age and walks with God because there's the concern that he's going to sin and God takes him away to prevent the sin. And that is also why Enoch becomes the um, character that plays so much, uh, that plays a lot in the later, in the early mystical traditions that are coming out. Again, the books of Enoch, some of the Hechalot palace literature and so on, really more the area of my wheelhouse than not. So I would say to you that when it comes to the long lived lives, I think that that does play a role, which eventually, of course, is why we get to Moses dying at 120. And of course, for those in uh, who know Jew- the Jewish blessing, you know, ad mea ve'estrim, may you live to 120 years, meaning you've lived an entire life because you are not being punished for any mistakes you made. If you die younger, you automatically are. But that's putting my rabbi hat on and not my scholarly hat on for the moment. <laughs> well, thank you. We don't have any more questions, but that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we will uh, move on now to our next presenter, Dr. Priscilla Scoville. Um, Priscilla Scoville is an historian that studies the ancient Near East. She teaches middle and high school kids across the world and in Brazil, where she's engaged in a project to bring education to teenagers from poor families, encouraging them to pursue a university level course. The title of her talk today is How Connected Was the Ancient Near East During the Amarna Age? Priscilla, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, you all, for creating this conference, this virtual conference. This is a very interesting and important um, ideal. It's important, especially for people like me that are in Brazil or other peripheral countries. So it's a very important and interesting initiative. Um, I first want to start like apologizing. I normally don't like reading when I presenting something, but I'm mentally tired as I was teaching all day. Uh, today I was with six and seven graders and they are very loud, so I'm mentally tired. And to be sure that I will be on time and that I will be able to talk about everything that I planned, I will be reading, okay? So I'm sorry for that. I hope this is okay for you. I will try not to make it so massive and tiring for everyone. Um, just give me a second, I will share my screen here. So studying the ancient Near East is something relatively new in Brazil. The first generation of Brazilian scholars dedicated to the subject carry out their academic training in Europe or in the United States in the early 1960s or 70s. Uh, there is not many bibliographic or archaeological collections in Brazil about any kind of the any group and people of the ancient Near East, and not just here in Brazil, but other Latin America countries. So it's a little bit difficult for us here, and this is why I want to first appreciate this initiative. Still, the number of researchers dedicated to the history of ancient Near East has grown in recent years much because of policies like open access and initiatives that are virtual. This idea of nonprofit has made the field more accessible for peripheral countries, 
even through they often end up being excluded from large con congresses and conferences to the high prices to travel abroad, the fees and the cost of maintenance in these places. And then what I mean to say with this is thank you for this. The Save Ancient, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance has made it possible to engage a greater public over the world and especially here in Brazil. So I appreciate the initiative, not just for me, but on behalf of all these Latin American and Brazilian scholars. So to restart, my presentation is how connected was the ancient Near East during Amarna age, which is my thesis that I just defended in last May. So I just a new doctor here in the area, we just finished it. And I like to give a summary of what I was doing, like some of the main ideas. Oops, sorry. So to, just like today, Ancient people didn't want to be isolated. Connecting with other cultures was an important part of their life. From this realization, official relations between courts began to emerge in the third century BC. The oldest evidence of diplomatic correspondence ever found is a letter exchanged between the kings Irkabdamu of Ebla and Zizi of Hamazi. And this is the one that is on the slides. You can, I will not read everything. This is just there for, for you. But the content that is written in this document uh, shows us that this is not the first correspondent ever written, but it's just the first evidence that we have. Over time, more rules were structurized and, and they were structurizing these diplomatic relations. The beginning of the Near Eastern diplomacy can be separated into three main moments based on the documentation of Ebla, Mari, and Amarna. Briefly, we can understand that during the era, era, the Ebla era, contacts with foreign kingdoms were guaranteeing security in case of attacks and economic benefits, facilitating trade. The world was dynamic and the boundaries of each Mesopotamian city-state were changing rapidly, as were the power relations. Then came Sargon of Akkad, who transformed how kings interact with the world, creating an, an empire. Although his empire did not survive for long, one of the greatest legacies left by him was the centralization of power in a capital, replacing the disposal of city-states. Because of this, connections with organs had to be reshaped. During the new phase of diplomatic relations, the Mary era, the focus became to build and to maintain the power of some kingdoms. That is, the correspondence exchanged between kings did not seek only the security and defense of the territory, but served as a tool for territorial expansion. At the time, the contacts established had a lifetime character or a fixed term. It does not guarantee stability. Thus, the Syria Mesopotamian region faced an aggressive environment that triggered a dark age. With that, the suspension of diplomatic uh, activities, migrations of new groups and destruction or abandonment of several cities happened. Once again, the world was remodeled and the centrality of relationships changed, swifting from South Central Mesopotamia to the East. Such a change was not random, but coincided with the expansion of Islam, sorry, the expansion of Egypt, to the Levant and the rise of Mitanni in Northern Syria. Uh, I said Islam because I was talking about Islam in class and this is still on my mind, so sorry. The expansion of Egypt. Um, through the Levant and the rise of, of Mitanni in Northern Syria. Egypt and Mitanni are crucial kingdoms for this new phase of diplomacy, which is the Amarna age. As their rulers, were responsible for stimulating the exchange of letters once again. This resumption of diplomacy followed written patterns that had already been established in the previous moments, but for the first time, it included an idea of a common objective, peace through the maintenance of the status quo. With that, the exchange of messages became more than a diplomatic contact, but a system. 
that changed the structure of thought from the individual to collective. It is also it also implies that the agreement were inherited by their successors. In other words, the treaties were eternal and no longer for life. And the royal actions towards the others had to respect the traditions of the previous agreements. This change um, guaranteed more stability to the diplomatic system and to the Near Eastern world. With this diplomatic systematization, wars no longer happened with the same frequency. The great hegemonic powers, Egypt, Mitanni, uh, Babylon, Hatti, and Assyria, did not engage in major conflicts, except in the vassal territories. Another key point is the cultural exchange, which included external elements into the Mesopotamian tradition, once Hatti, Egypt, and Mitanni became part of these connections. At the time of Amarna diplomacy, peace was relatively respected, and the system acted as an autonomous interstate institution. However, these kings did not understand each other in the same way as they tried to demonstrate in the letters. Much has already been discussed about Amarna diplomacy. I propose to look at these letters through the eyes of digital humanities. Digital humanities do not have a single definition, but generally they are researchers equipped with digital instruments to a greater or a lesser extent. I use social network analysis approach based on a software uh, named Gepi and another one named Noodle Excel, allowing a mathematical and a visual mapping of this contact in the ancient Near East. I focus on the diplomatic relations between equals. I restrict myself to the documents referring to the independent or hegemonic kingdoms, which are al Ashia, Aswa, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Hatti, and Mitanni, which comprises the letters. EA 1 to 44, with the exception of EA 30 and 40. Before moving on to a more pragmatic data, we need to consider the basic concepts of the Amarna diplomacy, reciprocity and brotherhood. The hegemonic rulers had called each other brothers and established family ties. That means that they should be equals in all matters. However, they did not miss any opportunity to promote themselves and to criticize their neighbors. But how did they balance the difference between what they say and what they believe? When we reach the Amarna era and see that the diplomatic organization worked on a common objective, this did not happen out of idealism, but because peace suited them. Through peacekeeping, more economic goods could be exchanged, but fewer burdens would fall on them, and the status of the great kingdoms would be kept. The choice to systematize diplomacy meant changes, and more than ever, the idea of equality needed to be reinforced. They called each other brothers, but that does not mean that they understood each other as equals. So to answer the question I proposed above, first, we need to focus on the diplomatic institution rather than the realms involved. A total of 26 royal individuals are mentioned in the selected letters, corresponding to 147 relationships, and 109 of which happens more than once. This shows us that the relationships tend to be maintained over time. By considering these contacts and with the help of the softwares, it is possible to measure the degree of each king and kingdom. And by degree, I mean how many relations they established and how central they were in this world. So here we have this chart with the, the numbers of their centrality, their degree of centrality as it follows. It should be explained that it is natural to find Egypt and its rulers highlighted since all of the documentation refers to this place. 
which is the Amarna letters found in Egypt. What is interesting to note is that there is a pattern in the centrality of agents in this diplomatic system. Mitanni and Babylon, who have most tab tablets, 13 and 14 respectively, have the same degree as Hatti, who has only four letters. These kingdoms are still very close to Assyria, which has only two letters. These five states are the so-called great kings. So Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Hatti, and Mitanni. According to the rules of Amarna system, they should be equal. Alahia and Aswa, which have a lower centrality, were independent, but did not in, they were not a hegemonic space. In addition, Assyria has, still has another particularity that explains the difference between its centrality and that of the other hegemonic powers. It was the last one to be included in this system. Here we have a network graph that, sh that shows us the size of the circles representing the degree of centrality of each of these kingdoms, a little bit more visually. That is, the larger the circle, the greater the number of their relations were established. The lines that connect each circle, each circle are called edges and show us who was connected with whom. It is clear when then that the five hegemonic powers, Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt, Hatti, and Mitanni are relatively uh, even and they stand out in contrast of the two independent kingdoms, which are Aswa and Alahia. For centuries, diplomacy was a tool for wars, strength, defense, or territorial expansion. The kingdom's, a kingdom's prestige was measured by its size and influence. In the Marna era, the need to demonstrate power still existed, but how it was understood changed. Prestige was not only directed di directly related to the hegemonic area, but to the recognition of, of the others. Uh, to be a great kingdom and a brother, sorry, to be a great kingdom and a brother, the other kings needed to understand him as such. To this end, the systematization of diplomacy created a brotherhood between kings and aimed to bring balance to an unequal world. This goal was achieved as it was noticeable by the degrees of centrality that I showed you before. Even so, the disparity of interpretations in this personal and state spheres occur. This is because having balance did not mean the existence of equality. Therefore, the Amarna system uh, could remain stable with relative peace, even in face of people who believe to be superior than others. The rules of diplomacy were respected, but allowed for many interpretations. There was no specific or unique definition for some of the fundamental concepts of this system, such as reciprocity, which included, sorry, it could be interpreted as equality, equity, compensation, or justice. The ambiguous way of dealing with these ideas allowed the kings to test their limits and to test the limits of the others, adjusting and adapting through rhetorical resources with the subtle persuasive arguments and strategies. In addition, the system itself stimulated conflicts. Of course, if the goal was to keep peace, such conflicts could not escalate it into war, but they should be recurrent enough to encourage communication. Because of this, despite of referring to each other as brothers, the kings show their displeasure with certain situations. And as in every family, brothers could have disagreements. When trying to find solutions, more messages were exchanged and along with them, more gifts were traveling. The practice was beneficial for the economy, favoring the, the interdependence of the kings 
and consequently contributing to the base. And thank you. This is all from me for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Sorry, I had to wait for my camera to finish loading. Um, that was wonderful. And I have to say, on a personal note, the Amarna period is one of my favorite historical periods. Uh, so I greatly enjoyed um, hearing about that. Um, I, while we wait and see if there are any audience questions, um, can you maybe talk a little about the um, network theory analysis that I believe you were you were using to um, yes. express the relationships between those uh, different kingdoms. Yeah, sure. So this network analysis is basically collecting all data, all information from the source, in, in this case, the letters. Um, I had to do it manually, like reading the letters, collecting the names of everyone that is seated or someone that is related to the letter, collecting the name of the person, the kingdom, if they are talking about something else or someone else, what is being the, the main idea of this, this letter, collecting all this information and then placing it in the softwares. First, I used the Nudo Excel, which is a plugin for Excel. And in this software, I just put there the, the names and in each letter they are, and this automatically calculates how they are connected. It creates a graph. I collect this information. It, me, it is full of information. I just showed you this degree of centrality, but we have degrees of uh, density, how connected they were, if they were saying good things of each other or bad things about each other. So everything is there. And I, I get this information and then use it on Gappy, which is this other software that I think creates a better graph. It's just for to create this visual map because I can change the colors, I can change the lines. I think it's looking better than the one that I have in, in Nudo Excel. And with all this information, we can understand many different things because just by reading the letters, by reading the text, sometimes we miss some things. And here we have like a mathematical calculation of these things that helps us to, to see from different angles. Thank you. And if people want to read these letters for themselves, where can they find them? We have some tr translations like in Portuguese, that is the, the case of Brazil. Uh, my thesis is, is the first one that translated it, not all of them, but this first 44. In English, we have two good translations from Rainley and William Moran. They are good translations. They have different uh, views on how to translate. William Moran is the oldest one and has a better a, a sense of reading it a little bit easier and the Renly one is a little bit more uh, true to what is reading down like exactly literal words, words there. Uh, both of them are very good in, in telling us what is in the letters but they have different approaches and translation. Thank you and someone else is also asking uh, is Mari a place or a person? Murray is a place. It's a city in Syria. I, I have a here on the map, if I can show again, let me just share here a screen. It will be a little bit easier. Where is my screen now? <laughs> here. Murray is a place that is in northern in, in Syria here, right here, into Euphrates River. So the name of these documents are related to the place in which they are found. Like they were found in Ebla, they are found in Mary, in Mari, they are found in Amarna. That's why they, they call it, I call it like this. Okay. Thank you. And uh, one more question before uh, we head off to our final presenter of the day. Uh, you said that Assyria was one of the most mentioned in the letters in spite of only having two. Um, do these mentions show some kind of concern about their rise to power and the relevant power balance in the era? Yeah. So in terms of numbers, they are not mentioned a lot, but as they are, they have less letters as they appear in some others, they are very relevant. The main people talking about Assyria would be Babylon. 
as they were, Syria was once part of Mitanni and Babylonia, and, and once Assyria was trying to become this independent kingdom and create their, their hegemony in the area, Babylon would go to Egypt, send a message to Egypt saying, well, they are not independent, they are part of our kingdom, do not answer, do not engage with them. And then they continue to engage with Egypt. So it shows us how Assyria is ascending into power and in creating its own name at this point. Thank you. Um, we do not have any more questions for you, so uh, I will let you go. But thank you again. This was a, a really interesting presentation. Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> bye bye. Oh, goodbye. <laughs> uh, our next presenter is Jace Short. Jace is a PhD student in ancient philosophy at the New School for Social Research. His focus has been on the pre-Socratics and Plato, with adjacent interest in the broad genre of the fantastic, from ancient mythic poetry to contemporary law and film. Although Jace is an academic, he has long engaged in public outreach by way of activism, including environmental, anti-racist, union, anti-war, and so on, and in this regard has focused almost entirely on public education. He is a single dad to a beautiful seven-year-old child, and relaying lessons from the ancient world to them has been a powerful force in shaping how he thinks about the accessibility of research. Education as an egalitarian project for helping us to live better lives as individuals and as a social whole is central to who he is and what he does. Today, he will be, pre he will be presenting The Open Moor of the God King, the tragedy of Kronos and its statues as political cr critique in antiquity. Uh, not statues, status as political critique in antiquity. I'm sorry, Jace. After I've made, oh, hang on, there we go. After I've made such a mess of introducing you, I'm just going to go away and leave you to it. Okay, um, I haven't done this screen sharing thing, though I, I hopped on a little early in anticipation of doing that. You um, should be able to just press the green button at the bottom and green select. Green button? Yep. Okay. So, right. Let's see. Sorry, just one. No, moment. no, you're fine. Okay. Um, for people watching, this will be our final presentation of the day. If you have questions for Jace, please make sure you put them in the chat. And following his presentation, there will be a social hour. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but I think we will be given instructions um, in a little bit. Ah, perfect. Okay. Yep. So are we good? Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, you're great. Okay, so the title of my presentation is The Open Maw of the God King, and it is about Kronos as a figure in um, particularly archaic and classical Greek antiquity, um, though there will be some mentions of uh, Saturn and Saturnalia and developments afterwards. Um, but I'm going to just jump on in here with the first uh, slide. Okay. So this is a very famous image, I'm sure that a lot of people are familiar with. It's Saturn devouring his son. Let's just pretend it says Kronos for our purposes, because it's you know depicting more or less the same thing. So this is um, part of Goya's um, Black series, privately produced on the walls of the Quinto del Sordo, where he had retreated um, basically in uh, frustration and a sense of gloom and doom cynicism about the prospects for uh, a Republican Spain. There had been you know, years of war, the Peninsula War, there had been Spanish troops fighting on, on behalf, or uh, sorry, French troops fighting on behalf of the Republican efforts, but they, um, you know, had, not, nonetheless, they had carried out a number of atrocities and he had, sort of um, done a lot of protest by you know, doing artworks that depicted the horrors of these atrocities on both sides. And all of the work that he did at this time, he focused on as, he, he thought of it as just for himself. This was not for anyone else. Um, and a lot of the work was damaged and, and so forth when it was removed from the walls in order to be displayed later. Nonetheless, one of the things that he really, he, that his most striking image was this. Um, we see Saturn or Kronos sort of cowering in uh, a dark space where there's, you know, the way the light hits him, it's like a, 
uh, like someone's holding a torch or something and he's being caught and his eyes are wide. Um, he's, he's, he sees that he's caught. And I think that's, there's something significant to that, that imagery and that imagery stuck out. It wasn't just Goya who called upon it, though I think this is the most salient example, but it all kind of came back to this image of Kronos or Saturn devouring his children. And in this version, you can see it's very gruesome and Kronos is sort of the figure of the counter revolution. Um, but uh, as we'll see, Kronos is a little bit more complicated as we go back to the archaic period. So who are we talking about here? Saturn, Kronos, Kronos, Kronos. Um, first, we should understand that this is in, the, in this early period, the archaic period, not to be confused with Kronos like time, okay? Um, they will later be fused, but um, at this time, there is no time god of this type, um, at least not in the, the tradition we're dealing with with Kronos. Um, it gets a little complicated because it's really, it's, it's actually in the classical period that the fusion begins, but nonetheless. So he, and the, and the story that I'm gonna focus on, which is from Hesiod's Theogony and the works and days, he's a Titan. Titans are kind of God. Um, he's the youngest child of the Titans, Uranus and Gaia. And these are, you know, Ur Uranus is um, sky, Gaia is earth, but you don't wanna think of them as the God of the sky or the God of the earth. These are just the sky and the earth. And those things are gods. So the, the earth on your feet that you put your, your feet down on, that is Gaia. And these are some of the primordial entities that Hesiod introduces. Um, the first one is chaos, and that the, the word is more like our sense of chasm or gap opening. Um, and then there's Eros, who drives things together. And there's Gaia, and Gaia um, gives... Uh, existence to Uranus from herself. And she has these children and um, one generation are the Titans, which are sort of the former gods. Um, and the next generations are monsters of various kinds, which are very exciting for me. Um, so one thing to keep in mind too, these are not, these in the story, in the narrative, these are former gods, but we're not looking at an example here of like an Olympian cult that is is displacing an older cult. This is a, a kind of literary creation. These other gods, there are ritual sites, there are you know, forms of worship of them, but not all of them, but notably Rhea is one, is a big one. There's some things for Kronos himself, um, but they are more of a, um, less cult figures, more literary, poetic, mythical, if you will. So Kronos is the father of Zeus, and that is the most important aspect of him, especially for Hesiod. Uh, as MOS says, his visible characteristics and attributes derive from his position as father and predecessor to Zeus. And he's described as Denatatos Python, that is the most fearful of children. His youth is emphasized again and again. So we've got a very ancient god, but his youth and his willingness to, to act on behalf of his mother um, with, for the injustice that she is suffering, which we're going to get to in a moment, is emphasized. So going on to the next, let's just go just a brief historical context here. Um, I'm sure a lot of you all are familiar with this, but this is the Archaic period, and we roughly talk in 800 to 550 BCE, and you have Phoenicians, Etruscans, uh, various people from the Italian peninsula, um, and Greeks, traveling and establishing settlements all over the Mediterranean and the Black Sea area. Now, this period has been described um, by Walter Burkhart as a orientalizing period. Um, classicists, as we know, still use the term oriental and orientalization. Um, that is uh, probably something that ought to go, um, I, I think, but nonetheless. Um, and what this term means, the orientalization, period is a period in which Greek-speaking peoples absorbed a lot of the art and culture of those around them. From, uh, you know, you can see it in the example I gave there of the Kouros, that's the on the bottom left, 
that's a very stolid figure um, of a man. It's very Egyptian in style, very rigid. On the, on the bottom right there, we have one of the many sea monster creatures, um, the Kitos. And of course there are Greek uh, names for these and so forth, but a lot of them are inspired by uh, this figure of a sea monster, which was very significant in, um, among Semitic peoples. Um, as again, I'm sure many of you know from your own expertise. Um, one thing that's important for me and connected to other research I'm doing on reconstructing the earliest forms of Pythagoreanism is that Egyptian and Near Eastern temple complexes had a major influence on the cultural development of these Greek speaking populations, introducing um, the notion that there might be uh, a a way to live in which one can understand the world uh, and use that understanding to govern and to bring about a kind of justice um, for the people that one rules over. Of course, these temple complexes, the, they were also, uh, you know, these were landowners. They, they had peasants attached to them and so forth. So you can see where the governance comes in. He see it, of course, as a major figure of this, who was influenced, I mean, by, um, by this culture. Uh, the east face of Helicon by ML West really lays this out quite well. So I'm gonna move on to Hesiod. So Hesiod, we can tell from a variety of things in his um, Theogony and Works and Days and from some of the fragments, especially the catalog of women, that there is a lot of familiarity with Near Eastern uh, accounts of the gods uh, everything from the Song of Kamarbi, the Hero Hittite um, uh, tale to the Enuma Elish, there's there's a lot. And I don't really have time to go into all of that here. Um, but for instance, Kronos himself, this is not, we don't think we don't think this is a Greek name. We think it's probably derived from a Semitic people. Uh, not really sure who. So uh, as, as we know, there is no central doctrine of Greek religion. It's more of a matter of ritual practice. Thus, many versions of these tales exist. So Hesiod, through the Theogony and Works of Days, he sort of coheres a lot of accounts and becomes the sort of standard. Um, Heraclitus will say that uh, he's the teacher of men. Uh, he doesn't say it in a nice way. Uh, but what we mean, what's meant by this is that he sort of established a framework. Homer had established this whole ethos, um, from which to, fr from which one could think about character and ethics and action in the midst of crisis. But Hesiod really established the sort of architecture of a universe, a shared topography that people could think through. And I think that's what makes him so significant to later thinkers. As I mentioned here, Parmenides um, seems to really take a lot uh, from Hesiod and reacts against him. Um, so I think it's important also to keep in mind that he situates himself in the poem. And the reason I think this is important is he's trying to say something about voices in this work. He has his voice and he will note when he is speaking for himself and when the muses are speaking through him. He has this encounter with the muses. Um, and I'm gonna go on to that. The the with this encounter, essentially what happens is he's out tending his sheep and um, he's by Mount Helicon. Um, as you see, there's a picture there on the right. Uh, I took that myself when I was there this summer and it was a very interesting, eerie sight. It was covered in like dark clouds and mist, just sort of like I had imagined it would be. Um, so the, the muses, they dance down from the mountain and sing as they go. Um, they are of one mind and they, we can sort of think of them as sort of interlinked entities, um, and at least in this portrayal. Of course, there's, you know, with Homer, the, the muse is addressed in the singular, um, though there is a mention of nine muses, I think in the Iliad or the Odyssey. Um, nonetheless, like this is a very distinct form for the muses to take. Um, so the muses, What's important here, I think, is they, they claim, we know how to tell many lies that appear like the truth, but we know how to tell the truth when we will. So they tell lies like the truth and they tell the truth and you never know when they're gonna do it. And this kind of initiate, initiates this 
theme of doubling that I'm gonna to go to here next. So just some examples of the doubling. We've got the, the muses, like I said. Then there's you know the muses voice itself and Hesiod's. There's Gaia's sort of fission. She splits off from herself, um, parts of herself that become their own entities. Uh, we have Uranus and Kronos's mutual repression of their offspring. Kronos and Zeus as a kind of double entity. Uh, the Titans and the Olympians as double entities. The Golden Age egalitarian paradise and the post-Golden Age period. The two strifes, that's very significant at the beginning of Works and Days. Hesiod essentially says the muses were, were not telling the truth and there's a second strife. Um, and it kind of, that centers his entire narrative. We have the two poems, the Theogony and the Works and Days, which I agree with, um, a lot of scholars like Jenny Strauss Clay who think that these must be looked at as a singular whole. You can't really separate them from each other. Uh, we have the Kronos swallowing his offspring and Zeus's swallowing of Metis, and on and on and on. I could just keep on listening and forever. But uh, what I think is really key about this notion of doubling for Hesiod is that anything that we encounter, there is a potential doubled version of it. And that doubled version or variant um, could speak to us much more than something that's uh, really put on the surface. Um, and I, and I'm in here. I'm meaning specifically that we are inheriting a tradition that typically reads the Theogony as an as a tale of Zeus the hero, uh, who established the order of justice. And we think that because. When we see the word justice translated, we think of our own notions of justice. But for Hesiod and uh, the Greeks of this period, DK is a it's a chthonic deity. It's a deity that lives under the war, under the earth and and Tartarus, and it uh, is <clears throat> you know more associated with things like the Furies than anything else. <clears throat> and I think that one can read the story more of a is a tragedy of Kronos and uh, we can see Zeus as kind of a villain and there is a element of political critique that comes with this. So all right then we need to get just to the story. So let's just recount what has happened for those who aren't familiar like the basic overview. Um, this is called the succession myth and the succession myth appears uh, to again be related to things like the Song of Kumarbi and the Enuma Elish and possibly other um, Near Eastern lore. So the first thing that happens is that Uranos and Gaia have children, um, but the Uranos is driven by Eros. So the sky is driven by desire or love to cover, as it says, Gaia, the earth. And he's horrified at his offspring, both the titans and the monsters that come to be from it. And accordingly, he forces them back down into Gaia, into her womb. The imagery here is kind of of a perpetual penetration. Um, he sees a little cagey with his language here. Uh, seems to be not trying, he's trying not to get too um, explicit with the sexual imagery, uh, but it's there. And so many will call this a, a rape. Um, it, the text suggests that it sort of begins with something consensual, but the maintaining of this penetration, which pushes down the children uh, into the, the depths of Gaia, that is the part that is non-consensual. And it's, con it's spoken of as, as an atrocity, as a cruelty, as a great evil. And thus, uh, Gaia wants an end to this. She needs a hero. And she asks her children who will help. And um, none of them are willing to step up except for the very youngest, Kronos. And she gives him a adamantine weapon, a kind of sickle. Uh, this is one of the things that we're, we're gonna see here. He's connected with the image of the sickle, uh, a tool for harvesting. And he's sort of the Lord of the harvest in a way. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. But that symbol is pretty significant. And also, you know, to know we don't really cover a whole lot of it. I'm not going to cover a lot of it here, but um, 
ultimately the way Zeus and his brothers, uh, Hades and Poseidon, uh, manage to defeat the Titans is they go into the earth and also receive under the earth um, magical weapons that allow them to fight. So with this weapon, Kronos castrates his father, Uranus. And the blood drops hit the earth, and that produces the furies. And the actual genitalia lands in the ocean. And from that emerges Aphrodite. And there's a whole lot to that that's interesting, but we're not going to cover here. And we have, at this moment, the reign of the Titans. So the Titans... Uh, we're, we're gonna. This is gonna lead to what's called the Titanomachy, the War of the Titans, and the the rule of the Titans is maintained by Kronos's swallowing of his children. Crucially, I would say, swallowing them whole, whole, unlike the image we saw from Goya at the beginning. I think this is a kind of imagery that their powers are latent and undifferentiated within their father, and there's something about their release that indicates uh, an imagery or symbol about humanity's movement from being a kind of natural being to an unnatural being, beings with language, with culture, with um, writing, with technology, and of course also uh, new kinds of violence. And Kronos, um, he does this because he learns from Uranus and Gaia that uh, his children will, one of his children will be his undoing. So it's one of these typical examples of, in, in Greek myth of someone hears their fate and they want to avoid it. And in trying to avoid it, they pretty much cause it. Um, so Rhea is grieving for her children. She seeks Gaia's help. Um, she gives uh, Gaia an idea of how to, to take care of this. So what she does is she gives Kronos an omphalos, a stone, a navel stone to swallow. It's swaddled in infant clothing. Um, so when Zeus is born, she switches it out. She takes Zeus to Crete, he's raised there. He grows up quickly and prepares his vengeance on behalf of his mother, Rhea. Um, he gains poison from the Titan Metis, who for whatever reason seems to also be unhappy with the Titan regime. And Metis, keep in mind, will be uh, the sort of mother, not mother of Athena. Uh, her name means like wisdom or insight, um, intuition. And once he, once Kronos is tricked into swallowing this poison, poison he throws up his children. Then uh, the Olympian gods emerge and they battle with the Titans. And the earth, the surface of, of Gaia is devastated. And uh, Zeus consults with another Titan, Prometheus, who gives him advice on going to get those magical weapons from the Cyclops, which they use to defeat the Titans. So um, we're gonna talk about this just, you know, in the terms of image and motif, uh, motif and, and muthoi, that is myth. Um, what I think we've got going on here is, a, a kind of symbol that is etched into these tales of political critique. One that um, can on the surface look like a celebration of ruling powers, but is to any discerning listener in this case or reader in our cases, um, you can see that there's more uh, going on. And the more that's going on, um, can really be explained. I'm going to go ahead and skip a, a few here, just go on to this one. Uh, can be explained by the practice of the Cronia. The Cronia was a um, festival and it was held at a certain time in, in Attica and a certain time in Ionia. Um, but what's important for us, uh, we can connect it to Saturnalia and medieval festivals. It's, it's a kind of festival in which the enslaved people of the, the area got to party. And often their masters would wear the clothing of servants and slaves and the enslaved people would wear clothing of royalty and present themselves as sort of 
kings and aristocrats and rulers. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of imagery here of uncrowning and travesty and thrashing. And how is this all connected to Kronos? Well, Kronos was thought to be the ruler, the, the god who ruled the golden age. That was a time of paradise. And this is an image that seems to come from Near Eastern notions of paradise. It's completely egalitarian. It's, uh, there's a kind of immediacy in which nature just produces what people need spontaneously without any need for technology or knowledge. And this is disrupted and overcome. First with the Titanomachy, it causes so much destruction, wiping out this first generation of humans. Um, but also what comes after, it, as detailed in the works and days, is a new regime in which Zeus is not the best or uh, kindliest ruler. Uh, Prometheus um, makes an effort to, to work around this and he's punished in perpetuity for it. Um, and basically Zeus, he takes this second strife that I mentioned earlier and it says he sets it into the roots of the earth so that humans must struggle to live. And the whole imagery here is that after this initial period, there now must be struggle to live. Life is now hellish and difficult. And there's a yearning for that free class, free Zeus reign, pre-Olympian um, period that's expressed through the Cronia. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to institute collective rituals that symbolize a kind of social revolution? Um, we, we, can, we know from various uh, sources that the celebrations of the Cronia were often a problem uh, for city leaders. There was a lot of repression of it uh, over time. For instance, the, the whole month was called the, uh, the Cronion, I think, and then it was changed in Attica. Um, so there's a lot of research to be done here that I am very interested in. Um, there's a lot of things to be connected to Saturnalia, to medieval expressions of this. I haven't even mentioned Mikhail Bakhtin's uh, Rabelais in his world, which really details this as a kind of medieval thing. Um, these festivals, these rituals are about equality and about the protest of people uh, against the conditions of their lives. They want to enjoy themselves. They want to enjoy one another. They want equality. They want rulers to be laid low. And I think in the image of Kronos as this hero who saved his mother and then ruler of this happy egalitarian age who's then overthrown and then what comes after is this startling inequality and suffering. I think that this um, shows us that there's a kind of cultural uh, resonance that we see in other, with possibly with other Near Eastern peoples who had similar succession myth tales, um, with a notion of our conditions are not natural or fair and that they will one day change and we yearn for them to change. That sounds very simple, but I think there's a lot to be unpacked there. I'm gonna leave it at that so we have some time for questions. Um, and I guess I need to end this screen sharing. Um, let's see here, stop you sharing. Be, yeah, yeah, got it, okay. Thank you very much, Jace. That was really interesting. Um, we don't have a lot of audience questions, but we do have one um, that they say is possibly off topic. So do your best. Um, we see in the Greco-Roman novels, many instances of the upper social strata being brought into slavery and serfdom via capture by pirates and human trafficking. Um, asking you, they say, to irresponsibly speculate, do you think there's a similar cultural resonance with the audiences of these novels, many of whom would be freed slaves, but also upper status people? Yeah, I, I, I do. I think that there's a, there's a lot of people who go through life in, this, in the ancient world who maybe at some point in their life were enslaved and then they're not. And um, they carry with them you know, uh, a strong sense of like, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. And it's a, it's a travesty, um, uh, better someone else than me. But it's tales like that resonate, they make sense. You know, these things, the things that survive 
and from antiquity are things that echoed off of people. And once they felt that there was something significant, more people wanted to produce it, more people wanted to hear it. Um, so yeah, I mean, speculation, I don't have a, a, a concrete connection here to that, but uh, that, that's interesting. I'm, I'd like to look into it myself. Oh, lost you. Sorry, I mute myself to yeah. minimize Here's child one. noise and then I forget to unmute. I got you, I've got uh, one too. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that the last summary is largely Hesiod's take or um, more common across the Greek world? Right, so this this characterization of Kronos um, and, and this version of the tale becomes the dominant one. And it seems that by the classical period, this is the one that is kind of the standard for most Greek peoples, but that was not the case when he composed it, obviously. And there are other theogonies. Uh, we have fragments of, reconstructions of, um, some uh, that even mention an entity like Kronos. Um, but uh, I, I would say that this is very much Hesiod's invention, his characterization, and that characterization became the domino. Um, and the connection to the festival itself, uh, we don't really know. We don't have as much evidence for that festival as we'd like. Uh, we have bits and pieces, um, but we know way more about the Saturnalia, which we also don't know a whole lot about than we know about the Cronia. Um, but uh, I think that Hesiod is reacting to a general culture in which there's a lot of these tales, these theogonies going around, these in, in, stories of how the gods came to be and which ones are the superior ones, who was first and who was first means a lot. And then um, for whatever reason, his was the most resonant. Um, and in the minds, at least of the people who are engaging with the Cronia and the, and the classical period, that's the, the Kronos I would say they probably have in mind unless they have some local cult that's connected. And... Thank you. Um, does the image of a relief valve actually suggest that festivals functions not to promote the change, but instead instead sustain the status quo? You know, I'm, I'm wondering about that language that I've used too, because I mean, I realize I sort of uh, put it without reflection and now I've been reflecting on it and wanting to think about festivals in general. I think the, you know, I think festivals, like anything that's a socially produced thing, they're contested. And I think that the meaning of festivals and rituals always contested. And um, uh, I would say there was a, it would seem that there was a point from the evidence we got where it wasn't tampering down the energies, it was building them up. The, the sense of social protest of the very weakest um, the most indebted. Uh, a lot of people, I, I, I'm sure, aware of the fact that there was a huge debt crisis that led to massive class struggle, which then led to Solon's reforms and, and essentially what we think of as Athenian democracy. Um, and Athenian democracy was sort of a, uh, uh, you know, we're going to do this instead of just completely destroying the place, uh, completely wiping out the aristocracy or something. Um, so I think that these festivals and rituals um, likely, they, they, the intention is not to promote, it is to release. I think it is to um, find ways to salve the wounds of the everyday life, uh, to find a way to break up that everyday routine and make it acceptable. Oh, muted again. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> Yeah, sure. We have uh, one final question, and then I have a couple of announcements to make before we wrap up. Um, someone is asking um, or stating more that ancient Greece was uh, splintered, not like a unified country that we see today, but more of a collection of cities. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And that's why I try to say Greek speakers, because uh, also we import notions of ethnicity and race from the 20th or 19th and 20th century into the ancient world, and it's totally illegitimate. So if uh, a, a Greek is someone who speaks Greek in the ancient world. And if you don't speak Greek, you uh, speak bar, 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 and barbarian. Um, that was their idea. And um, so uh, the archaic period, this is when we're seeing the, the beginning of the city-state formation. Um, previously, 
you know, there was the Mycenaean civilization, which was more stratified warrior class, and then it collapsed. And the archaic period is the one in which we're starting to see the buildup of what will become the city-state system. And one of the most important things for city-states is festivals. And at festivals, people recite poems and perform poems and, and plays and athletic events and all that. And that's what that's the context of the, the performance of the Theogony or the Iliad or the Odyssey. Um, especially like the Odyssey, for instance, there would be um, kind of a relay race of uh, poem, of, of, of poetry. So someone would go up to a certain bit of it and then they would stop and then someone else would pick it up from there. And you can see how this results in a lot of variability, a lot of diversification. Um, so there's, there are, with Hesiod's account, which is written, we think pretty early, there's an attempt to cohere a lot of that. And it kind of forms a basis of, no one really takes it as like the gospel truth or something as in later Orthodox religions will take it. Um, but it is sort of like, okay, we're gonna use this as the baseline story, Everything else is kind of a variation on that. Thank you. That's really, really helpful and interesting. Um, we are going to uh, let you go because it's about 5.15 and there is one more event. But thank you again, Jace, for a thank fascinating you. presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay, everybody, that is actually it for our academic presentations for the weekend. Um, it's been a fantastic conference. Uh, as always, the level of preparation and skill and just sheer research that goes into these is really quite breathtaking, uh, especially when you consider that a lot of these people are doing it as a uh, passion because getting a job in academia is virtually impossible. Um, so thank you to all of our presenters, to all of our keynote speakers, to everyone who ran or participated in a workshop. I know I'm going to be going back and looking at those uh, again myself, make sure I catch all of the interesting and useful things that were said. We have one more event for the day and for the conference. That is a social hour. It starts at 5.15 and ends at 6.15. That's uh, Eastern Daylight Time. And you can RSVP on the virtual conference website. I put a link to it in all of the chats in that uh, you should all be uh, watching. Uh, you can just click on the link, fill out the form, and you'll be sent the relevant Zoom link almost immediately. So if you're interested in chatting with the presenters for today and other audience members go and uh, enjoy yourselves and thank you again for your time and your interest <laughs>